Welcome, everyone. As we begin our meeting today, uh, I want to make sure that everyone's aware that, as in the past, uh, this meeting is being broadcast live via the Internet. Uh, so at any point, any one of us, including those of you in the audience, uh, could be viewed by those watching online. That's uh, supposed to keep us on our best behavior, so we'll see. Uh, also, just as an additional reminder, please silence your cell phones uh, and your computers. And Dennis, that goes for your computer too, okay? Yeah, my, I can get new ones, so don't worry. <laughs> um, also, please note that we are changing the April 2012 Committee on Agency Operations and the April Board Meeting to April 24th and 25th, Tuesday and Wednesday respectively. So those are each a day earlier than our normally scheduled meetings. At the July board meeting, uh, Harold, our Vice Chairman Harold Hahn formally introduced Amir Barzin and Jim Lee. Uh, this meeting, I would like to introduce uh, four, our four new board members, Bobby Jenkins, Munir Lalani, Janelle Shepard, and David Tischer, who couldn't be with us here today. Uh, first, Bobby Jenkins. Bobby is president of ABC Home and Commercial Services. He is chair of the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, Caritas of Austin, the Austin American Heart Association's Heart Walk, and the AISD District Bond Oversight Committee. He is a member of the Texas A&M University College of Agriculture Development Council and past president of the Better Business Bureau of Central Texas, the National Pest Management Association and Texas Pest Control Association, and I'll resist the temptation to say that's pertinent experience. Uh, he is also past chair of the Austin Alzheimer's Association and Citizens Against Lawsuit Abuse. Jenkins received his bachelor's degree from Texas A&M University, where he's a member of the Fighting Texas Aggie class of 1981. Bobby, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Fred. And I, uh, so far, uh, I've attended one, uh, I guess, two committee meetings, and each one of those has been uh, a lot of information and very fascinating. I'm uh, looking forward to today's board meeting and looking forward to serving on the board. Well, thank you, Bobby, and we're very glad to have you. Next, uh, Munir Lalani. Uh, Munir is president and CEO of Lalani Lodging. Uh, he is a board member of the Bank of Commerce in Oklahoma, Commerce Bank Corp, and Wichita Falls Young Life. He is a past board member of the Wichita Falls Metropolitan YMCA and the Pretty Foundation Board of Trustees and past chair of the Midwestern State University Board of Regents. Uh, he is also an advisory member of the Munir Abdul Lalani Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise. He is a past president of the North Texas Restaurant Association, a past board member of the Wichita Falls Board of Commerce and Industry. Uh, the Wichita Falls Appraisal District Board and the North Texas Rehabilitation Center. Uh, Muneer received a bachelor's degree from Midwestern State University. Muneer, would you like to say anything? Well, thank you first for the introduction, and um, I'm just glad to be part of this coordinating board and, and the fact that I have had uh, nine years with the Midwestern State University Board of Regents, I understand some of the challenges that we're facing in the higher education today, and I'm very optimistic that working together and um, keep an open mind with some changes that we need to make and some being more creative, to uh, try to do more with less, we can achieve those things and we'll just work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Veneer. And Janelle Shepard. Uh, Janelle is a registered nurse, board certified case manager and director of medical management at the Texas Health Resources Fort Worth Hospital. She is a member of the American Case Management Association and American Nurses Credentialing Center and a life member of the Weatherford Independent School District Parent Teacher Association. That, that may be the bravest thing you've done. She is also a past member and past board secretary of the Texas Commission on Judicial Conduct and a past member of Sigma Theta Tau National Nursing Honor Society. Uh, Janelle received a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Arlington. Janelle, would you like to make some remarks? I want to say thank you, and it's an honor and privilege to serve the great state of Texas. Thank you, Janelle. We're very glad to have all of you. And even though he had a prior uh, commitment, uh, a pre-existing uh, scheduled event before his appointment, I would like to introduce you to who David Tischer is in his absence. Uh, David is, has an orthopedic surgery sports medicine practice at the Beaumont Bone and Joint Institute. 
He is a team physician for Lamar University's NCAA teams and several local high schools. He earned a Bachelor of Science from the University of Illinois at Urba uh, Urbana-Champaign and is MD from the University of Texas Medical School at San Antonio. Uh, before completing his postgraduate training uh, at the Brooke Army Medical Center, uh, uh, that's where he completed his postgraduate post training. He's a U.S. Army veteran and was decorated for services in operations Des Desert Shield and Desert Storm. David is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the Texas Medical Association. He serves as a delegate to the American Medical Association and the American Orthopedic Association for Sports Medicine. He recently completed service as the Vice Chairman of the Texas Youth Commission. So as you can see, we are we're blessed with four very capable uh, and accomplish new uh, board members, and I would ask the audience to join the, the board in welcoming these four new members. As most of you know, the position of secretary to the board is open uh, due to the term expiration of former board member Joe Hinton. Texas Education Code Section 61.023 requires the board to appoint the secretary, uh, the secretary of the board. I would like to recommend to the board that Dennis Golden be appointed as secretary. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve Dennis Golden as secretary to the board? So I move. A motion from Vice Chairman Hahn and a second from Muneer. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Dennis, the motion passes, so congratulations. I just got, I think I just got railroaded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's an honor. Thank you. Uh, the coordinating board staff recently received this uh, resolution from the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy, and I would like to read it into the record. Know all men by these presents that, whereas the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board ably and conscientiously created the initial criteria, policies, and logical structure under which the legislatively mandated fifth-year accounting student scholarship fund would operate, and whereas the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board expertly administered the scholarship program from its inception in 1991 until responsibilities were transferred to the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy by the Texas Legislature in 2009, and whereas the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board worked cooperatively with the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy during the transition year of 2009 to 2010, therefore be it resolved that we, the members of the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy, do hereby express to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and its staff our deepest appreciation for the expertise and professionalism they brought to establishing and administering a successful scholarship program for fifth-year accounting students. Given under our hand this 22nd day of September 2011, the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy. And now it's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the Honorable Todd Hunter, State Representative from Corpus Christi and Chairman of House Calendars, um, who is going to give us a short announcement about a higher education summit that uh, Chairman Hunter is hosting in Corpus Christi November 10th. Make sure you press the button to get it, get it live. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, on November 10th, in Corpus Christi, co-hosted by Texas A&M University Corpus Christi and Del Mar College, uh, we're going to do something that we did in the mid-90s, and that is, is to focus on higher education in the state of Texas. So we're going to have what's called the Higher Education Summit. It is open to the public. It's free to the public. Uh, it is open to higher education. But what is the goal? The goal is higher education is positive in Texas. And I think it's time that we as lawmakers and public officials not only tell you and everybody in this room with the public of how important higher education is, because a lot of times higher education is not just education, but it's economics. And we have the best universities and colleges in the United States, so the point of the summit is to set the goals, set the issues, and set the agenda for 2013. So I wanted to invite all of you, invite everybody listening, everybody in the room, to let you know that that's what's going to occur from about 8 to 4 on November 10th. It'll be actually on the campus of Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. 
again, co-hosted by both universities that are here today, Del Mar and Texas A&M Corpus Christi. But I want you to know the university's private public community across the state have been meeting for the last few months. And we've had a lot of great support, but I want you to know this is going to go on, involve you, and I want to send the message to the state of Texas that higher education is important, and we plan to make sure that everybody knows. And I want to thank your chairman, Fred Heldenfels. Uh, he has been a very, very big, strong supporter of higher education. He's one of my uh, closest and longest friends. So you've got a great leader. And I think I kept it within your four minutes. <laughs> well, I actually said three, but that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> we in the legislature always take a little more. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Hunter. We Thank you very it. much. It's all it was, and we hope to see you. And if not, any information we can provide, we will do so. Thank you for what you do. And let me add that that was an unpaid positive remark about right. Texas higher education. Thank you, Todd. Um, lastly, before we move on in the agenda, uh, I would like to recognize uh, the new presidents and chancellors in the audience. I think we have with us today uh, Chancellor John Sharp of the Texas A&M University System. John, where are you? Or is he in transit? Okay. Well, he's supposed to introduce you, Brett, so I trust he'll be here. But uh, John was appointed chancellor of the Texas A&M University System by the board September 6, 2011. <laughs> As I think most people in this audience know, John brings 30 years of public service uh, to the university system, having served in the Texas House of Representatives, the Texas Senate, and as uh, comptroller for the great state of Texas. Also, um, we have, uh, I think, with us today, or possibly with us, but I'll, I'll call out the names of other new presidents, uh, Philip Castile with U of H Victoria, President Castile here today. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Harold Nolte, president of Blinn College. Is Harold here today? And uh, James Henry Russell, president of Texarkana College. Is James Henry here today? Met him last night. He's a member of the Fighting Texas Aggie class of 1991. Just thought I'd mention. Uh, and um, also another new president, Ronald DePino with UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. I don't think he's here today, but just in case, Ronald, if you are, stand up and wave. Those are uh, the new presidents that, uh, and chancellors that Texas is blessed to have with us uh, serving in higher education now. The second agenda item is for the approval of minutes from the July board meeting. Do I have a motion for approval of these minutes? I have a motion from Dr. Golden. Is there a second? Second. Second from Vice Chairman Hahn. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Next is the consent calendar for the entire meeting. Uh, the consent calendar includes non-controversial items that we think can be approved uh, without either comment or discussion and saves time, of course, for our other items that need more attention. Any board member, however, can request that an agenda, be, uh, agenda item be removed from the consent calendar, and uh, that gives us the opportunity to discuss it fully later in the meeting. At this time, does any board member want to remove an item uh, or items from the consent calendar? Does any board member want to add any items to the consent calendar? Hearing uh, neither, do I hear a motion to approve our consent calendar? So moved. I have a motion from Bobby. Is there a second? Second, please. Second from Muneer. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes. Um, now we will begin agenda item five. We're going to take that out of order because we're going to have a, uh, a speaker later uh, by uh, video conference on the uh, major policy discussion. One of the authors of the book will be discussing. Um, agenda item five is the recognition of excellence. Um, the agenda item four is scheduled uh, to start at 10 a.m. And we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, the recognition of excellence is meant to showcase models of excellence with the, within the education community and highlight the outstanding work of our education faculty and administrators uh, and institutional programs around our state. Um, Brett, has John made it yet? Well, why don't you join us and uh, uh, we'll have him come up in, in progress. Uh, Texas A&M Health Science Center is home to Project GreenVax, a biotherapeutic production facility 
that will use plant-based technology to dramatically increase the nation's capability of producing vaccines for infections in a fraction of the current time. Dr. Brett Gerard will give us a presentation on improving global health through multi multidisciplinary research and multi-institutional partnerships. That is if our audiovisual expert team here gets things working. Uh, technology. Does the board have handouts? So without a chancellor and without video, but <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you tap dance? <laughs> can do a little Cajun Zydeco, but uh. <laughs> Okay, I see a green light. Okay, well, uh, you have better things to Brett, do. Brett, is, you, is your mic on? Uh, the red light? Is it, is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. I have a red light on. Okay. Okay, right. great. So here we go. It Absolutely what, wonderful. If, so. if John were here, what, what he would say is that uh, Dr. Brett Gerard is often uh, introduced as uh, uh, possibly the smartest man in College uh -huh. Station. So. No pressure, though, is on your, uh, on your presentation. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives at the A&M System and also a professor at the Health Science Center and in the College of Engineering and at the Bush School. Uh, I've been here three years. I was formerly at UT Southwestern for a long period of time. Uh, that medical school is why I came to Texas, because the excellence of that place brought me from Louisiana and then to Harvard, where I did my undergraduate, to UT Southwestern and have remained here ever since, aside from a four and a half year tour at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA in Washington, D.C. Uh, yes, we did create the internet. Al Gore does not work there, and there are no aliens in the basement. So <laughs> I just wanted to make that clear as we start. Um, it's a privilege being here, and, and I, I want to start by saying, whoever is in this chair at any further meetings, I hope there are two words that you will never hear from that person. And those two words are I or me. I or me have no place in the research community anymore. It is no longer a single investigator trying to make something very important happen, or even a single department, or even a single university. Where research is to make a global impact now, it's universities working with other universities. And even more than that, it's universities working with the commercial uh, partnerships that take our science and technology and make them real for the world with the community that we're in, with the state and the federal government. And if you uh, hear nothing else about this presentation, I want to emphasize the importance of the interinstitutional partnerships that we built, particularly in an area that I'm passionate about as an MD, as a trained pediatrician, uh, and a practicing pedi pediatric intensivist in my former life at UT Southwestern. So I want to talk a little bit about improving global health and the problems we're trying to fix. As highlighted even in Newsweek magazine, uh, the pipeline of new therapies is really drying up. Uh, that patients who really seek uh, new remedies, uh, the road to those breakthroughs are, are now really a dead end. And that's very paradoxical to most people because, uh, as is pointed out even in this article, research is very healthy in America. Our understanding of diseases is, is greater than ever. But I think as we all know, and particularly uh, people on the front line, ma'am, uh, like you, um, publishing a paper in Science or Nature is not the end of research. A patient is never helped by that publication. That does not mean that basic research isn't critical. It is absolutely critical. But something needs to be done more. And that area of research is generally referred to as translational research. And if you can see on my little diagram here, very broadly, <coughs> translational research, particularly in health sciences, is the bridge between the wonderful basic science discoveries that typically occur in our universities, in our medical schools, and the large-scale clinical trials that take a therapy and make them real. So for vaccines and new medications, what does that really mean? What is translational research? You've heard the term a lot, but what does that mean? And immediately you'll understand why I'm here with an a and system hat on about translational research. Well, first of all, what it means is characterizing animal models, particularly natural animal models for disease. 
For example, 40% uh, of dogs now get cancer. We can work in natural animal models of cancer. What do they get? Lymphoma, breast cancer, bone cancer. The same cancers that human get. By working and learning in that model, we could translate that into humans. Developing diagnostic tests and biomarkers. For most diseases, we don't have a biomarker like blood sugar uh, for diabetes. We have to understand what those are so we can follow and do studies. And an area that I became passionate about when I was at DARPA, and that is manufacturing researching and implementing new ways to make vaccines and biotherapeutics. And this was highlighted in the H1N1 outbreak when we knew what the vaccine was, but we couldn't manufacture it in time so that most people got the disease before the vaccine actually got out to the public. And I want to highlight that bottom bar, which is really not known very much, is that over 75% of the cost through late stage clinical trials for new vaccines and therapeutics is on research and development for manufacturing. That, that's a, a point that's lost, and that manufacturing is not a medical discipline per se, but it's an engineering discipline, chemical engineering, process engineering, uh, uh, industrialization, all the kinds of things that we typically don't think up in the medical community. Three years ago when I came back to Texas from the federal government, uh, groups of us came together to attack this problem, and I, I put those logos up here. Uh, the University of Texas system, uh, Baylor College of Medicine, uh, MD Anderson are our closest partners because we are all passionately committed to bringing research from the laboratory into patients. And we decided as a state that we would essentially divvy up the problems of translational research so that the state could have a unified enterprise that we're all expert in what we try to do to bring unity to the state, most importantly, new health uh, services to our patients. And by the way, that means research, economic, and job opportunities to our state. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. So why is manufacturing such a problem? And I think this is important for everybody to understand. Our, our grandfather's new drug was something like aspirin. Uh, here, you can barely see it. It had 21 atoms in aspirin. It could be made in a test tube by simple chemistry. But the new drugs of today are much, much more complex, as illustrated by this antibody, a monoclonal antibody, like something like rituxan or Herceptin, the drugs that you know. Instead of 21 atoms, there are 25,000 atoms. And they cannot be made in a test tube. They have to be grown in living organisms that are programmed to make that drug for you. As Genentech says, uh, it, this is about the same as uh, the complexity of uh, an old-time bicycle versus now making a business jet. So the manufacturing aspects of this, even for simple vaccines, are now one of the critical failures of our system to get products to market. Brett, um, I just want to thank Chancellor Sharp for being here and, and welcome him. Uh, we we uh, introduced you in your absence uh, before you got here, and then Brett did an okay job of introducing himself, but is there, is there anything you'd like to add before he continues? Uh, no. I, wanted, I apologize for being late. A former scheduler gave me the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he, he is, one of the things you have to learn at being chancellor is not to be intimidated by people that have IQs in excess of 300 or something, and that is certainly the case here. This is a, this is a project, this barter project, when it happens, is going to transform the state of Texas, not just College Station. Uh, we're talking about Glaxo uh, moving its entire vaccine operation from Belgium to uh, the state of Texas. The interesting politics of it are that it is there are two people who are responsible for it. One is Governor Perry for allowing this uh, facility to be built and to give us an advantage over uh, every other state. And the other one is Barack Obama for putting it in the uh, State of the Union and making it a priority. So I'm sure they'll have something to chit chat about <laughs> on the campaign trail. But this is a this is a uh, game changer uh, when it happens. And we believe that we're in a position to uh, to do something here that uh, no one else has ever done. If you see the movie Contagion, half of that's true. Uh, it's going to happen when the right pig and the right duck get together in the right way, as he s describes it to me. There is going to be a pandemic that kills 50, 60, 80 million people. Uh, the second part of that movie is not true. There is no way to produce those vaccines. The answer to that is in College Station and uh, Dr. Gerard. Uh, is the reason that it's there. He is a, a brilliant person. He 
of course, anybody that spent any time in DARPA is a brilliant person, uh, but he is a real asset to uh, to the state of Texas and to Texas A&M University, and proud to have him on our team. Thank you. Well, we, we appreciate your uh, being with us, uh, John, and we appreciate you bringing Brett to share this information with us. I hope we didn't interrupt your your uh, flow of thought there too badly. but You didn't, but he gave all my punchlines and half my slides. So <laughs> yeah, I should have known better. <laughs> He's seen this a couple times, a uh, uh, couple times, and has been uh, a great supporter. So getting back to the manufacturing, there are two problems we need to solve. And, and these are the two problems, and I'll tell you how we solve them or are in the process of solving them and how we're moving forward. The first is illustrated by this picture in the left-hand corner. Because of the complexity of manufacturing, um, we're stuck in a design where the whole facility design stifles the innovation pipeline. Imagine before you could bring a drug to even its final testing, you had to put out a billion dollars in capital outlay just to make the facility. And by the way, that billion dollars would take you five to seven years to design and construct, and it could only make one product for the next 25 years. So if that product doesn't work, you literally mothball that facility and move on. And by the way, it must be completed before you know that product can actually go to market and be approved. Um, these facilities actually stifle the pipeline because of the incredible outlay and risk that large pharmaceutical companies will only take the risk on the most certain of drugs, and small companies and academia are completely out of the game. The second problem is the organisms that make the vaccines for us. And we all know uh, that with the H1N1 outbreak, we had a great example of that, in that flu vaccines are made in 60-year-old technologies, chicken eggs. They're actually made in chicken embryos. They're not eggs. These are fertilized embryos, small chickens. These are 1950s technology that we've been working on, but in, and it's very safe and very good for seasonal vaccine, but it takes eight, nine months to change over from one vaccine to the next vaccine strain, and so you miss the entire pandemic. Also, if they're bird flus, uh, you can't make flu vaccine in a chicken egg because the bird flu kills birds and therefore it kills the chicken embryos, so you're really out of luck. And it's limited by so many things that we really need new technology. So I'll tell you how we're solving these two problems and then uh, what's really next on the biosecurity agenda. The first problem was solved, or is in the process of being solved, by a project we call the National Center for Therapeutics Manufacturing at Texas A&M. The NCTM was supported by a $50 million grant from the State of Texas Emerging Technology Fund that it was announced in January of 2009. The design was done in early 2010, and this aerial photo shows you today the facility is absolutely complete, is in the process of being validated, and uh, actually will be full when it starts operations in March of April of next year. I'll tell you some of the important aspects of this project but I'll show you one of the key technologies. And this gets into collaborative development with a Texas-based company. As opposed to that concrete and steel billion dollar facility, maybe because it's the part of Louisiana I grew up in, we took more of a trailer park mentality to this. <laughs> okay, instead of building a billion dollar facility, why couldn't you build a clean room, a very high tech clean room, like what you see up here on the right side, that's all self-contained within itself? It's not hundreds of thousands of square feet of clean air, but clean air right there with the air conditioning and the HVAC and the electronics all in one space. Can you hit the movie now? And that's what we did. So these are clean rooms that literally plug into a building. So you can take a, a very simple factory or manufacturing building or warehouse, plug these into central utilities, and essentially, as you see here, you can now have a modern, very safe facility. You see this clean room rising off the air like a hockey puck. That's because it has air bearings under it. So this 25,000 pound clean room can now be mobile. So immediately you have a completely reconfigurable factory that instead of making one product at a time, can make multiple products at a time, can switch over from one product to the next. By the way, you can put it on the back of a flatbed truck and move it to another facility, or as the Air Force has asked us to do, design one that we can fly in a C-17 so I could have mobile factories producing vaccines all around the world. Or perhaps this could be used as a burn center or radiation center and else, elsewhere. So with this core technology, the National Center for Therapeutics Manufacturing has made many revolutionary breakthroughs. I'll start here. So instead of one, as many as six simultaneous products can be developed. These are vaccines and therapeutics. 
It can go from personalized medicine to national scale vaccines. We have lowered the cost of initial outlay for these facilities by as much as 90 percent. And that's very, very critical to our competitive advantage. Because if a company can lower their out outlay of 90 percent, it now becomes economical to take those jobs from India and China and move them back to the United States and move them right back to Texas. It allows quick change to new products because the factory is not static. You literally float a new clean room in with your processes. It is completely integrated with educational program and worker training. And this is absolutely key because I've talked to the CEO of every major pharmaceutical company in the world. They love Texas. They want to come here. The number one thing they're worried about is do we have the educated workforce in order to man their facilities and their industries. And it has become a magnet for corporate relocation, research education, and jobs. And I'll tell you why this is important as a prototype for new facilities. Uh, as you may have seen, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, the world's top cancer center, uh, making amazing breakthroughs, had their pipeline stifled as well. As many as four to six products per year were stuck at the laboratory because of manufacturing. When we started this program with them, uh, Dr. Mendelson and here, the chancellor of the UT system, with Mike McKinney, the former chancellor of the AM system, MD Anderson has reserved one sixth of our facility for the next 10 years to bring new products to their patients, uh, both in Houston, throughout Texas, and throughout the world. This project led us to the second part of the solution, which is really the topic that you wanted to hear about, Project GreenVax. When the pandemic hit, it was very clear that egg-based technology would not be the solution, and potentially even cell-based technology, the next generation, would not be the solution. So we proposed a different solution, and that is plant-based technology. Project GreenVax, also known as the DARPA Blue Angel program, was designed to support the research and development needed to show that vaccines could be grown in plants at the large scale, the global scale, to create as many as 100 million doses of vaccine in a single facility per month. In other words, this single facility now located on the Health Science Center campus can produce as many flu vaccines as all the other facilities in the world put together. This was funded by approximately a $40 million grant from the Department of Defense, uh, matched with private contributions from our consortium of about $25 million. The bottom line is this. Plants are capable of making complex proteins, just like chicken embryos, including vaccines and antibodies. And these are plants that are relatives of tobacco. They're called Nicotiana plants. Very simply, they're seeded and grown for five to six weeks. They're then infiltrated with a bacteria containing the gene for the protein of interest. So if you want to make flu or you want to make a cancer antibody, you put that into the leaves and you wait five to seven days. During that period, the plant is actually making the product that you want. You harvest the plants, you extract the protein, you make green juice, and then you purify it just like you would in any other facility. These are great pictures that appeared last week in the Houston Chronicle uh, that show some of the insides of the facility with Barry Holtz, the president of GCON, and the collaborator and the co-PI in this project. This facility holds over two million plants. They're fully contained, and they're actually grown not in fluorescent lights because there's too much heat, but in light, under light-emitting diodes that only emit red and blue, which is exactly what the plant needs. By the way, these light-emitting diodes are made right here by a company in Austin who uh, we have co-patents on the product, and that will grow that entire industry. Again, as I said, it could make as many as 100 million doses of vaccine per month. It was operational within 15 months post the federal award. And the initial research products include new vaccines for tuberculosis. There are 2 billion people infected around the world, uh, and many of those are right here in Texas. New antibody therapies for cancer, and new enzyme therapies for patients with metabolic diseases. This project has brought a lot of buzz in the press. And it, while it's nice to get press, we use press to our own advantage. That advertises what we do in Texas to bring us students, to bring us faculty, and ultimately to bring us companies that support the economic development. We were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal in 2010. Uh, we were uh, the lead article in the electronic version of Scientific American. Could many labs and plant-based vaccines stop the next pandemic? And of course, we think that's true. And I put this up here because anytime anything nice is said about A&M in both the New York Times and the Austin American Statesman, something has to be gone in your direction. 
Um, there will also be a very important article that's been published electronically, but in this sunny, Sunday's New York Times Magazine, outlining a lot of the importance to biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. So where do we go from here? Last couple of slides, and this gets to Chancellor Sharp's um, uh, comments that he said earlier. There is an urgent need to improve our U.S. biosecurity preparedness. Um, you might have seen that last week, uh, the bioterrorism report card by the uh, nonpartisan uh, Graham Talent Commission reported again that the U.S. gets an F for biosecurity preparedness. We are still not prepared against pandemic diseases. And as the chancellor took my line, uh, if you've seen the movie of Contagion, almost everything is correct except the happy ending. Um, that scenario is exactly out of tabletop scenarios we did in Washington uh, for years and are trying to solve. But if you remember, the moment the vaccine was discovered, within two months there was enough vaccine to vaccinate the world. That's the fiction part. That would take 10 months, a year, two years to even get that max vaccine manufactured. So fortunately, um, uh, there is a, new, a U.S. biosecurity agenda launching a new program, and we are uniquely poised to meet this national biosecurity agenda. The request for proposal was published in March, and it basically has four components, and I'm almost done, Mr. Chair. The first is to develop the national capacity to develop and manufacture flu vaccines for the U.S. population, 50 million doses in four months. Now, this is not looking at plant-based technology yet because the plant-based technology is a seven to 10 year solution. It's not what we need next year. This is more of a cell-based solution. To develop the manufacture and biothreat vaccines and countermeasures for the U.S. strategic uh, stockpile, to do all the intermediate development that are necessary to bring things through FDA approval, including animal models, clinical trials, et cetera, and very importantly, to train the U.S. workforce. You're going to see this time and time again. And when we mean workforce training, that means worker retraining from related industries. This means community college associate's degrees. This means undergraduates, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees, the entire spectrum. This proposal, we expect, just in its baseline funding, to be well over a billion dollars in baseline funding with the opportunity for between four and eight billion dollars in task orders over the next 25 years. This is essentially to create the Los Alamos, the Sandia Laboratory dedicated to biology and biosecurity. We have put together and are competing now with, I think, the most formidable team in the world. Our lead partner is GlaxoSmithKline Biologicals, the number one vaccine producing, uh, producer and manufacturer in the world from Belgium. And as the Chancellor said, if we do get this award, their entire flu operation will be moving from Belgium uh, and the Czech Republic um, to uh, Texas uh, as part of the domestic preparedness network. We have a number of companies who are involved. We have a number of academic institutions. The Baylor College of Medicine, with their recent recruitment of the Sabin Vaccine Institute from Washington, D.C., the premier nonprofit vaccine developer, was recruited by the Baylor College of Medicine and has relocated to Houston, and I couldn't be more thrilled. The Galveston National Laboratory, Blinn College, shoulder to shoulder with us, because 75% of the workers I need need associate's degrees. Uh, the University of Florida contributes biotechnology companies from Europe, many Texas A&M components, as you might imagine, including the College of Engineering, the Engineering Experiment Station, the Texas Biomedical Research Institute in San Antonio for advanced animal studies, and a number of commercial partners. Uh, we hope uh, this is an ongoing competition. We know we've passed the first two gates. We expect to hear about the next gate within this month uh, with the proposals awarded uh, sometime in the spring. My last slide is something I feel passionate about, and uh, I felt this the moment I came to see Southwestern in 1982 about the Texas spirit and the Texas attitude and the Texas collaboration, and I think this analogy really sums it up, Texas versus the others. And on October 9, 1903, the New York Times wrote, the flying machine which will really fly might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and mechanicians in from one million to ten million years. And believe me, that's the attitude I see in most of the country outside of Texas and certainly throughout the world. But I think what Texas is more like is what Orville Wright said. On that very day, October 9th, in his diary, we started assembly today. And I can think of no better analogy to talk about what Texas has done and how Texas leads and why Texas leads than this project to show how we've seized the leadership, We've leveraged our educational institutions, 
from community colleges through great universities. We've partnered with our industry and we're making something unique in the world that solves a global problem and will also bring research and educational opportunities and tremendous economic development to our state. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Some pretty amazing uh, research and uh, progress. Uh, members, any questions? I have a question. I, uh, you know, you made a wonderful point about the collaborated efforts that's making things happen. And uh, I think most of us here today have a real true appreciation for the fact that no one entity, person, can do it all by themselves to more. Uh, anymore. We have to work together hand in hand uh, with our partners in industry as well as uh, in the private sector and, and, and as well as in the academic arena. Um, I think you made a real good point with regard to how medical schools and four-year institutions are working together, but I also picked up a point that uh, was kind of unexpected for me to hear because I think I, said, I heard you say 75 percent of the workforce that you needed were being trained and need to two-year uh, associate degrees. Was that, was that what I heard in the, you say? In the manufacturing arena specifically, um, between 50 and 75 percent are in the associate's degree level because for every uh, master's level engineer, there are five to six laboratory technicians, quality assurance people for documentation. Um, those kinds of jobs that certainly you could have an undergraduate degree and do that, but really the necessary step to get to the plate is an associate's degree. So when I talk to pharmaceutical CEOs, um, the community college aspects are as important to them as the master's degree programs that we have. That's something that I would not have expected up front, but it clearly is what our CEO customers say and what the industry want. Thus, Blinn College is associated with uh, A&M University, the Texas Engineering Extension Service for our proposal. And of course, if that proposal is funded and as the curriculum grows, that we expect that to expand throughout the state. I mean, this is not limited to Blinn, but you've got to start with a couple core partners to get, to get the operation going. So yes, sir, that, that so, is true. So, so what I'm hearing you say, that there's going to be increasingly more important that our students walk away from our community colleges with associate degrees because they're vitally needed in order to step into these projects and provide the support we need uh, to, to produce the products and the, uh, and the that we're intended to produce. I, I feel like I'm stepping into an ongoing debate, and I don't want to do that, but uh, yes, sir, it is true that uh, uh, associate's degree with trained programs that are fully integrated, trained for this industry, is going to be vital to support the industry in yeah, Texas. I'm, I'm Absolutely. Just, I'm just amazed that from top to bottom, it, again, and the point I'm making is it's going to take everybody. Yes, sir. Uh, people in the private sector, people in academia, not only in senior institutions, medical schools, but even our community college systems uh, working together to be able to make this happen. And I, I really wasn't expecting that much. Um, the, the fact that you said up to 75 percent of the people uh, would, would need community college education in order to, to make this model work was something that I really picked up on. Yes, sir. Thank you. Harold, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I just got a flu shot a couple of weeks ago. Good for you. <laughs> well, old people have to have those, you know. So, um, if, if I'm understanding what you were saying, there will be a transition over a seven or ten year period from the embryos to the plant technology. And is that seven and ten years? I mean, isn't that generally pretty quick? Yes, sir. It, it, it's pretty quick. Um, the transition of flu technology is, number one, it's in eggs now. Over the next two to four years, it will be transitioned from eggs to cells. So these are cells grown in vats, uh, and some of them are actually out of avian species. So you go from a chicken embryo to duck cells in culture, and that will be the predominant technology. The plant-based vaccines for flu are now in what's called phase two trials. So they're actually in human clinical trials. The, their safety trials are done. They're now in the preliminary trials to show can they bring up an immune response. And following that, remember the burden on a, on a vaccine that you vaccinate hundreds of millions of people that are healthy is very, is very large. 
So the licensing trials are going to be years and years in tens of thousands of patients in order to get that done. But it really is in the seven or so year time frame that they're expected uh, because phase two trials are now being completed. So it might be seven, it might be 10, but it's clearly not 20 or 30. It's within the time frame that's going to be meaningful. Uh, and we'll have the answer whether this could take a part of it, take all of it. And again, many of the opportunities may not be in flu. Again, I think some of the great opportunities are things like tuberculosis, where there are billions of infected patients around the world. We need to make an ultra cheap vaccine, and there is no vaccine right now that's available for that. There is none. So uh, there are many opportunities, uh, and we'll just have to see. But when it happens, I can tell you one thing, it's going to be happening in Texas. Excellent. Raymond? Well, I, I, just, want, I just wanted to say that uh, for me, this, this represents the work of uh, higher education at, uh, at, at absolutely the highest levels. Uh, World-class uh, basic and applied research, uh, uh, development uh, and uh, the, product, the, the producing of jobs, uh, both in, uh, in uh, both academic training as well as workforce development, the cooperation among institutions of higher education. This is really an extraordinary project, and uh, both you and the A&M system are to be congratulated for what you're doing. And uh, you have the capacity to, to save millions of lives. What, what could be better is an advertisement for higher education. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Fully agree. We usually point out that we have more research than any university in Texas, but in the spirit of cooperation, we won't mention that today. <laughs> I do want to say so one thing to Ms. Shepard. Your husband asked me two weeks ago if Texans would be vaccinated first. Would you tell him we're working on that? <laughs> first in line. Any further questions? Uh, I had uh, I had one, which is as you as you go through this progression over the next seven years, um, and you may have touched on this a little bit, but what what will be the distribution channel to scale this up as it be, as it becomes available, you know, in the in the public marketplace, so to speak? Will it be uh, distributed out of? I mean, I realize it'll have to be, you know, as you said earlier, flighted over overseas with these modular uh, laboratories, but. Uh, Will, it be, will the technology be shared with other private companies? Will it be distributed through partners with uh, the Texas Coalition? How will that work? Um, I, there's going to be a number of models depending on really what, what the products can be. For a more globally oriented vaccine, um, and again, I'm not, I, I, I think it's a good example, like tuberculosis, where it's a worldwide problem. Uh, the goal is plants really bring down the cost and allow it to be done. Uh, this will probably be a highly distributed model supported by places like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring vaccine to the countries at the point that they need it. So this would be really a global network that we hope that A&M system and our partners can be, if you will, the system integrator to make that happen, to work through the foundations, to sponsor the institutes around the world and bring health that way. For more, for products that are more high value in first world, like monoclonal antibodies against cancer, this is probably going to be done exactly where it is. You don't need to distribute that. It'd be much more of a central model uh, for, uh, 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 for, a, for a high price, uh, high yield pharmaceutical. And then there are a lot of things in between. If we do uh, become the pandemic situation or bioterrorist situation, um, there is a global distribution model and, uh, and strategic national stockpile that we will enter into. Particularly if we do win the Bardo Award or one of the two Bardo Awards, we will be fully integrated into the CDC strategic national stockpile and distribution network that, by the way, one of the attractiveness of our center, aside from everything else, is having the Texas Engineering Experiment Station uh, with the National Emergency Response Training Center that trains municipalities how to handle pandemics and they can work all the distribution into their scenarios and train the United States in, in that scenario particularly. So I don't mean to give you a hazy answer. It just depends on what category the, the pharmaceutical product is in, from high-priced cancer therapies to, to the global and everything in between. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good answer. It allows us to picture the different possibilities. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you for sharing this. I, I, you know, Project GreenVax uh, deserves our quarterly recognition of excellence on so many levels and fronts. 
but not the least of which is the um, the monumental service to mankind that you know this will this will provide, and so that uh, maybe the uh, happy ending to contagion uh, can be written after all. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chancellor, you, Chairman. Um, at about 9.45, we're going to take a 10-minute break so that we can set up the, and connect the necessary software to broadcast uh, Dr. Dr. Richard uh, Aram's comments uh, live for our uh, major policy discussion item. But in the meanwhile, uh, we will uh, move on to uh, the items uh, under agenda item six for the Committee on Closing the Gap. So, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Committee Chairman Golden. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give an overview and we'll begin uh, discussing those items that are on the agenda for closing the gaps. Uh, agenda item number 6A is Committee Chair's overview. The Coordinating Board hosted the <coughs> State P16 Council meeting on Wednesday, October 12, 2011 in Austin. This was the fourth meeting in, a, in this calendar year chaired by, the, by Commissioner Raymond Perez, Dr. Beverly Mitchell Brooks, President of the Greater Houston and, I'm sorry, Greater Dallas and North Central Texas Urban League, was introduced as the new member of the Council. Presentations included this, the status of Texas workforce and data on Texas job market, making higher education affordable and accessible for non-traditional students, improving the school readiness of children and impacting families through partnerships with community-based organizations and how a committee has embraced or has or how the committee has embraced Generation Texas and closing the gaps. The next scheduled state P through 16 council meeting is scheduled for January 11th, 2012 at 2 p.m. here at the at the coordinating board room in Austin, Texas. The University of Houston College Readiness Special Advisor, Advisor hosted secondary and higher education personnel from across the state for a two-day workshop in September to learn about and discuss promising practices in improving college and career readiness and success. Dr. George Kuhn, founder of the National Survey of Student Engagement and the NSSE Institute for Effectiveness Education Practice shared research and his expertise with more than 300 secondary and high school faculty, administrators, and stakeholders to address proven student engagement procedures, improve uh, institutional practice, and strategies to drive institutional change. Dr. Kuhn also provided a day and a half of technical assistance to the College Access Challenge grant-funded comprehensive student success <clears throat> program teams to help them troubleshoot and refine their programs. These guarantees, all of whom sent teams to the meeting, include Austin Community College, Central Texas College, Houston Community College, North Texas, North Central Texas College, and the University of Houston downtown. That concludes the <coughs> chairman's overview of Closing the gaps. We'll move now to item 6B. Uh, it has been moved to the consent calendar. Please note that this item is not a voting item for the board. It is for information purposes only. Background information, information on this item is that the governor's office is the key leader of the Complete College America Completion Innovation Challenge Grant in Texas. The governor's office selected the coordinating board to submit an application to the U.S. Department of Education for these funds. The total amount of the funds awarded was $1 million. The coordinating board is required to provide all institutional and instructional level and state level matrix evaluation and fiscal oversight of the grant. The coordinating board will provide evidence of progress at each quarterly meeting with the governor's office. The Committee on Closing the Gap accepted the funds to implement an 18-month project funded under the Complete College America Complete Innovation Challenge, which would reduce time to degree by allowing students to, co to fulfill remedial requirements while receiving college credit 
for mathematics within a single semester. Texas will deliver a mathematics remediation program as a co-requisite to existing college algebra or elementary, elementary statistic, statistical methods courses at 15 partnering community colleges in, to, to reduce the time students spend in remediation to improve completion rates in first year college mathematics courses. The, the goal of the Complete College America grant in Texas is to transform remediation. The proposed work not only provides a statewide model for transforming remedial education, but will also strengthen post-secondary mathematic, mathematics education, improve student success in mathematics, and increase college completion rates by reducing times to degree for students needing remediation. That concludes the items for presentation and discussion by the committee on closing the gaps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Golden. Um, and as uh, Ch Chairman Golden said, item 6B is uh, for information only and on, on the consent calendar, or actually didn't even need to be on the consent calendar because it's an information item. But it is a really important program, and I'm, I'm uh, really pleased uh, there are uh, 10 community colleges who will be participating in this Math Emporium grant. Um, that will hopefully produce some exciting results around the state. Um, rather than moving to agenda item seven, which is lunch, <laughs> we'll postpone that and move on to agenda item eight or begin agenda item eight, matters relating to the Committee on Strategic Planning and Policy. Uh, Committee Chairman Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See how far you can get in 15 minutes. Uh, I'll move along as quickly as possible. Um, I'm going to dispense with any overview. I think the items we're covering today will pretty much reflect uh, what the Committee on Strategic Planning and Policy has been up to. So I'll move to agenda item 8B <coughs> is a presentation of the preliminary headcount enrollment for fall of 2011. Susan Brown, Assistant Commissioner of Planning and Accountability, will provide a presentation. Susan? Good, good morning. morning. And We'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about the preliminary headcount. We get a information from the institution based on the 12th class day enrollment. Um, Susan, put, put the mic closer to you. Okay, is that better? That's better. Okay. Um, we get information from the institutions. It's very high level information. It's aggregate numbers. It's not by individual students. This number usually drops between 2 to 6% um, over the by the time they get the certified numbers and the data is ready. So I want to make that clear. These are not the numbers you will be seeing later. These are very preliminary numbers. And now for the big number. So far, we have an increase of 62,000. And this is our public and private institution. It does not include the career colleges at this time. And the reason we haven't included career colleges, even though we're getting their data, is we've had a big shift in the number of career colleges that are reporting to us now. And that has to do with the Chapter 7 rule changes that were made a year or two ago. And so now that we're getting that many more, we're not really comparing apples to oranges. So that this helps us compare. It's an increase of 62,000. It's not quite as large as we've had the last couple of years, but it is still a big increase. It is the size of UT Arlington and <coughs> UT San Antonio combined. So it's still a big increase. Okay. In fact, Susan, I uh, Back up. Was it last year that was over 100,000? It was over 110,000, and by the but this time... Is this, isn't this the second largest increase we've ever had? Is it? No, we had 80-something okay. thousand so the year third, before, perhaps. so it's, yeah. it's still a huge increase. It is just not as much as we've been experiencing in the past couple of years. Okay. Um, actually, what this does is this gets us to a total of needing 53,000 more students, which is less than this increase, by 2015 to reach our target for closing the gaps in participation. That's the good news. Um, that's only an increase of 13,000 per year. So I think we're on track. It's safe to say we're on track to meet our goal for closing the gaps. This is how it breaks out. We've had increases of 2.5 percent, obviously the community, community and technical colleges, so those public two-year colleges are showing the most increase. That is not a big surprise. This year, actually, their percent of the increase went up a little bit. Last year, it was the 70 percent of the increase was at the community colleges. This year, it's 74 percent are at the community colleges. I did show at the bottom that the career colleges have increased 30,000 
a lot of that is due to the just the fact that we have more of them reporting to us. But you know, you add that to the 62, and you're at 92,000 increase. Next slide. Um, this is the Hispanic, uh, the ethnic breakout on the where the enrollment increase. This will change. It changes every year. Um, you will notice that the other category has a huge increase. Well, we've just started having um, allowing students because the federal guidelines report multicultural or multi-ethnic, um, so they can select African American and white you know, multiple ones. So those all go into the other category. That's why you're seeing that big increase there. So the, if they're African and white, or if they're African American and Asian, or white, Asian, they all go into the other category, because there's a total of 64 different breakouts that can occur now, and I'm thinking y'all don't want to see all those. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are in the other category. That's part of the reason we have the, the big increase there. Um, African American enrollment actually did increase almost 10 percent, so that's really good. We don't have the um, breakout by gender, so we don't know how many of those African Americans were male or female yet. We have a total gender change, but not by ethnicity. And that's some of the information that we'll be able to provide once we get the certified data. Susan. Um for purposes of closing the gaps, could, do we have the ability to disaggregate the other categories, say, it, uh, for example, by Hispanic surname, because this really is causing if they, us to if they are Hispanic, If they are Hispanic, they are Hispanic. They are in that Hispanic number. Okay, so, so we're already that is already done. Doing, the, doing that. And that, that, that matches the federal guidelines. Okay. So that part is there. Um, this just shows something we've, show, we've been showing you for a long time. Back in 85, universities actually enrolled more of the public institution students than the two-year colleges. That changed in the mid-90s, and it just, that gap just keeps widening. So more and more of our students are going to public uh, two-year colleges. This slide shows you that it's not the same all across the state. Texas is big. The um, institutions in red have over 5% increases, or the, the regions, not the institutions, the regions in red have a 5% increase. Um, the regions in yellow have an increase, and the regions in blue actually had declines in their enrollment. So the state is, continues to get more urban, and I don't believe that's a big surprise. It's more and more urban. This shows you some of the institutions that have had large increases. Um, in most of them, you can see that it's the community colleges where the increases are. So that just fits with it. Okay. Some of the questions that we don't know for this 2011 um, entering students or the students that are here in 2000 is where is the growth? Are the new students? increases in persistence, so are our, our institutions doing a better job of retaining the students, keeping the students there once they turn? Are they students coming back because of economic reasons, can't find a job, that sort of thing? We don't know that for these students yet. We don't have the individual students, but I'm going to show you a little bit of what we did last, found last year. Um, out of the 84,000 increase that we had last year, we had an increase of 15,000 in the first time entering students. And that doesn't mean they're directly from high school, they're first time entering. For community colleges, only half of their first time entering students come directly from high school. So that's something new. However, look at increase in persistence, 56,000 increase in persistence. So that is huge. The institutions are really doing a lot of work to try and increase their persistence rates. And it's working. Something is working out there. And students that were returning, they had been in school, they had stopped out for some reason, and they came back. We had an increase. We actually had a drop in the number of dual credit students, which is kind of a surprise because that had been growing and growing and growing. We actually had a little bit of a drop last time in the dual credit students. This is information that once we get the certified data, we'll be able to show for the fall 10 to fall 11, see how that has changed. Uh -huh. um, board members, I, I wanted it to uh, underscore what Susan said regarding the increase in persistence. Um, 
As, as all of you know, the, the coordinating board has been working very closely with institutions to improve success rates, and it's important to note, as Susan said, institutions are doing that. And uh, th that, that number more than any other um, is why I've been saying recently, I think that we are going to hit our, our targets for student success and improving the number of graduates because those, those are pretty extraordinary numbers. Great. Yes. And uh, it's, it, in all of our institutions, our universities, and our two-year institutions should be recognized for the attention that they're giving to, uh, uh, to persistence and helping students stay in school and actually complete their programs. That, that's remarkable. Commissioner, is that, is that the same as retention? Yes. It is. Yes. And I, I will tell you why we've gone to persistence. When we first started having a lot of discussions with the Texas Education Agency, we were talking about retention. They were like, oh, retention's a bad thing. In K-12, when you retain somebody, oh. that's a bad thing. <laughs> so we actually switched what we're talking about and calling it persistence. So they're persisting in higher ed versus being retained, which is not good on the K-12 side. So mm -hmm. does this mean you're also talking about increasing graduation rates? They but have increased, but it, <laughs> it's not part of this report because we don't have um, the degrees awarded for all of last year. We don't have that yet, and we have to have everybody get certified because we track students. I will be surprised given these numbers if they don't, maybe not this year, but if they don't go up some. Persistence should translate into it. It should. If those persist, those students that are persisting, I mean, if they're not persisting, they're not going to graduate. So yes. So the other question is uh, the transition from community college to a university. Is that what this is? That actually happening, and then we're that not it, losing those students. That includes two years? the persistence includes those students who go from community colleges to universities, whether they are just staying at the same university or moving to a different university or staying at the same community college. Um, at one time, the community colleges from their fall to spring semester were losing about half of their students. That has changed over time, and it's getting better, and this is part of that, that they're keeping those students to complete certificates. It could be workforce certificates, associate degrees. You know, this is all of them combined. Mm -hmm. Any understanding as to if the dual credit's been increasing year after year, why the decrease all of a sudden? Um, we don't know why. They are, now, dual credit is about 90,000 students, so it's, it's a big chunk. You know, you have this last year we had approximately 280,000 high school graduates. So 90,000 is still a pretty good chunk of that, um, those high school graduates. So that's one thing. And at a certain point, you reach a cap. Now, that doesn't include AP courses and students that are earning AP. And in some districts, there's been a big push for AP over dual credit. So there's a lot of different reasons. That yeah, and that's why that. I didn't understand if it was at the high school level where their focus was different than, than what the dual credit is. Because I know from district to district, there seems to be a real difference in mm -hmm. the priority of dual credit versus AP and other types of programs. And I, and I think that thousand I've represents that, that change. My, my home district, yeah. they, they're trying to pull those students back in to get those IP courses. Not anything against the community college, but they're trying to raise their own standards at the high schools. So right. there's been a push to get them back into IP courses. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, okay, next slide. Just in summary, I mean, <coughs> the target is 630,000 new students by 2015. We've already accomplished you know, 578,000 with these preliminary numbers. Most of the growth, and this was in closing the gaps, this is where ex we expected the growth to be, was 74% of the growth was at the two-year colleges. Um, increases, declines in enrollment are not consistent across the state. They're, you know, they're more in the urban areas. That's where the growth in the population is. That's not a big surprise either. And then increases in persistence are a big driver. Institutions understand or starting to realize and probably have always known that growing your enrollment is twofold. One is those first time in college students and the other is keep the ones you already have. And so um, we're seeing a big increase there which is really good news. I just wanted to go back to the participation 
uh, goal for a moment. And I, I, uh, those of you that have been on the board know that our goal is, is the larger number in terms of participation, but we have targets. And I just want to point out that while we only have to go 53,000 more, have a 53,000 student increase to hit that goal, uh, we're not on target to hit our Hispanic target. That, it, in fact, if all 53,000 students are Hispanic, we'll fall, fall short of our Hispanic target. That's why we have our accelerated action plan. But I, I think it's important to realize that we, we, there's a, an issue embedded in that that isn't reflected in, in the other number. In, in fact, we, we may well have to exceed that 53,000 to hit our Hispanic target. Although you've been talking about uh, improved persistence, that does play in to participation as well. If you're in school and stay in school through a degree, you're, you'll continue to be counted. So I just want so that what, what is that number that where we are and what the goal is, so the, the delta between? I don't re I believe it's about, um, from where we are with these numbers, I'm thinking it's about 150,000 for the Hispanics students. So, so we have a real challenge remaining there. Our overall, for we're, we're hoping to have 5.7 percent of the total population higher edu education participating in higher ed, and 5.7 percent of Hispanic, 5.7 percent of African American. One, one, one very quick question, uh, Susan. Um, going back to that slide on the ethnic composition of the enrollment uh, mm -hmm. patterns. Is, is there a, an option for students on uh, the uh, in, in checking an ethnic category and other is, do we have any data on how many students simply don't respond to the question? Um, I haven't looked at it, but we do have students. We have students that don't respond at all, and we yeah. have students that check every single one of them. Yeah. And, I, and, 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 I and those were a lot of seniors at A&M, by the way. <laughs> I'm thinking somebody's trying to play a joke, but you know. <laughs> but I, I think that's important because I, I, I think uh, there, there has been, there have been indications nationally that, that, that racial designation is becoming less important among college students. It is. And that could be a very healthy thing. So we, I, I'd like to see the data on the we students that, that simply checked all the boxes or checked none of the boxes. That's, that's okay. a good question. Yeah. Um, it, uh, Susan, did you have any further information? That was all. all right. Can well, I have thank any questions? you. That's that's good news. Uh, you know, I think we sometimes need news. to stop and, and applaud uh, our efforts and our institutions for making this significant progress. And at the same time, the challenge is to remember that um, closing the gaps brings Texas to parity. And our real goal is to blow right past those goals on our way to uh, global competitiveness. So, thank you. Uh, Harold, I'm going to interrupt now so we can take our 10-minute audiovisual software technology break um, and uh, and get hooked up for the major policy discussion. We'll reconvene at uh, 10 till 10. Some of our new presidents and, and chan uh, chancellor, uh, we uh, we have two. Uh, Two other uh, gentlemen I failed to mention, veterans of the community college world, but in new positions. Um, Richard Rhodes, who I think is uh, in the audience perhaps today, is, uh, as of a little over a month ago, the new president of Austin Community College. And Richard, we're glad to have you not only with us today, but here in Austin. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Phil Chairman, I would like to note that there was a little chicken stealing going on Austin <laughs> Community College. Well, El Paso's loss is Austin's gain, but uh, taking Richard's place uh, is a longtime veteran of El, uh, El Paso and probably putting up with you, Ernie Roberts. And I don't know if Ernie is here today, but he's the new president uh, at El, El Paso Community College. So we congratulate each of those gentlemen. Uh, now we will have uh, move on to agenda item four, our major policy discussion. Uh, today's major policy discussion will focus on the research of Dr. Richard Aram and Dr. Uh, Josipa Roxa on the learning outcomes of college students. Uh, they have authored a book titled Academically Adrift. And uh, with us uh, online and on uh, video teleconference is Dr. Richard Aram, one of the authors. Dr. Aram, welcome. 
with with all the challenges, <laughs> it's it's rather amazing that we can uh, do this uh, with such high quality. And so let me start again by saying uh, uh, how grateful I am for the opportunity to speak in front of your board today uh, to inform your deliberations with this uh, social science research we've done. Uh, and hopefully it can serve in a constructive way to inform your future actions. The uh, uh, work I'm going to be presenting on today uh, uh, was supported by uh, several foundations, including Ford, Teagle, Lumina, uh, and the Carnegie Foundation. The work led to a publication last January called Academically Adrift. Uh, that book is on the first two years of college students' experiences, uh, although at this point we now have data on the full four years of college experiences, as well as uh, information on um, uh, students' subsequent transitions into the labor market. So uh, today uh, I'm going to address, can you, can you see my PowerPoints that I'm showing? Okay, I'll speak without the PowerPoints. I'll just speak directly to you. Uh, I'm gonna be uh, providing uh, uh, information on four basic questions today, four ba basic uh, research questions that should inform your deliberations. First, uh, the question, are students improving in terms of their critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills during college? Uh, that's not everything that college and university is about, but it's one of the uh, uh, primary sets of outcomes we, we, we would like to see from our students. We can think of these as being uh, generic higher order skills that transfer with individuals from job to job, industry to industry, occupation to occupation. They are also the same uh, uh, skills that follow people uh, into their adult lives that are the foundation of democratic citizenship. Second, as a sociologist, I'm going to be presenting patterns that uh, address inequality in learning outcomes in higher education. As sociologists, we're very concerned about whether characteristics that are ascribed to people at birth, such as uh, uh, gender, race, uh, or social class background end up structuring inequality in subsequent outcomes. I'll present on that. Third, for practitioners and policymakers, I will identify the factors in our study that are associated with greater learning on this indicator. So we have, because we have variation in our study, we're able to identify factors that lead to greater gains uh, in terms of, of learning outcomes. And finally, I'll summarize for the board where these students are today that graduated if, in spring 2009. These are the successes of, of uh, uh, higher education, those that graduated in four years' time and uh, in this very difficult economic climate we're living in today, I'd like to say a little bit about how they're doing. Now, to ad address these questions, we had to put together our own data set uh, uh, called the Determinants of College Learning data set. This looks similar to some of the federal data sets that exist in K-12 education uh, uh, that much of social science research is based on. However, uh, there are some distinctions that I'm, are worth noting. Uh, uh, first of all, the study has a longitudinal design. We track this, uh, the same individuals as they move through college, uh, giving them an assessment at multiple points of time to see whether or not they gain on this assessment. We can therefore uh, apply a value-added framework that hopes and assumes that any individual can take advantage of a college opportunity and, and gain, show gains. Um, uh, we, we start with students in fall 2005 as they enter college. We give them the assessment. We assess them again at the end of the spring to, uh, 2007, at the end of their sophomore years, and then give it to them again at the end of their senior years, the spring of their senior year. 
we also uh, survey them and collect their transcripts to be able to identify the factors associated with learning. Uh, this study existed in uh, 24 diverse four-year institutions, including uh, uh, flagship public research universities, uh, elite residential liberal arts colleges, uh, uh, some public teaching universities and colleges, as well as uh, historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. It is a very diverse set of colleges and universities with only uh, two notable biases in the sample. One, we ended up with more uh, women uh, than uh, uh, is representative of, of four-year college students today. We believe that's because it's harder to find male students uh, to voluntarily comply with school authority when making uh, uh, a request on their time. Shocking. Uh, the other notable uh, uh, bias in, in the sample is that uh, at the bottom quartile of initial prior ability, uh, prior SAT scores, we lost a lot of those students uh, um, from our sample, and so if you will, the findings I'm going to present today are upwardly biased to uh, uh, suggest most likely greater academic and rigor and learning than would exist if we had the full sample, including the bottom quartile. Now, one more technical note before I get to the findings about this in instrument we use to measure learning. It's called the Collegiate Learning Assessment, the CLA. Many members of your board are likely familiar with this uh, instrument, but some of the larger public there may not be. Let me uh, uh, say the following about it. it. First of all, it's like every assessment measure, it's limited and imperfect. You can't have a perfect measure of, 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 of uh, uh, student competency. And so uh, it, it has limitations. First of all, it doesn't uh, attempt to assess subject-specific skills which uh, uh, arguably are important for students. It concentrates on these generic skills. Now, uh, one of its important uh, features is that it's a direct measure of what students can do. Direct measure of what students can do. Now, why that's important is the following. Prior to this book, uh, much of the research in higher education was based on asking students when they finish colleges and universities, how much do you think you learned? And in America, most students will say, I learned a lot. Just that, like if I asked the board members here today, are you a better than average driver? <laughs> we would have everyone on the board raise their hands, they're better than average drivers. You, sim you simply can't assess uh, 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 self-assess in areas such as this. Now, now, this prior research, let me just say one more thing about it. Based on that, they, uh, past researchers, looked at what other responses on the surveys, and students who reported that they were in a lot of clubs, they volunteered, they studied in groups, they were socially engaged on campus. They were the same kids who said, I learned a lot. They were more likely to say they learned a lot. The introverted kids weren't in all these clubs and so on. You ask them, did they learn a lot? They say, I'm not sure. So based on this spurious relationship, People have been selling to uh, higher education colleges and universities best practices, arguing that to get students to learn, all you need to do is get them socially engaged and attached. Now, getting them socially engaged and attached is, could be a great thing in terms of keeping them in school, making sure they don't drop out, making sure they graduate. It could be a useful, worthy policy, but please, board members, don't kid yourself in thinking that it has much or anything at all to do with learning. In fact, in our study, we see that it's negatively correlated with, with gains. In, in it's the more you do it, the less you learn in college. Now, uh, what, you, what this test does is it gives students a task to do where they're given a set of documents, they're asked to think critically about them, synthesize information across them, and then write a logical argument based on it. A difficult task to be sure, 
but exactly the type of tasks you'd expect students to be able to do better at as they move through uh, uh, four-year colleges. Now let's get to the findings. Let's get uh, and. Um, one of the most significant findings of the book, I think, is a basically a simple survey question we used, where we asked students at the end of their sophomore year, think back about the semester before uh, and tell us how many courses you took where you were asked to uh, uh, write more than 20 pages over the course of the semester. How many courses did you take like that? And half of the students came back to us and said, none, none. Uh, we asked them about re courses with reading. How many courses did you take where you were asked to read more than 40 pages per week on average? Again, a basic question, and as a naive social scientist, we asked how many, assuming there'd be three, four, many courses with these reading and writing requirements. Again, it, the, the, the results came back to us. 32% of the students say, I have no class where I've been asked to read more than 40 pages per week on average. Large numbers of students, not everyone, but large numbers of students have found ways to, to uh, uh, move through uh, four-year colleges with very little ask of them in terms of reading and writing demands. And, uh, I would argue that today uh, students have available social media that they can, they can uh, 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 find where it's very easy within a, a couple of minutes a student can find in any college and university that you're uh, working to coordinate the activities for. Within a, within a few minutes time they can find the departments to go to, the courses to take, the professors to study with that will ask very little of them and give out uh, 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 high grades with little work. And so we make it all too easy for students to navigate through with little ask of them. To make matters worse, if enrollments shift in this way to these easier programs and departments and professors and then administrators reward those enrollment shifts, by saying that's where the resources should go, to areas where there are enrollment growth. And the enrollment declines are in places where academic rigor is still maintained. In fact, if you will, we've, we unintentionally incentivize a decline in academic rigor. Now, we also ask students as a check on the last measure of academic rigor, reading and writing, because a, a student certainly could be in a math and science class with little reading and little writing, but lots of academic rigor. So as another measure of academic rigor, we, we looked at our studying. And the findings that came back to us were the, were the following. Uh, the average student says they spend 15 hours a, a week in classes and labs, and they do that if they attend all their classes and labs with perfect attendance, which is not always the case and uh, 12 to 13 hours studying. Now, they're studying, a third of the time they say they're studying, they're studying with their friends, they say. And we show later on in this presentation, studying with friends, the more you do that, the, le the more your scores go down. Hmm. So just traditional studying with friends, studying alone. The traditional studying alone, today, in a, the average four-year college student in America today studies alone eight hours a week right? Barely more than an hour a day. 36% uh, of our sample said they studied alone five or fewer hours a day. Uh, and we had their transcripts. We, we thought initially these kids would really be having a tough time. But in fact, their grade point averages are uh, 3.16 on average. The kids that study five or fewer hours alone per week. Why are their graded point averages so high? Because again, uh, look at uh, how many, how easy it is to find courses with little reading requirements, little writing requirements, and so you don't need to work that hard to uh, uh, um, to do well in these classes. Um, so we've had, uh, if you will, we've had. Uh, uh, accompanied with a decline in uh, our studying over time, these uh, labor economists, Philip Babcock at uh, UC Santa Barbara and, and Mindy Marks at UC Riverside, 
they went back to all the survey data where full-time college students were surveyed going all the way back to 1920. From 1920 to 1960, a full-time college student spends about 35 to 40 hours a week uh, in academic activities. Uh, uh, 15 in, in, cla in classes, 25 studying. And then from 1960 on, the 25 hours a week studying falls in half. It drops in half to 12 to 13 hours. It's a, a dramatic, dramatic decline. Some of that is uh, students work more today for, for pay, but that's only five hours. The decline is 13 hours. Something fundamental is going on. And one of the things that's going on, of course, <coughs> is a change in the organizational cultures of colleges and universities where teaching is often undervalued and academic rigor is almost always under-evaluated and, un and not incentivized. Let me give you another example of, of, of how the incentives are misaligned. Uh, so from the 1960s to the 1970s on, the, the research ideals from the research universities that uh, uh, tenure promotion compensation should be driven by research and scholarship. That ideal moved from the research university throughout higher education to all the colleges and universities virtually that you're looking at, all the four-year colleges, where again, tenure promotion compensation is often driven much more by uh, uh, research and scholarship than teaching. And now, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I've said repeatedly, but I think it's important for the Texas board in particular to hear, is that we've often made the mistake that if we value teach, teaching at all, we use course evaluations. And course evaluations incentivize not academic rigor, but they incentivize uh, dumbing down the curriculum, being entertaining, and handing out grades, uh, high grades. If students are getting high grades, they assume that they're learning. And so it incentivizes the, the exactly the wrong behavior you'd want to get in, in terms of, uh, of academic rigor. Uh, and so if you're going to measure teaching, uh, we should uh, adopt multiple method, measurement methods of this that it would include looking at course syllabi, looking at student work, uh, looking at doing peer observations of the classrooms, uh, and in these course evaluations themselves, making sure that there were measures of <coughs> academic rigor in them, where you're asking students not how satisfied you are with the instruction, but how many hours, what did you do? How many hours did you work in this class? How many hours of homework? Did you do reading requirements? Did you do writing requirements? Getting, using those surveys and course evaluations to get descriptive data that can inform uh, 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 improved instruction and improved academic rigor. Now, given this fact that um, many students are going through college, 36% studying five or fewer hours a week studying alone, 50% uh, without uh, in a typical semester, which that sophomore year is, a typical semester they're not taking any course asking them to write more than 20 pages, 32% of the students uh, not having any course asking them to read more than 40 pages per week. Given this little, uh, the, the extent to which how meager and modest this educational ex uh, 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 academic involvement is, it's not surprising that if you look at ga for gains on the CLA test, you can't find them for a large number of students. For the full four years of college, 36% of the students don't move up hardly uh, hardly anything at all. If you thought of the CLA as a test that ranged from zero to 100, 36 percent of the students can't do even one point better on this test, don't do even one point better after four years of college. Mm -hmm. And why would they? Why would they, given that uh, they're not being asked to read, they're not often, they're not being asked to write much, they're not being studying and applying themselves very much? And so let me also say very clearly here, it's not just the CLA. It's not just my sample and it's not just the CLA. There's a, uh, a colleague uh, down in, the, in Wabash named Charlie Blake. And they are using a different test of critical thinking and complex reasoning. 
uh, called the CAP test, developed by the Education Testing Service. It's a multiple choice test. They are, are in three dozen uh, uh, colleges and universities, mainly liberal arts colleges, and they uh, uh, are following uh, 4,000 students. Guess what they find? They uh, find results identical to ours. And they've published that, that replication study in the, uh, the spring issue of Change Magazine. I'd like you, you know, I, if you have questions about the CLA and our study, please go look there because the, the findings I'm presenting here are quite robust to what the measure you, you are, uh, that you're using, uh, as well as the sample. So let's shift a little bit to what are the factors associated with, uh, with learning in higher education. Uh, given that you're all going through my uh, PowerPoints there, I, I imagine they're not being shown. So I'm on page, uh, right now I would be uh, around slide um, uh, 10, where uh, looking at uh, titled CLA Performance, Faculty Expectations and Reading and Writing Requirements. And so here, uh, in this point of the, uh, the presentation, I'm going to show you what are the factors associated with learning. Large numbers of kids aren't gaining at all after four years, but many are. And in every college and university we, we looked at, we found some pockets of excellence where students were applying themselves in learning. What, what, what tracks with that? First of all, faculty expectations. Uh, we asked students, do faculty have high expectations for students like you? Students like you conjuring up group identification. And when students say yes, they are much more likely to demonstrate higher gains on the CLA over time than otherwise. Just like in K-12 education, students respond to faculty expectations. Right? You can, the, the influence of a faculty member uh, um, uh, is partially related to the social psychological factor. Uh, next, reading and, and uh, uh, reading and writing requirements. If students take a course with both reading and writing requirements, we see a greater gains on the CLA than otherwise. Uh, next, uh, in terms of, of hours spent doing different activities, the more time students spend studying alone, the greater their gains over time on the CLA. Hard work in terms of traditional applications, studying alone, tracks with, with greater gains. However, we also find evidence that studying in groups, the more you spend time studying in groups, your scores actually decline over time. Uh, and we believe that's, uh, that's because most of the, the studying with groups today, most of the group activities today is not very highly structured. In fact, uh, uh, if left to their own device, students will, will not take advantage of those opportunities uh, uh, in a way that's associated with cognitive gains. And you can see from that chart, the amount of time studying alone, your scores go down just the same as the amount of time, the hours you spent uh, in a fraternity or a sorority. <laughs> Next, where do uh, uh, where do uh, where are the gains highest and uh, lowest uh, in terms of uh, 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 fields of study in your colleges and universities? We find that uh, in the traditional arts and science core of the university, social science, humanities, science and math, the gains are, uh, are greater there. Part of that, of course, is due to the fact that students uh, are not randomly assigned to majors. They pick these majors, and so uh, some of them is, is probably, some of these gains probably have to do with unmeasured factors. However, what we demonstrate in the book is that the social science, humanities, science and math, arts and science core are the places where academic rigor is uh, slightly higher than in other parts of the colleges and universities. In uh, the places where the gains are the lowest, uh, business, communication, education, social work, we find the least academic rigor in terms of reading requirements, writing requirements, and students self-reported hour studying. Uh, next, uh, uh, how does this vary in terms of social background? We found no differences in terms of social class background. That is, uh, regardless of your, whether or not your parents were well-educated or not well-educated, students gained at the same rate 
in college, uh, same, uh, uh, same rate. However, in terms of race findings, we found a, a, a different pattern that was more disturbing. In the book, we talk about Hispanic and Asian race differences as well, but the most robust and, and, and sharpest finding I'll talk about today, the black-white differences, where we see that the longer a student spends in colleges and universities, the greater the gap between black and white students in terms of their uh, uh, academic performance. The gaps grow over time. White students advance at a much higher rate than African American students attending colleges and universities. This pattern is very similar to the pattern that exists in K-12 education, but please note in K-12 education we have a national discourse and policies that are uh, focused on making sure that no ch child is left behind, that all students learn, and that we close this achievement gap. We have no such policies in colleges and universities today. And so the gaps are the same, but I would argue that our policy response to them has been uh, 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 very limited and insufficient in higher education. Uh, uh, Next, where do colleges and universities make a difference in terms of learning outcomes? Our results show that indeed that's the case. So the slide here on institutional variation I'm showing you is you can do what's a technique, what's called partition the variance. How much of the growth is a, across schools? How much is within a school? We find a pattern very similar to K-12 education learning. 23% of the variance is across schools. Schools matter. Where you go to schools matters for about 23% of the differences in the gains students show. It has consequences where you go to school. However, 77% of the variance is within the college and university. Wherever we went, whatever college and university we, we looked at, we found some students applying themselves, taking rigorous courses and learning a lot, and then others that weren't. So if you want to improve instruction, and most of the variance is within the school, not across schools, you'd be better, uh, 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 um, uh, better advised to make sure there's a culture of assessment within the institution, where the, where the president and the provost of the school can tell you where are areas that are, uh, uh, where measure, where's learning occurring, uh, where are areas that need improvement and what they're doing about it. If you're just going to hold schools accountable at the school level, you're going to miss the fact that there's variation within and that student, that presidents and provosts don't need to go down the street to, to learn from an exemplary uh, college, uh, uh, say, in Austin. They can look within themselves at the, the programs and departments where there is rigorous instruction and the students are learning and where that's not, and they can learn, they can, they can improve simply by, by, by focusing inward on that. I want to spend uh, just the last couple slides telling you about how these students are doing today. You've been very patient, and then I, uh, uh, I'll take your questions. Uh, how are these uh, uh, students today uh, faring two years out? Again, this is a sample of only those kids that graduated on time after four years. Uh, there are successes. We find that uh, uh, many of them in, uh, are back in graduate school, mostly master's programs, uh, and we're not sure whether they're back in there. Uh, some of them are, are, are in graduate school pursuing uh, uh, clear professional aspirations. Others are simply there, uh, we, we believe, uh, as a, um, a safety, uh, a fallback from uh, the very difficult labor market that exists. Only 52% of the graduates are engaged in full-time employment two years out. And another way to look at that is uh, uh, large numbers are part-time or are, are, are unemployed. And probably the best estimate of that is, is looking at those individuals that are not full-time students. Those that are, that are in graduate programs, it's a mixed bunch, let's set those aside. For the, the graduates that aren't in school, two years out, we find that close to a quarter of them are in part-time employment or unemployed. They haven't been able to find full-time employment even after two years. They are also highly indebted. 
uh, two-thirds of our sample report college loans, and on average those loans were $26,000. Many of the students in our sample have loans uh, $50,000, $60,000 or more. Uh, one uh, uh, clear indicator of their uh, 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 distressing circumstances is the next statistic we find. 24% of them two years out are back living at home with their families, 24%. And these students, our sample is not made up of a high number of residential, uh, uh, non-residential uh, commuting students to begin with. It was in the single digits. And so these are kids who went away to college and then came back home because of the difficult transitions they're facing. And the last finding I'd like to mention is to move a little bit from the economic circumstances these kids are under to a bigger qu question, a question of, of their larger civic engagement. Because, of course, colleges and universities are about much more than simply preparing people for labor market success. They are also about preparing democratic citizens for taking responsible roles in an adult society. And so we find, in, a, in perhaps the most disturbing uh, uh, finding of all, even uh, in some ways uh, more disturbing than the labor market struggles, which colleges and universities perhaps can't control is the civic engagement findings. We asked college graduates two years out, how often do you read the newspaper in print or online? How often do you read the newspaper? Arguably, the foundation of informed democratic citizenship. 32% of these college graduates came back to us and said, we read the newspaper monthly or never. Monthly or never. We also asked them, how often do you discuss politics or public affairs with your friends, your family members, your colleagues, in, in person or online uh, or on the phone? A broad, broad question. 39% of the student uh, graduates came back and said, monthly or never. Large numbers of these students, were. it's not that we're just not preparing them in terms of critical thinking and complex reasoning. We're not training them in the attitudes and dispositions necessary for adult, uh, adult roles in society. These students, of course, are going to be the educated elite in our country that our democracy depends on. It depends on them thinking critically about the complex issues that are facing our nation, keeping informed on those issues, and making reasonable dis uh, decisions that go beyond the rhetoric of, of politicians, regardless of party. It's, we see little to no evidence of that for large numbers of these college graduates. We also find that this, these differences in civic engagement track with what we ask them to do while in college. And so for those students who were studying five or fewer hours, 52% of those graduates say, I read the newspaper monthly or never. Wow. Those students that were asked to do homework and, 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 and put in more effort, they are ones that are much more likely to be reading the newspaper and so on. Finally, we look at the 209 CLA performance and see does that track with any of the, lay, uh, the adult outcomes. We find little evidence after two years that it tracks with earnings. Earnings are very unstable at that early period. However, it does track very clearly with living at home, where the top uh, quintile, the top 20% uh, of students in terms of CLA performance are about uh, uh, ha um, uh, half as likely than the bottom quintile to be living at home, right? The kids who are performing very poorly on the CLA are the same kids that are back at home uh, uh, two years later. It also tracks with unemployment. So I've got one more slide on policy recommendations, and then again, I'd, uh, uh, I'd love to dialogue more with you about specific questions and findings uh, uh, you may have with the book and uh, my presentation. So in terms of policy recommendations, uh, we have advanced the following. First, we are highly, highly skeptical of, of any sort of uh, federally Im imposed accountability schema. Uh, uh, increased accountability from, uh, that's imposed from the top down, we think will have, likely have uh, unintended uh, negative consequences and likely be counterproductive. Uh, you will not be able to get the changes you will see, you, will, you would desire 
through, a federal, uh, through increased federal regulation. I'm highly skeptical that federal regulation is a path to lead to improved organizational performance in, in, in most organizations and industries, including uh, colleges and universities. So, of course, there has to be accountability, right? Where does that, where should that accountability rest? And I, we argue that that accountability needs to be enhanced and strengthened at lower levels in the system where it, where, uh, that it, it naturally should be presiding in. Uh, in a federal decentralized system uh, of education like we have in the U.S., that's where accountability belongs. So first, trustees, and I know you advise regents and uh, regents and so on in Texas. Trustees need to start asking administrators, need to start asking uh, the provosts and presidents <coughs> questions other than simply uh, uh, how much money did you raise last year? What's the uh, uh, SAT score of the entering class? How many kids graduated? Uh, what new buildings did you put up? Tell us about faculty research productivity. Trustees have to start asking questions about student learning. And I would recommend three basic questions. One, again, it's decentralized. One, how are you measuring learning? Two, where are areas that need improvement? And three, what are you doing to improve them? Every school leader in this country, I don't care if it's an elementary school principal or a college provost, should be able to answer those basic three questions. And if they can't, ladies and gentlemen, it's time they're held accountable. Two, administrators. Administrators have the responsibility, because the incentives are all wrong in higher education today, we get these outcomes because the, not because there's lazy people, lazy students, lazy faculty. The faculty are hard working, they're just being asked to focus on the wrong thing. So the administrators have to create an incentive system that incentivizes uh, a, a better balance that includes uh, academic rigor and learning outcomes. They need to do that symbolically, communicating uh, the value of this to students. They need to do it substantively. As you know, in, in, in higher education today, uh, for example, we've increasingly not invested in full-time faculty. They're in decline. But we've increasingly invested in student support staff. Now, Again, you have to, uh, substantively, you have to, if you t believe in academic rigor and learning, you have to make investment decisions at the colleges and universities that uh, 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 demonstrate one's commitment in this area. <laughs> Third, faculty. This is a faculty matter, right? Faculty should not be, uh, have a responsibility to address this. But note that you can't address it individually alone. The incentives for an individual faculty to have academic rigor are, again, pointed in all the opposite directions. If an individual is rigorous in their classes, has high grading standards, uh, and asks a lot of their students, they know through the social media that the course is tough, and many, many, many of them will go elsewhere. So you can't do it alone. Faculty need to be come together, and administrators need to act in partnership and in collaboration with these faculty uh, communities to make sure that there are proper grading standards, academic rigor in the course. This is not something that uh, 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 needs to be imposed on faculty. This is something that can be done in partnership together. We should, we, we sh uh, faculty and administrators should share this, uh, this commitment and responsibility. Finally, students. Ultimately, learning is a student's responsibility. We found students in every college and university applying themselves in learning. But, we need better systems of holding them accountable. Right now with great inflations, ladies and gentlemen, as you probably know, we hand out grades in colleges and universities, high grades, B's and A's, like it's candy at Halloween. We just give those grades out. It is time that we impose standards and you start with kind of uh, enforcing grading standards. So. One, thing, uh, 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 one solution that's, uh, that actually is not viable is, okay, let's everyone use uh, common grading standards. Uh, everyone should be grading on the same curve and so on. That's going to be hard to do. <laughs> but here's an easy, easy, easy technical fix for you if you're serious about raising standards. 
it would take only uh, a, 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 a software consultant and uh, s uh, flicking a switch. In every student transcript in the future, you got each student for every class gets two grades. The grade they got in the course, and right next to it, the average grade students in that course got. So at your transcript, you see very easily are you getting uh, high grades because you're picking the easy classes, or are you getting high grades because you've applied yourself and you're and you're and you're doing doing better? It's an easy, easy technical fix. All we need, ladies and gentlemen, is the political will to take this issue seriously. And so, in closing, I can say, it's it's we this in the book we argue this is not a crisis for higher education because. A lot of the people in the system are getting the outcome they want. Faculty are focusing on research and scholarship. They've been incentivized to do that there. Many of them are just fine doing that. Administrators are asked to focus on all these other worthy outcomes, endowments, building new physical plants, uh, so on. They're not asked to do this. Uh, students are often looking just for a credential to trade for labor market success. There's no incentives in the system to change this. But unfortunately, the rest of the world is not standing still. And we are increasingly in a situation where we're in an uh, economically competitive position with the rest of the world, and that uh, competitiveness is, is threatened. Uh, just last week, and I'll close with this, just this last week, the, uh, the uh, European Union put out a report called the Euro Student, where they collected data from every country in Europe about the academic effort of students in their countries. Uh, uh, and when that came out last week, it got very little play in the U.S. press. The U.S. isn't in the study. Maybe that's why it got little press. But when I opened the report, interesting, I, I, my question is, where is the U.S. going to come on this? Uh, uh, how are we going to compare to the rest of the, to the, these European countries? There were more than 20 countries in this study. And uh, if you look at academic time, time in class and time studying, we come in next to last if we were on that study. We would come in next to last. Only the Slovak Republic would be higher, or would lower, sorry. That's not good enough. That's not going to be good enough for the future. That's not going to be good enough for economic competitiveness. But again, remember also, that's not in good enough for civic engagement so that we can face the difficult problems our society is facing and, and make reasonable, responsible adult judgments on them. Thank you very much for your time and for inviting me. I'm, I'm uh, uh, um, very much looking forward to uh, your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Uh, it's very uh, thought-provoking. Um, members, uh, questions? Commissioner? I, I have a question. I, I, I noticed that, uh, like uh, most faculty members, you uh, own yeah, your body clock. Hold on one second. Clock. I need to turn this volume up. Uh, my technical support uh, left me. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think I can hear you a little better now. Thank you. That was a that was a almost a perfect uh, forty five minute presentation, like you would normally do in class. Uh, thank you. Um, I know you didn't. I, I know in your book you didn't look at uh, community colleges, two year institutions. But do you have any findings or any data that might describe what the uh, situation in terms of learning outcomes is in two year institutions? Well, those are very good questions. I mean, in some ways, the, the two-year colleges are asked uh, are, are often much more focused on these outcomes, teaching and learning outcomes, than the, the four-year colleges and universities. Uh, we do not have them in the study, as you mentioned, but the organization we partnered with, the Council for Aid to Education, has developed a, uh, an assessment indicator to use in these, uh, 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 with these uh, uh, two-year community colleges. Uh, I can't say more than that. Uh, I would say that I'd be worried that some of the ins some of the incentives are are uh, are still not properly aligned there, uh, and you have maybe many of the challenges in terms of what students bring into the uh, the schools are likely uh, going to be greater, and so it's 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 quite possible that. Uh, 
you would see uh, very similar uh, disturbing patterns there, if not, if not more pronounced patterns. Amir? Dr. Aram, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I enjoyed reading your book as well, and I just wanted to give a little bit of a student perspective on this. Um, I'm currently in my last year of medical school, but I went to an undergraduate institution that's considered one of the top public schools in the country. And the reality and the fact that you, what you said about the one click and you can find the grades that are distributed, I had a, one of my buddies who's uh, actually a lawyer now, graduated um, from a great law school as well. He based his criteria on the classes that he would take on how many A's were given and the proximity to where it was on his campus compared to where he lived in his dorm. And he graduated with a 4.0. Uh, because he knew in the aftermath of going into, he wanted to become a lawyer, that he knew that if he didn't have those grades prior, that he wouldn't be considered for graduate school. So that was a really uh, interesting fact that you brought to reality that I wanted to share, that it is, it is quite prevalent on our campuses of a higher institution. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned about one of the professors from Dartmouth about how talking about grade inflation, grade inflation and how that affected the grades that they gave to their students, I think it feeds into that same perception is that uh, for the faculty, they don't want to hold these students back by making them be accountable for the grades that they're getting because they know that in the long run it could possibly limit their aspirations for going into a graduate level course. Um, but one thing that I think we can all take away from this is that the fact that you noted uh, duly in your book when we were talking about how you showed us in the chart with the 76 percent in uh, growth of the CLA score within the institution, that every institution has the potential to impact positively the students. Um, and I think we need to keep that in mind and encourage these higher level courses and the, the more rigorous course load. So I appreciate you taking that time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, um, again, the, the, uh, if you go out and, and interview students or observe them, you do find this exact pattern where they'll, they'll choose easier courses. Um, and, um, uh, and as the uh, a, a board member uh, mentioned, faculty have very little incentives to uh, have high standards. It doesn't make you popular being the one faculty member in your, uh, at your uh, uh, at your school who's got, you know, old-fashioned, old-school standards. It doesn't make you very popular uh, with the students. And uh, because your enrollments will suffer, it will not make you very popular with your colleagues or your administrators. And so we need to address this, and one of those ways to address it is the one I said that you could have a technical, if you reported the average grades given in the class just mechanically, you, you we would self-adjust for that. I have a, I have a golden question. Uh, how do we, or what would you suggest we do to increase rigor at the co college level when we have our ever-increasing number of students entering college that are ill-prepared for that level of work? You understand my question? <laughs> I mean, how, how are we going to go about increasing the rigor of the college level course when the students entering college out of our secondary schools are, are, are ill prepared to, to do the work at, as it presently is being presented. 60% of the students that, that enter our community colleges can't take freshman English without a remedial education. And, and, you know, and, you're, and I agree with you, I think we do need to increase the rigor, but how do we go about doing that? when we're getting a, a, a tremendous number of students that are being put into the system that are just not, they're not prepared. And, and obviously the answer has got to be that we need to address it at a much earlier point in their academic career. We've got to increase that rigor not only within the college level, but the rigor has to be increased in, in elementary school, junior high, and certainly a large number of students are dropping out in high school uh, because of they can't for whatever reason, but the, the rigor has got to be increased even at a high school level if we're going to get that tr transition from high school to college and have them prepared to do the level of course work in college. So I'd, I'd like to hear your comment on that, if you would. And by the way, I haven't yeah, very, tremendously very enjoyed good, this presentation. Um, uh, very, very good, very good uh, uh, set of questions the board member raises about to what extent is these problems, uh, this higher education inherit 
from K-12 education, not just in terms of, of uh, uh, students coming unprepared academically, but also unprepared in terms of having the right attitudes and dispositions towards learning and effort. Yes. Uh, I, uh, in the book, we find that uh, uh, that prior preparation is indeed important and critical. About half of the learning in higher education is attributable back, not to the college, but back to the prior preparation in K-12 education. So that's certainly a, concern, you know, a, a valid concern that one the board member makes. However, as, a, as uh, we use in this study this value-added measure which doesn't say that college and university uh, students to be successful have to get to a, uh, a proficiency level of such a height or such a, a level, but rather ask them all to grow. All, as, a, as a social scientist and as an educator, I believe that all students can gain and all students can, be, can and should be confronted with academic rigor in order to be given the opportunity to gain. And so again, the value added measure that we're using and the approach doesn't assume that all the students are gonna be able to get to the, you know, to uh, level X. What it does ask every student to do is show gains. And it, it, it also asks the educators uh, uh, in these institutions to, uh, to expect them to gain and to give them academic experiences that are going to lead to those gains. Uh, Dr. Aram, uh, a week ago Sunday, the Austin American Statesman uh, ran an article regarding the value, the, the current value of higher education, um, which has been a topic of a lot of discussion uh, over the last couple of years, uh, not just in Texas, but around the country. And there, the the uh, and this is uh, not uh, not to pick on UT. I think this is true of uh, of all of our institutions. But the average grade point uh, had risen from 2.6 in 1996 to over 3.1 in 2010. And while the graduating class of 2010 would no doubt like to say it's because they're just that much smarter, the uh, in 14 years, the grade point inflation was, was uh, over half a point. Um, you mentioned uh, not only a great uh, and simple uh, policy for uh, better student accountability, but also a good, a strong correlation between faculty expectations and coursework that required both reading and writing assignments uh, to, to learning outcomes. Um, can you, or in your research, are there, are there either states uh, or institutions um, or even pockets of excellence that you referred to that you could share with us that are, have either adopted your recommendations or are changing their incentives to, uh, to cause that behavior to change? Great, great. So uh, one thing, uh, in terms of that 14-year uh, rise in grade point averages, I wouldn't be at all concerned if there wasn't, during that same 14-year period, a decline in the amount of student effort. And so there's very good social science research out there that as grade inflation increases, students engage in a practice called satisficing. That if they can get a B with little effort, yeah, uh, that's good enough. And so they can take that B home to their parents, uh, which they're not required to share the grades with anymore legally, but th if they do, they can re uh, if they are so, so choose, they can share that grade with the parent, and the B is respectable. Uh, they think a B will be respectable for employers. And so the, 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 the grade inflation has led to satisficing and a decline in uh, 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 student effort. The best paper and work on that is by Philip Babcock. Um, now, you asked me for exemplary institutions. I'm reluctant to do that um, uh, um, uh, in, in, um, uh, with specific uh, um, reference to my own work and, and uh, their engagement with my work, but I will call out two, uh, two things that I find very heartening in some of the best colleges and universities in the country. Because <coughs> sometimes the people, we, we make the mistake to think that this is only a problem at the bottom. 
No, no, no. This is a problem throughout higher education. And so let me tell you about two colleges and universities, Harvard and Princeton, and what they're doing. Harvard, just last, uh, uh, several weeks ago, uh, uh, launched a new uh, 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 program in teaching and learning with a $40 million grant behind it, right? A $40 million gift that they're launching a new teaching and learning initiative to improve instruction at their college and university, right? So at the best colleges and universities in the country, the leadership there is thinking about it. Let me turn to Princeton. Princeton has been adopting policies on, on reducing grade inflation, having common grading standards for the last 10 years now. Right? You might think, oh, we don't have to worry about Princeton, but they're worried about themselves, and they're addressing their having responsible academic leadership on this issue to, to uh, address things uh, such as, uh, um, as student standards. Now, let me say just one last thing in, in, in finding. The way I hope that the book does not get uh, um, uh, um, uh, responded to in institutions is that people take those benchmarks that are in there, these crude measures, 40 pages of, of, of reading, 20 pages of writing, and start checking syllabi to see whether they have those. You have to turn it over to the faculty and administrators at those institutions to define the academic rigor and the academic standards for themselves and to make sure that it's there. You know, taking an arbitrary measures from outside, uh, you know, it's a good way to do social science, but it's not a great way to make educational policy. And so you push academic rigor, but ask, ask and demand that the administrators and faculty at these institutions demonstrate that, that, that they're actually putting these things in place. Janelle? Thank you so much. I enjoyed the book. And, but I, I was wondering if you could summarize, do you see one particular issue that has really um, been the driving force for, for what you're calling is um, a decline of rigor or dumbing down, basically, of academic curriculums? One defining issue over what the last 20, 25 years. I can, I can think of a few, on a personal level, helicopter parents that have, um, <laughs> then they finally let the kids go, things like that. But also, you know, just the, the, the increase of stimulation that kids have to not study and uh, the ability to get away with it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very, very, very good questions. Uh, first of all, I would uh, uh, fully agree with the board member that some of the causes for declines in academic rigor go well beyond the colleges and universities mm -hmm. to the broad uh, 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 society and culture mm -hmm. we live in. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned helicopter parents. Uh, uh, the only thing I worry more than that, uh, about more than helicopter parents is no parents. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And you know the changes in family structure that we've seen in the you know in the past decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, certainly are a challenge to preparing uh, uh, the next generation of students uh, successfully. Um, the, the, the changes in the technology and the media where, remember I said 36 percent of the students uh, say they study only five or fewer hours alone. Well, how do we study alone today? We study alone by picking up our, our, our cell phones, checking our texts and our email, uh, uh, I, I'll tell you a little story. I uh, gave a talk in a, a Midwest uh, uh, university two weeks ago, and the provost very proudly showed off his new library to me. Beautiful library. And he, and he said, look, we've got students in all these carousels. I looked over their shoulders. I'm a sociologist. I can't help myself. <laughs> Guess what's on their screen? Facebook. A third to a half of them had <laughs> Facebook up. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Mm -hmm. Go to any college, university in this country today and look at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So the technology and the media are certainly a challenge. They're much more exciting and, and, inter and uh, more interesting than their faculty. I can't compete with that. Well, <laughs> so, I, have a, I have another question that um, 
you didn't really touch on, or I just maybe sped right over it too quickly, um, adult learners. I, I interview a lot of employees for potential positions in our facility, and um, do you, you didn't really look at adult learners, p returning veterans, things like that. Do you see the same comparison with those students as you would with just an 18-year-old out of college? Right. That's a very good question. Uh, they're not in our study, okay. so I don't have an empirical basis for this. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think that many of them would be much more mature mm -hmm. and focused on their educational opportunities than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. There are some societies, of course, other countries that require uh, several years of military service or, or civic uh, service before they go to college and university at, to, to, to increase uh, the maturity. Uh, they are not. They are not in the um, in the study. Okay. Uh, but again, to go back to the earlier question, I think there are these broad cultural shifts uh, out there that are that are certainly contribute. We can, it's beyond the uh, the purview of the board and my own research to to name them all or hope that we can address them. What we can address is the organizational cultures of schools, okay. and the organizational cultures of schools are set up if you will, with a perfect storm where all the incentives are focused in the wrong direction in terms of uh, getting the learning outcomes and increasing academic rigor. And so it's a multiple set of, of, of factors where all, all these actors in the organization are, are encouraged and incentivized to focus on the wrong thing. Again, not because they're not hard work. They're, it's not a problem of of bad apples, lazy, lazy faculty, and so on. They're really hard working. They're just not working in ways that are aligned with increasing academic rigor and student learning often. I'd be interested in what $40 million will pay for. <laughs> I'm not sure why it takes so much money to, to get the <laughs> outcome we're looking for, but that's another book. <laughs> I, well, no, I think that's a, no, I think that's a very important point. Many of these changes we're asking for don't take more money, don't take more money. So I often hear the the critique back from faculty. Oh, I'd love to have all that writing, but I'm teaching a class with with several hundred students. Well, if you believe that the writing is educationally appropriate, it's not an excuse to large class size not to assign the reading. You develop strategies for grading to manage the workload, but you don't not assign the read, the writing to students because you can't uh, 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 you, you don't want to take the time to think up a pedagogical strategy. Hmm. Now, in uh, K twelve educators know that when I I taught at English in a high school, I had five classes a day, thirty two students, one hundred and sixty students. Would anyone have tolerated me saying I can't assign writing because uh, I got 160 students? No, you learn in uh, techniques about grading holistically, getting the students doing peer reviews earlier on of drafts, that sort of thing. So uh, again, it doesn't take $40 million, but it does take, because professors are, were typically not trained to be teachers, Professors were trained to be researchers. The doctoral programs in this country, over you know, they're 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 set up to train new students to be doing research and scholarship. They often have limited or no exposure to uh, how to teach. So it does require a little resource and information flow to 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 inform people that just because you got a large class size doesn't mean you don't give the assignment. You figure out a pedagogical strategy so that you can, you can uh, make sure the students are experiencing the academic uh, activity you want, but in a way that's manageable to your time and your workload. Members, any further questions for Dr. Aram? Dr. Aram, I have one last question. <clears throat> Uh, and that is, have you been successful in persuading the leadership at NYU to post average class grades on student transcripts? Uh, the one thing NYU asked me to do before I uh, uh, went out and talked about the book 
is not talk about NYU. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they're, not, they're not in the book. <laughs> and I have many private conversations here as a prof as a professional colleague, but I uh, 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 I think it's reasonable to respect those as as uh, internal conversations uh, at my place of work. Well, understandable. We we hope that some of these findings, though, do become a, a trend uh, across the country in our our institutions. And we very much appreciate the time you spent with us this morning. It was very uh, enlightening and engaging. So thank you. Thank you for your time and inviting me. You need a timeout? A technical timeout again? Yep. If the audience will find their seats, uh, Strategic Planning Chairman uh, Harold Hahn will uh, pick up uh, his agenda items again, beginning with item uh, 8C. All right. Um. Item 8C. Um. Uh, items one through six were approved by the Committee on the Strategic Planning and Policy uh, Committee at their September meeting. Does anyone have any questions about any of these items? This is for information purposes only. No questions. We'll move to item A. I'm just I'm going sorry, to briefly point me. out that, and I think most board members have probably already seen this, but there is a summary of the uh, total value and type of construction facilities approved over the last quarter at each of the various levels. So if you're if you want to just get the big picture of uh, the construction and renovation and what's going on with with our institutions, um, yeah, that's on on uh, page. Uh, well, it's it's the summary for C, D, and E that's on a blue page in your book. So having said that, we can move right on. Item, excuse me, item 8D is a report on facilities decisions for projects certified to meet the requirements of the expedited process for approval. And uh, I believe that same information is in your packet uh, under 8D. Are there any particular questions from any of the members? Again, this is for informational purposes only. If there's no questions, we'll move to items. Our item 8E is a report on facilities decisions made by the commissioner or assistant commissioner since the previous board meeting. Information is in your packet. Are there any particular questions any board member might have? Again, for informational purposes only. If there are no questions, we'll move to item 8F as a report on proposals approved by the commissioner or assistant commissioner since the previous board meeting. Again, this item is for informational purposes only. Are there any questions? Uh, item 8G1 through 5. Uh, 8G1 through 3, we're on the consent calendar. Uh, 8G4 is consideration of adopting the committee's recommendation to the board relating to the request from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston for a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree with a major in nursing practice. McGregor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a proposal from UTMB for their DNP, the Doctor of Nursing Practice, which is a professional nursing uh, degree program, obviously at the doctoral level, which is intended to provide for advanced training for educators in the nursing profession as well as administrators in the nursing profession. Um, it's a 32 to 48 semester credit hour program beyond the master's degree and they are also putting more than 50 percent of this program in an online environment so it has been also approved by the the distance education advisory committee or the the uh, learning technology advisory committee as we've recently renamed it um, the program actually was given positive uh, feedback from the the TLAC 
and or yeah, learning technology LTAC. Van will, Van will get it squared away for me sooner or later, but we just changed it. Um, but in any case, um, the program does provide opportunities for additional nursing faculty to be trained in the state. And from that perspective, we feel like there's a, a positive role that they can play there. The institution does have several representatives here today in the event that there are questions that arise that they can be helpful with. Um, and we do recommend approval of the, or I'm sorry, the, the committee did recommend approval um, going forward. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion for approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion? None. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, Chairman Hahn, I had just one, one request or, or question, perhaps, uh, uh, having approved this program. Uh, one of the values of the DNPs is the, to uh, tra train and provide a professional nursing faculty. Uh, are we currently measuring, and if, if not, could we measure the combined uh, production of new faculty from all of these DNP programs? Yes, sir, and we can provide that to you. The UTMB staff put together some, some numbers, and we can get that to the board. I think that would be something of interest to the, to the board. You bet. Okay, we also had a discussion about the entire program throughout the state and how many of those degree programs, uh, how many were in practice, how many were in, and they in surveyed, faculty. And they surveyed several of the institutions that have the DNP in Texas, and we'll get you the results of what they provided to us. Very and good. we can take further steps uh, to look into our own internal data to do that, some of that analysis as well. If, yeah, if my, you like. my request is intended to be statewide, not just this, this new program. Yes, sir. <laughs> Item 8G5 was on the consent calendar, uh, as was uh, Item 8H. Uh, item. 8I1 and 2, uh, or excuse me, item 1 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's request to the board relating to a request from Paul Quinn College for a certificate of authority to grant degrees in Texas. McGregor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The Paul Quinn College came to us about two years ago and requested a certificate of authority so that they were protected. Uh, in the event that their accreditation with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools uh, had any issues. And at this point in time, they are still, although they are still accredited by SACS, uh, they have also asked to continue this until such time as they have uh, gotten recognition from a second accreditor uh, whom they are working with, and that accreditor is recognized by the board. So. Basically, this is a, a tertiary fallback position for Paul Quinn, but they would like it just so that we can ensure that they can continue to offer the degrees that they offer at Paul Quinn College, which is one of our private historically black colleges um, uh, in the Dallas area. And the Certificate Advisory Committee did recommend approval of the certificate. Any questions, comments? If not, is there a motion to approve uh, item eight? I one. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item eight I two is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to a request from Baptist Hospitals of Southeast Texas School of Radiology Technology. Well, that's a mouthful <laughs> for a certificate of authority to grant degrees in Texas. McGregor. Thank you, sir. This is actually a similar request for a single degree program, the Associate of Arts and Radiologic Technology uh, from a private entity. Um, and with the recommendation from the Certification Advisory Council, uh, they recommended approval, as does the commissioner moving forward. And this was not considered by the committee and so is coming to you as a new item. Okay. Members, any questions? If not, could I have a motion for item 8I2? I move. Second. Second. All those in any further discussion, excuse me. If none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Item 8J is consideration of adopting the staff recommendation to the board 
relating to the Community College Transfer Student Report from Rider 55 of the General Appropriations Act. McGregor. Thank you very much. This is actually the second installment of the Community College Transfer Report. Uh, we prepared one last by name as well. Uh, the work is basically to do an analysis of the actions that community colleges or that universities are doing to encourage and facilitate the transfer of community college students into their programs um, and looking at the articulation agreements and, and those type of relationships that institutions have and also compare, doing a comparative analysis of students who, have, who entered a four-year university with 60 hours from a community college compared to students who had earned 60 hours at that institution. So native versus transfer students who came in with the same number or with the same number of hours, 60 hours. If you look at page two of the document, if you have it in front of you, it gives you a very good summary of the information that is contained in the report with regard to the comparison of the average completion rate for a native student versus a transfer student with 60 hours. Uh, and it does the same thing with time to degree and the number of semester credit hours attempted. And this information is actually very, very interesting in that you can see that at a, the statewide level for a university native student, they would graduate at, have an average completion rate after attaining 60 hours of 83%, while for a community college transfer student with 60 hours, their completion rate at the institution it would average out to 67 percent. So a 16 point spread there statewide. So fairly significant variation there and one that we think the institutions and, and the coordinating board are working to try and reduce as we'll talk about some with the community with the uh, core curriculum discussion and, and some others as we're going forward in the next year. But uh, we do recommend the, the approval of the report and the authorizing the board chair to submit this for consideration to the legislature and the governor's office. Any questions, comments? I've, I've got a, a couple of questions. It was also really fascinating that and this is on average, it varied a great deal by institution, but uh, transfer students who've earned 60 credit hours uh, on average take more than two years longer to complete a bachelor's degree than the so-called native students who started at the four-year institution and reached at least 60 credit hours. 7.45 years, if I remember right, versus 5.37. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yet, they only... Uh, on average, again, earn and pay for uh, three additional credit hours, 146 versus 143 from those two comparison groups. What, what's the causation there? Does a, does a part-time or a more significantly part-time student population at the community colleges who are transferring in with, with the 60 hours, so they're taking longer to get that 60 hours than the students who are native and, in effect, may continue to take fewer credit hours um, than their native counterparts at the institutions over the, the time that they're at the university as well. So in other words, again, on average, the bulk of that additional two years is happening prior to their transferring to the four-year college? Or is it also... We didn't, get, we didn't dig that far into the data. So we, we would be able to, to go back and take a harder look at that and be able to kind of differentiate. But we did not do that, I don't believe... Uh, no. I'm getting the head, head shake, so I'm going to go with no. You know, that may be something worth, at least worth discussion yeah, with your no, staff I, as to whether that would be, uh, that might help drive policy and recommendations. Well, and it no ties way. into what we looked at with the mechanical engineering transfer compact in terms of if a student comes in and they don't have all of the sequencing correct for their math and science courses, and then they go into the four-year university, it can extend their time by up to three semesters for them to catch up to their native yeah. peers. And so it, it's, and it it's certainly a valid question when we've looked at in different contexts. Exactly the concern that I hear over and over, in, in addition to the part-time working. Exactly. Which is also important. But it, really interesting results. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? <clears throat> if not, could I have a motion for approval of item 8J? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? None. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign.
Item 8K is consideration of adopting the staff recommendation to the board relating to a report on best practices for increasing student degree completion. McGregor. Thank you very much. Uh, this report was actually created in the intent of identifying organizations with whom we can partner uh, and our focus was predominantly, well, was exclusively on the national level because we were asked to look at statewide or nationwide the states that are working with similar organizations to help improve student completion and student degree completion. And although we looked uh, exclusively at the national level, we also do want to recognize that we have local statewide partners um, like the Texas High School Project that we work with on a regular basis. Um, and so just wanted to, to point that out that although it's not in the report, uh, we do have folks within the state of Texas who work predominantly in Texas only. Um, but the, the purpose of the report was, as it says, to provide ide ideas of partnering organizations that we might be able to work with to improve and increase student degree completion. Um, with regard to the, the report, we looked at primarily a nonprofit organizations that had already partnered with states in other places for that purpose. And so rather than looking at it state by state, we tried to identify the organizations that were most predominantly apparent in that, in that field of com degree completion. Um, as you can see, there are, uh, I believe, 13 entities that were identified as having viable programs um, that would be, or excuse me, 19 um, that would have viable programs that we might be able to work with. Um, some of whom we actually have worked with in the past um, in a variety of other, in a variety of areas. And we did try and identify some of the best practices that they were working on with other states um, with the program. And um, we do recommend the approval and, and submission of this uh, report for uh, the January 1 deadline. And Dr. Van Davis is here to answer any questions if you have them. Members, any questions? Well, as usual, I have at least one. Um, okay. and, uh, whether this McGregor, okay. you may be sure. able to answer, and if not, Van, certainly welcome to come up. Uh, I think the scope of this report asked us to specifically look at nonprofits, which is which is great and important, you know, partnership work. Um, uh, I just recently became aware of uh, some for-profit areas uh, or uh, organizations, rather. Um, one of which I'm trying to get some information on uh, that's doing work in Alabama, Kentucky, and Arizona. Uh, the, I don't remember the name of the parent company right now, but the, the uh, division is called CARS, <coughs> College Admission and, and Retention Systems. And uh, the, the gist of it, as I understand it, is they use a software system where uh, they analyze 21 risk factors for every member of the student body to identify those students who are most at risk and need greatest uh, interaction, advisement, et cetera. Sure. And so they take a, a technological approach to uh, prioritizing that, you know, that student engagement mm -hmm. as well as the amount of engagement. Uh, and that's a, that's a very, you know, 30,000 foot level explanation sure. of what they do, but uh, I'd like to see us uh, also look into and consider uh, what's in the for-profit world that might in, in concert in partnership with these nonprofit organizations of all of which, many of which we recognize and we together for our institutions. And we certainly do that on a regular basis when we're putting together the grants um, or different projects, <laughs> we're looking at not only the, the nonprofit sector where we may be able to get some support or, or guidance or as direct assistance, but also in the for-profit sector as best we can to try and identify who might have either a technological answer or a consulting answer that can help us with the work that we do. And, you know, we can, we can certainly look at this one as well um, as we're going forward, but it just depends on the project and and um, what our resources are as much as anything as to whether or not we move into the, the for-profit sector. Any additional questions or comments? If not, is there a motion to approve item 8K? So moved. Is there a second? Second. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 8L was on the consent calendar. Um, <clears throat> item 8M, 1 through 8 are proposed rules. Uh, 8M1 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 4, rules applying to all public institutions of higher education in Texas, Subchapter B, Sections 4.23, 25, 28, 29, 30, 31, 35 of board rules concerning transfer of credit, core curriculum, and field of study curricula. McGregor. Unless somebody would like to just move approval immediately, I mean, I can kind of start <laughs> digging into it. Um, I, I think uh, there, there is a fair level of interest in the, in the folks in the audience, and I'm sure online as well, with this, this effort. Um, this is a culmination of an effort that has been in the works for uh, between two and two and a half years um, with regard to the re, uh, redesign of the Texas core curriculum. Um, in, in 1997, we had the implementation of the first statutory, statutorily required core curriculum. Uh, that was adopted by institutions in 1999. The purpose of this was to create a fully transferable core curriculum of between no less than 42 hours and no more than 48 hours. Um, the goal of this was to allow for the most <coughs> fully transferable and articulable course taking by students who are moving from one institution to another. So whether they're moving from a community college to a university, a community college to another community college, or university to a university, the, the intent was to provide for the greatest flexibility for the students to apply those entry level, lower division courses into their degree plan ultimately. And what, the, what we ended up with was uh, the adoption of a state level core curriculum in 1999 that included six basic intellectual competencies and eight perspectives to be distributed through six content component areas at each institution, including 37 component level exemplary educational objectives. Now, what that basically means is there were a significant number of pieces to the core curriculum that had to be incorporated and assessed at each institution depending upon what metrics each institution applied to those different areas. And in the component areas, whether it was in humanities or science or those type of things, they had a, a significant amount of latitude in terms of identifying which exemplary educational objectives would apply and, and those type of issues. And there was also, out of the, the 42 to 48 hour core curriculum, the institutions simply applied to the coordinating board for an extension beyond 42 hours. If they wanted more hours in their core curriculum, they could simply apply for that and the coordinating board would review and approve it. Um, so we have in the state presently a fairly wide range of institutions looking at core curriculum for anywhere from 42 to the full 48. Um, with the change in state law with regard to the 120 hour rule to try and limit the number of, of semester credit hours required in baccalaureate degree programs, there is more and more compression happening on institutions with regard to the curriculum that they can have in their degree programs. Therefore, it, is, it becomes more and more important for us to ensure that for any courses that w we at the state level are mandating that they be accepted into the degree program, that we have as consistent and fully transferable courses as possible in order to have those hours that are, that are directed by the state to fit as easily into those 120 hour degree programs as possible. With the, with the current core curriculum, as I said, we also have a number of uh, component area options, the in, excuse me, in, institutionally designated options. 
out of the base 42-hour core curriculum, six of those hours do not have to meet any statewide requirement with regard to the exemplary educational outcomes. It is up to the institution to define what metrics they're going to use to evaluate those six hours. So there can be a wide range of courses that can be offered in that uh, six hours, everything from physical education to speech to an extra liter liter cor literature course, computer literacy, pretty much anything that the institution can define and, and, and assess can be incorporated into those six hours. What we've done over the last two years, we had the Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee, um, which is comprised of members of the faculty and administration at community colleges, technical colleges, universities, and health science centers, come together to look at how we can improve and increase the transferability of the, the core curriculum across all institutions. Um, from that, the UEAC made recommendations, and if I, if I could take just a minute, and if any of the members of the UEAC, and I know um, Agnes DeFranco and Rex Peebles, who are the co-chairs at present, are here, and if any of the other members of the UEAC would, would stand just for a minute so that we can thank you for all the hard work. Thank you all very much. Um, their efforts resulted in some fantastic recommendations to the coordinating board. Um, among those was to work at limiting the number of hours in the core curriculum from 48 to 42 hours and to only allow any exceptions at the board's approval, um, which is basically what the bottom line is, that it would no longer be at the staff level but would be required to be approved by the board. Um, so we would be cutting back from 48 hours as a maximum to 42 hours. Um, secondly, that rather than having the um, six content, or excuse me, the, the six basic intellectual competencies, eight perspectives, and up to 37 exemplary educational objectives, we condense that down, or the, the UEAC condense that down to six core objectives. Um, those six core objectives are communication, critical thinking, uh, now I'm going to blank on it, personal responsibility, social responsibility, teamwork, and quantitative reasoning. Um, those six component er or core objectives then would be infused throughout the core curriculum across all 42 hours. And the assessment is made much more straightforward at the institutional level because you're tracking six items as opposed to the much larger number that was possible under the existing core curriculum. So this, to, from, from my perspective at least, was a positive step forward for the institutions in terms of their flexibility <laughs> and, and the difficulty of assessing throughout the core curriculum. You said, was one of those six uh, uh, core objectives written communication? Communication is one of them overall. It, it does not specify between, it's actually written oral and visual communication. Does that answer the? Yeah. I'll okay. Okay. I'd like to know how it's measured, but for another day. And it, it will be for another day in terms of we haven't gotten to the actual measurement aspects. We're just going to be adopting these right now, and the assessment will come in the, in the next two years of implementation. Um, in terms of, so that's the, the core objectives are the measurable assessment pieces that, that we'll be looking at. The areas to which the 42 hours may be applied are communication, are the component areas. And there are eight component areas and an, an extra six hours again. Six hours for communication, three hours for mathematics, six hours for life and physical sciences, three hours for language, philosophy, and culture, three hours for creative arts, six hours for American history, six hours for government political science, and three hours for social and behavioral sciences. In addition, there are six, area, six hours that 
again, the Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee recommended remain as institutionally designated option, that the institutions could continue to offer the courses that they chose to within that area. What the coordinating board staff, when we were looking at the proposal from the UEAC recommended was that instead of having the institutionally designated option, that we introduce what we could, we were calling the component area option. The component area option would be required to come from one of the foundational component areas. Those list of, of disciplinary areas that I just read to you, communications, mathematics, et cetera. So that those courses that are in the core curriculum would have to incorporate be, be from one of the component areas and would have to meet the core objectives for those component areas. Now, when uh, the UEAC was going through and once we, they had developed the core objectives and they had identified the component areas, so you've got basically the, the measurable areas up across the top and you've got the disciplinary areas on the side, they went through and identified which of the core objectives should be met in each of the component areas. With those component areas, there were recommended that they only they meet either three or at most four. And in our original application and, and uh, in our original proposal that was posted, we had between three and five that the coordinating board staff recommended be met in each of the component areas. Subsequent to that, and, and thanks to the, the comments of many, many people, we, we have reduced that to the point where we are only trying to, to meet either three in mathematics, which is the only one that has less than four, and then four of those core objectives in the rest of the component areas. So basically we have core objectives, six core objectives, eight component areas, and then an additional six hours that institutions can pick and choose which where in the, in the foundational component areas they would like those to be applied. Now, that kind of gives us a, a brief overview of, of what the core curriculum was and what we're looking at, what we have proposed to you all. Before we go any further, do you all have any questions about kind of the overall concept of where we are? Members? And I know it's a lot to, to take in, so, okay. What I would like to do then is to bring up a few of the issues that were raised as comments um, from the comment period and also after that. Um, the number one comment, um, which was, is probably, you know, if anything in higher education is universal, it's probably pretty close to universal that the institutions would prefer to be able to define the six hours um, than to have the state define them. Um, I think most institutions probably would prefer to be able to, to make that argument and to, to hold tight and be able to make those decisions at the institutional level. What we felt at the state was that by statute, this is a fully transferable statewide core curriculum. And because of that, we felt like that all 42 hours should be a part of the core curriculum and should meet the same core objectives and should be from the same foundational component areas as the other 36 hours. And right now, we kind of have a 36-hour fully transferable core curriculum and six hours of whatever each individual institution wants to offer. And while that does provide additional flexibility to the institutions, that's not always the most reasonable in terms of being fully transferable across all institutions. Yes, if one institution requires that the students take three hours of, of kinesiology um, and another one to which they transfer would have required them to take another three hours of mathematics, you can see that there's a fairly large divergence in what's possible. Not necessarily what's good or bad, just in terms of what's possible. 
And so by limiting those six hours strictly to those component areas, we are narrowing down the number of options that the students have in that core curriculum. And one of the things that the commissioner talks about frequently is the fact that the smorgasbord of, of choices that students have in, in higher education is limiting their ability to make good choices and limiting their ability to have positive transfer opportunities and have courses that they take count not only to meet some minimum requirement for the core curriculum, but also to apply toward their degree programs. And having those courses come from the component areas increases the transferability. It increases the opportunity that those courses can apply directly not only to the core curriculum, but also may apply to a future degree program that they choose, which can be a very positive situation. Um, now, as I said, the institutionally designated option and requiring that institutions sit the six hours from the institutionally designated option now meet the same requirements as the remainder of the core curriculum is the number one comment that we received in terms of volume and, and uh, vociferousness. Um, so there are uh, members of, of the, the public or members of the institutions who are more than willing to, to step forward and talk about why this is not a good idea. Uh, I know UT Austin has uh, indicated their willingness to uh, champion this, this argument. If you have any questions that you'd like to, uh, to raise, uh, we can invite them to come up and, and uh, discuss that. Uh, well, I do, because one of the, one of the assertions in the uh, uh, memorandum from um, Bill Powers to Commissioner Paredes is that uh, the change in the, uh, in the open six credit hours, for lack of a better term, from institutionally designated to component area option um, says that uh, that this change was not part of the UEAC recommendations. That's correct. Is that correct? So this was yes, a this was a uh, basically staff. an idea generated it's a staff by generated staff. Ge generated proposal. Our That's staff. correct. Yeah. Now, Chairman Heldenfels, I just I think I just saw Provost Leslie from UT Austin walk in. Um. What, has there been some, uh, McGregor, some analysis of um, looking at the different uh, optional institution designated optional courses uh, to assess how many of those would or would not fit in with the, the component area options? No, sir, because it, it, it's going to be dependent upon how the institution indicates they will meet the core objectives. And so existing courses may have to be adapted to, to meet those core objectives. And so, I mean, I, I don't think we could do a straight analysis and say this one would or wouldn't because with the new the adoption of the new core objectives, each of, the, in, each of the institutions will have to go back and look at their courses in the core curriculum and, and align them to those core objectives. Excuse me. Dr. Leslie. Hi. Dr. Leslie, you had some comments? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. And, uh, let me introduce Could you turn your mic on, please? There. That's better. Uh, yes, let me introduce myself. I'm Steve Leslie. I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost at UT Austin. And to my right is Gretchen Ritter. Gretchen is our Vice Provost for Undergraduate Studies. So, uh, so she may fill in some content areas here uh, for, for completeness as we go through. If I may, and I know you have a busy schedule, uh, let me just say, first of all, thank you very much for hearing us today. Uh, our, our request is a pretty simple one, really. What we'd like to request, uh, just so we have a little more time to flesh out details and make sure this will work, is that we, we ask you to uh, set aside the 4.28 Section I just for the time being while we work through issues of, of making sure that for UT Austin that uh, the hard work we've done over five years now putting into place what is, I think, a nationally leading edge and, and, and very highly regarded 
uh, reframing of our core curriculum, uh, very innovative around uh, uh, all of the kinds of things that we're trying to accomplish with, with the changes that, that you're putting in place here today. Uh, but, but these changes that, that, that we have uh, proposed for the six hours of that were previously institutional area into component area changes really puts us in an awkward situation. And let me explain just briefly that, that the, uh, we're, we're talking about three hours of coursework that each freshman coming in, each first time in college student in their first, first year are, are required to take at UT Austin. We have all 7,000 students, and this coming year we have 10,000 seats now being organized. It's taken us five years to get to this place. And these are courses that are, that are being taught. There are more than 200 of them now that are being taught by our leading uh, senior tenure, tenure track faculty who are in the classroom now with, with uh, our, our first year students. And they're organized around areas of themes of critical thinking, uh, of, of all the elements that, 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 you're, that you're working on here for your core, core objectives. Now, in, in changing to this new component area, it, it creates awkwardness for us in having these faculty who, who volunteer to do this uh, into a situation where the courses that they're offering will not fit into the, the, the uh, foundational core areas. These are interdisciplinary courses, so each of them, the more than 200 of that, are, that are being offered, cross these lines, and so they don't fit into the themes that you propose here. They fit nicely into the institutional uh, area codes that, that we've had previously, but this will create awkwardness. And so in doing that, the concern that we have is it puts in jeopardy uh, the work that we've done to put this, uh, this, this fabulous uh, faculty-driven core curriculum in place. And, and so we're just asking, since we have some time, now until implementation for us to make sure, since, since it was not a recommendation of the Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee, that we just step back and, and work together. And I think there are probably some easy ways that we could make this functional so we'll know and not guess and run the risk of, uh, of, uh, of damaging something that, that we've worked really hard to put in place. Just, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to mention that I, uh, I met with um, with Provost Leslie and Vice Provost Ritter and uh, President Powers yesterday, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a long meeting, and, and we didn't go into these issues in depth. I um, after we met yesterday morning, I came back and I met with McGregor and some of uh, some of his colleagues, and I, I can't say definitively, but I, I didn't hear anything that we couldn't fix. Uh, th there are there are some some. Uh, some inconsistencies between what UT Austin is doing and what we're proposing, but I didn't hear anything that couldn't get get fixed. So it, it's we, we we can do it either uh, we can do it either by following uh, uh, following the recommendation that uh, that Steve has just offered, or we can ad ad adopt the rules and and uh, and uh, f uh, fix them afterwards. Uh, I th I think uh, McGregor offered some. Some and, fairly simple solution. And I think, you know, in a discussion that, that Steve and I had yesterday, we talked about the, the way that the signature courses, as they, they call their freshman experience courses, can fit into single foundational component areas. And, and I think we agreed that there are ways that that could be, be handled. Um, and I think the concern is that they feel like, even though we had, we had some discussions with the UEAC about the fact that we we felt like it was important to have those six hours truly be a part of the core curriculum as opposed to being, as Steve is saying, the institution's option. Um, and that that's this is kind of the, the exact point we're trying to make is the problem we're having is because this is up to the institution and it's not something that's being addressed at the state level. And so the, it's the variation between what the state idea is and what the institutional idea is with regard to these six hours. And I think that they can be resolved with regard to how they're aligned or not. Well, and, and so, I mean, we, this isn't 
unfamiliar territory, I guess, and we've we talked about a lot of these kind of issues with different institutions. Well, I think for us, it, it is it is specific that that the the issue is that with uh, with a new design, the focus is that these courses uh, actually there it is really one course, but there are. 208 iterations of this, and they cross disciplinary lines, many times fitting into three or so of these component areas. Right. And, and the problem that we have is that, and, and I don't, I, we, we did discuss this yesterday, but I don't think we ever did <laughs> agree that we could, we could fix this because it, it won't fit. I think that the, the you just only said it would fit in three areas. Uh, well, I mean, I think that that for example, right? But but in the rule, it says explicitly, each course can only fit into one foundational one component foundational area. One foundational component. That's meaning right. that you only have to meet the the core objectives for one area, not that it can't have elements from others, just that it it you don't have to meet foundational component areas. You don't have to meet the core objectives for multiple foundational component areas. Does that make sense? So just to give an example of uh, the kind of courses that we're talking about, uh, we have a course being taught by Dr. Stan Rue called Hidden Treasures of Plants that looks at plants as medicine, fuel, art, culture. Each of the component areas, of course, comes with a set of core objectives that must be pursued and that the course must be assessed against. So having a multidisciplinary course that has a focus on skills, it would be hard to make it fit within that single content area that the uh, recommendation from the staff suggests. If you look back at the original recommendation out of the committee, the original recommendation out of the committee suggested that the institutional option should contain a minimum of three core objectives selected by the institution. We think that is a much better fit with what we're trying to do in these courses. I teach one of these courses uh, called Debates on Democracy in America. It's part political philosophy, part history, part political science. It would fit in three different component areas. Uh, it is a course where we have a big stress on bringing in writing experts, taking the students to the library, bringing in learning specialists, helping them make that successful transition to college level thinking and work. We've worked very hard on building this program. We believe it does what you're seeking to do with the core curriculum. We hope you will allow us to continue to work with our faculty on this kind of innovative educational work. And, and perhaps just to talk a little bit more about the stress points around this is the structure of how this works. It's faculty driven and the faculty volunteer. There, there are times and the reason they volunteer is because they see the excellence of, of what we're, we're doing here and, and they are enthusiastic about participating because it aligns with the mission of educational excellence. And it is the first year students in the classroom with our senior, you know, uh, prominent faculty. And, and the concern that we have in going down this road, since we, we have these uncertainties, that is, is that we could create a circumstance where these faculty who work to submit these, submit these courses for consideration by a select panel to approve them. Uh, so that the faculty can teach them will be put in jeopardy and the faculty will just choose not to do this and that will that will result in a decline another point that I made with the with the chairman yesterday morning is that all of this is organized now and we have the faculty bought into this they are now on board and it sets the stage for what we're doing now with course transformation initiatives with blended and online learning with all of the things that, that, that require faculty driven processes so that we can attend to four year graduation rates and having our faculty contribute to leading edge uh, work in, in these areas. And, and to, to, to me, it rises to the level of importance that even though we, we buy in absolutely to all the things that, that are being done in this change in the higher education code for the, for the uh, core curriculum. We buy into this. But for this particular area, we think it results in 
uh, questions that rise to the level of importance that we should just pause and, and, and make sure we work through them and fit into this in ways that, uh, that, it, that it works for the university and for, for everyone else. So that, that I would like to kind of stay with my request, um, understanding that uh, this has been something that's been worked on for a long time. But it was not recommended by the Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee. It resulted from, from hard work from, from staff. Uh, there are some elements that I think we should have the Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee work on. We just learned about this uh, just, just recently. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and can you define who we is? Uh, I'm talking about me. Uh, as, as, as the provost, and of course, uh, uh, that's the reason that I'm, that I'm here. I know this has been discussed for a long, long time, uh, but... And, and UT uh, was represented on the UEAC where it was discussed. Right, but, but I think in that issue that, that, that our representative, uh, and I talked to Larry Abram this morning, and our representative never really heard a discussion of this. Perhaps it was discussed before he came on. He's really been on just for the, the, the recent months of, of the work. Uh, but but I, I can't tell you when when we discussed it. I mean, it was at least within the last year. Yes. Okay. Right. He 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 was it, never it, it was something that that yeah. I think it, the, there's folks from the committee here yeah. who can speak to it better that they understood what my interest was. Absolutely, and I, I don't question that at all. All I'm saying is that is that from everything that I've heard as the provost, UT Austin was not aware of this in any way until uh, the, the report came out, and it was not a part of our participation in terms of bringing this to your attention before now. McGregor, uh, possibly, is there a methodology, if you look on page uh, six of the annual item, uh, let's see. Not the blue pages, but the proposed no, not the draft the rules. The drafts, um, Roman numeral three A, uh, reads courses used to complete the component for oh, four four I apologize four component area option if we adjusted that from how it reads to courses used to complete the com component area option must meet the definition and criteria specified in one or more of the fundamental com component areas outlined would that solve your problem I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that I think the key issue would be what that means in terms of the kinds of core objectives that would need to be covered and assessed in the course. I think if it, if it meant that, you know, three of these core objectives would have to be covered, I think that would work. Um, and of course, all of these courses are working very hard on critical thinking in particular uh, as their key focus in this. Uh, but there's going to be variation in which of the other core objectives is being strongly focused on in the courses. So if there is a way to arrange that it could be done so that, you know, we ensured that three core objectives were covered, one of them was critical thinking, but the other two would vary, that would work. If the other two are part of the six core objectives, uh, why would that be a problem? Or would that be an issue? Because I, I don't, from what, what I'm hearing, doesn't seem ex exclusionary from the wording of these rules. And, and I'm just so I'm clear then, so they would still be from one of the component areas. And in the institutional, um, in, the, in the component area option then, if we, you're saying if, they, if you were only required to meet critical thinking and then you got to choose two others for each individual course, that you would be okay with it? I think if it, the um, description I just heard was one or more of the component areas, so each of these courses would cover um, more than one component area, and if they were required to meet three core objectives, one of which was critical thinking, that would match all of our courses easily. Right, but I, I think we've got a disconnect here in terms of the interpretation of, of what it means to, to meet the foundational component area. Because if, you're, if you meet the foundational component area, then under the way this is written, you would have to meet the core objectives from that component area. And, and what you're saying is that you, you don't want to meet the core objectives for those 
th that, that foundational com for those foundational component areas, right? I, I think what we're saying is that we prefer the original proposal from the committee, which well, I, I got that part. Yeah. on three core objectives, uh, and that if we were required to meet one, only one component area, and the requirements for the core objectives connected to that component area, that would not be a good match with these courses. If you were only required to meet one component area and the core objectives related to that one component area. Correct. But what if you could subdivide the courses as we talked about yesterday so that if there was a science course or a humanities course or something that tied to it, Right. That you could subdivide it and apply it to those so that you only had to meet one foundational component. Yes, sir, which is why I gave you the examples of two of the courses, uh, and they're virtually every course would be this case. It doesn't match easily to one component area. It they doesn't are, match easily to they, only one. They are specifically multidisciplinary courses, and therefore they don't match easily to a single component area. Okay. You, well, you know, if... if that's why the, the suggested and simple modification that Chairman Hahn just uh, read out to just say one or more uh, seems like, from a rules standpoint, it would, would solve that problem because I've, maybe I don't get it, but I think we're talking past each other. Well, I mean, the signature courses are courses I, that... I'm perfectly fine with the recommendation made by, made by Vice Chairman Hahn. I don't think they are. In theory, if it's saying one or more, then they would have already met one of the requirements, correct? I mean, that's the way that I'm interpreting it, and that's what is kind of confusing for me. Maybe I'm just naive in, in this process, but I would think that if the wording says one or more, and if that would apply to what you're saying, then you would have already hit that one requirement. But from what it's sounding like right now, you feel like there's multiple components that are coming into this equation where it doesn't fit properly with one to make sure that that one requirement right. is hit. Can there be a possible uh, discussion with the professors to say, can we emphasize this one area but also bring in these other components in with it? Well, I think anything that, that, that modifies the process so, so, that, so that we have to fit into a, a, uh, a circumstance that, 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 that results in a, an environment where they're not going to submit the courses. That, I, I think our circumstance is that that we just have uncertainties, and and if there is a need to make a final decision on this today, then then okay. But but if there isn't, then then I think the best way to approach this is is just to to make sure that we answer the questions and work through these things, and then and then come back and 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 seek board approval. Uh, very soon to make sure that that we that we get it we get it all right and I think we have time to to do that in in the context of um, of when this would be would be implemented. <clears throat> Steve, this isn't going to be implemented till the uh, 2014 2014 fall entering freshman. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it seems to me that um, that we've got plenty of time to work this out. Uh, with the rule change and, and with the, the modified language. I don't, I'm not hearing that your objectives don't meet our objectives. And you're not saying, for instance, that uh, um, you, you, you don't agree that, these, that the six hours of signature courses uh, should fall within the 42-hour limit. We, we are on board with, uh, with all the recommendations. The only issue that we have is, is really uh, this this one. I mean, there are some some issues that 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 we think could affect our flags, which have to do with the core objective areas. But those are things that were very carefully reviewed by the committee and and it came out as committee recommendations. Uh, but no, I mean, we applaud. We we buy into all the aspects of of this. Uh, we we are on board with and and are working hard on the transferability of course issues ourselves. And and so it's just this one this one issue. We just want to make sure we. We get right before uh, before we make final decisions. Well, I'd like to ask yes, a question, quick. How, how much time have we already spent on this issue? Two and a half years. Okay, so someone needs to give me some assurances. If we've already worked two and a half years on this issue, who's to tell me we're going to get it fixed in a reasonable period of time? I don't mean to be ugly, but you know, yeah. two and a half years is a long time. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can promise you from our end, now that we're aware of, of, of this, we'll be expeditious and per personal. Well, I don't mean to uh, interrupt, but yeah. whose responsibility is it for you to become aware of this? I mean, you have to assume some responsibility in knowing what the rules are, and it's, it's kind of like a, a teacher in a classroom. You set out the syllabus, yeah. and you give the, the students the deadline as to when they need to turn their paper in, and if they don't turn their paper in, are you going to say, okay, it's okay if you have some more time, you can go ahead and turn in next semester? No. Okay, well, well no, you're not. But now, are we doing that the same thing here? I don't know. Kind of, I'm sitting on the sidelines kind of mm -hmm. wondering, mm -hmm. are we, are we, are we, are we, are we, are we operating or expecting our students to abide by certain rules and then we have different rules for our, t our faculty and administrators? I'm not saying we do, but I'm saying that the students have to assume some responsibility in knowing what they're, when they were turning their paper and so do you. Yes. So yes. you have also that same responsibility. Yes. Two and a half years is, is a long time. Uh, and again, now, just whether, uh, in, in, in terms of whether you were informed or, or, or told, you know, I don't think we got to sit back and expect each one of our students sitting in classrooms to be sent an e email or personally informed or at what, you know, to what extent do you have to be informed to be informed? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and yes, uh, I, I recognize that this is, we talked about this yesterday, that this has been something that's been going on for a long time. Uh, as I said before, I, I, I do recognize that. that we uh, are at a point now where, where we've, we've only recently learned uh, of, of this change. Uh, it is a change that's going to impact what we've worked on for five years now to put in place what is regarded as one of the most innovative, transformative reform elements of, of core curriculum undergraduate education of any tier one university in the United States. It is and, a model. And let me interrupt just a second, and I applaud you for that. You should be commended for being innovative and creative, and I don't want to take <laughs> any of my remarks is not intended to take away from that at all. I'm, I'm just, uh, McGregor, I'm, I've been around him long enough to know I can read his nonverbals over there, and I, I think that he's, 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 he's an attorney and he's an academician, so he, he's wanting to dot every cro uh, yeah. I and cross every T, and also he wants to treat every institution fairly, yes. and all the ru what rules apply for one institution applies to the other, so we, we just want to make sure that it's being done correctly and it's done, done, being done fairly. Yes, sir. I, I, I okay. absolutely agree with that. Board members, any other uh, comments, <coughs> questions? Uh, anything here, Commissioner, that has changed your mind? I, I, I'm still, uh, I'm still of the belief that we can fix this. We can, if, if it's uh, the board's uh, will to uh, postpone this. Uh, we, we have plenty of time. Um, on the other hand, if we if we make that recommended change that you just indicated, I believe within the parameters of that change in language, we can resolve the, the concerns that uh, UT has expressed. Okay, McGregor, I'd like to make a motion that we we allow them to have the time that they've requested. In my opinion, that's not an unreasonable request. They're simply asking for more time. Uh, and I think they understand the board's concern about trying to get this taken care of, if, if that motion is appropriate. What would, in terms of implementing these needed rule changes, uh, McGregor, how would that, how would delay, I assume that delay would take at least another quarter uh, because of the uh, I, I have a feeling it would take us at least six months before a new set of rules would be approved simply because of the way the posting would be required. That it would take us. I, I assume it's not going to be a, a day-long discussion because we we worked on it yesterday, and and, and uh, so I mean I, I I don't really have a good feel. It, three to six months, I think, is probably the shortest. Um, with six months, most likely. Okay. Just a question, then, McGregor. Are are you? Uh, I, I forgot Robert's rules of order. Is that, that Dennis has made a motion? So I guess we need you need, you need to ask if there's a second. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? <clears throat> uh, t table. Yeah, the, what time frame? I, I have further discussion. Uh, uh, you know, my my preference would be to approve the rules as modified, 
and then pledged to work out the issues with uh, the University of Texas Signature uh, curriculum because it's uh, clearly the classes are of great value, very innovative. I just and I just fail to see how they won't fit within this these rule changes. Um, I don't. I think what you're after is what we're after, and uh, we've, we're not talking about implementing these until the fall uh, of 2014. Uh, so, uh, uh, rather than uh, delay long worked on rule changes, um, I think we can we can go ahead and, and then open them back up to yet another round of public uh, comment uh, and questioning. I think since we have a very narrow understandable concern but a very narrow concern with one institution um, I mean I'll, I'll I pledge to you know be personally involved in making sure that we we iron this out and that it's very open and transparent so that your faculty doesn't lose confidence in the process I'll personally pledge Harold's time <laughs> <laughs> mr. chairman may I withdraw my motion it's been second as long as the second is what withdrawn. I'd like to understand is that so it's section 4.28 section 1 I mean so for, which is now numbered it, four. yeah it's 4a okay. under the revised but specifically we've got one issue out of all this stuff right okay. and so I guess what I'm trying to understand is are we postponing just this one specific can we just postpone a specific piece of it and accept the rest of it so that this one specific can be dealt That's with what I'm asking that no. doesn't seem unreasonable to me because everything else moves forward. Well, that's a good question, I, McGregor. I guess how about how about this for a proposal? It, it, let's approve it as it stands, and if there is a, an impact that UT is able to identify and and we can I, find a way to fix it, then we can bring back the revision rather than having to redo the posting and the rules on this round. Okay. And we, since we have a two-year implementation period. But that, that would be, and staff is okay, you're okay with adding the or more Absolutely. in there? Or. Yes, sir. One or more? Yes, sir. So do we need a motion? Mr. For the Mr. Chairman, okay. I'd Mr. like to. Yeah, I mean, I haven't withdrawn the second, and I may need some okay. guidance on, on procedurally okay. if that is done. And at the moment, I'm not prepared to do that because I don't really understand, and, and I don't, what the or more really does. I mean, I, I, I just, I haven't gotten anywhere to where I think that changes anything. Or what does uh, it I'm, do to the rest of higher education in terms of that change, in terms of what you want for this, for this outcome? I think that there, there, there isn't an answer to that right now. It, and we well, should have an answer. The, 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 what I thought it would do, and it, it, there may be, uh, you know, if, we, if someone can think of some unintended consequences, then that's an important consideration. Uh, the wording that Harold suggested addressed the concern that these signature courses pull from multiple disciplines. And so there was a, a, a lack of clarity of whether one um, of the, uh, let me get the terminology right, uh, whether uh, one of the core component areas was a limitation. And so uh, simply by saying one or more, means that that a course is not limited to a single component area but it can include multiple component areas which as i understand it the signature classes do and so would that be your that solves that order? that aspect of the concern in my opinion the further concern is that uh, uh which of the core objectives are being met and the signature courses address critical thinking plus two others and if i understand the desire of University of Texas signature courses is to be able to choose any of the two other five core objectives to be met by those signature courses. I don't see where our rules exclude that. If it, that's your understanding, I think that would work just fine. Great. Then Correct. I'll withdraw my second. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? Now, are we approving? Well, if you've withdrawn, there's... We're, we're approving the, the agenda item. That's correct. But are we, are we approving it with the change that, that you made? Or more. As, as amended. So as amended. As friendly amended. amended. That's, that's what I'm trying correct. to get to. That's the motion that the chairman would like to hear from someone. I would, I would like that. 
Yes. Can I still ask uh, McGregor, look at me, are, are you yes, okay sir. with this? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I so move. I'll second that motion. I so move. Second. Okay, with the amendment. With the amendment. As stated. <clears throat> Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank I'm sure we'll get it worked out. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we will. We'll we get it worked out. Yeah. It out. But right thank you for your comments. Steve, I'll be happy to give you Harold and Bobby's uh, cell phone number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you want to. Yes. Okay. We're going to break for lunch. Uh, oh, oh, thank God. Probably about five of one. We'll reconvene. kind of fun Fred we're back in order uh, we were on item 8 M 2 it is on the consent agenda or consent calendar eight, item 8 M 3 is consideration of adopting the Commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to chapter 7 degree granting colleges and universities other than Texas public institutions subchapter a section 7 Point three and new section 7.14 board rules concerning distance education approval process for degree granting colleges and universities other than public institutions. McGregor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is as a result of uh, federal regulations <coughs> that came out of the Department of Education. Um, because of that, institutions all over the country have to get individual approval from each state or show that they are in compliance with each state <coughs> that they have students enrolled in online education. So if I'm in Oregon and I have online students, strictly online in Texas, they have to be, Oregon has, the Oregon institution has to be able to provide to the Department of Education evidence that they are in compliance with our regulations. And so this, this rule is intended to answer that and to provide for a clean mechanism for them to have authority and show that they do not need our approval if it is strictly online. And it also defines physical presence, which is another one of the issues that the federal regulation requires there be very clear definition of when their physical presence triggers the need for them to be regulated by the state. And so these item, this item simply lays that information out so that it is clear for the Department of Education and for institutions to understand what regulations they need to follow if they're going to have a physical presence in Texas and what they don't need to do if they're strictly online. Okay. And we do recommend approval. <clears throat> Any questions? Not. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> Items uh, 8, M, 4, and 5 were on the consent calendar. Items 8M6 is consideration of adopting the Commissioner's recommendation to the Board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter E, Sections 21.122, 23, 24, and 29 of Board Rules uh, concerning the Texas Beyond Time Loan Program. Dan. Yes, sir. Go uh, right ahead. I'm right there with you. Just real quickly, this is uh, rules that were posted that didn't, weren't heard at the uh, committee meeting because the comment period had not ended. I'm going to focus on the comments that we did get back and the changes that have been made as a result of the comments for in this particular case, and then I have a couple other rules later as well. Uh, specifically, the rule as posted eliminated the Distinguished Achievement Program moniker and then as staff continued to evaluate that and work with our other constituents realized that that was 
a commonly used practice in, in, in TEA and in other educational scenes, even though it's not specifically spelled out in statute. So we added it back in, whereas previously we had stricken it. And then on the second part is the, I guess another comment, UT Austin highly uh, agreed with the inclusion of hours earned in the FIP forgiveness provision, which has been the practice that's been used, but it's been from a clarity standpoint in the statute, it was, it was not very clear how it applied in every particular instance. So the rule change was to add earned so that it provides better clarity. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Does anyone have any questions? If not, is there a motion to approve item 8M6? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 8M7 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to a proposed amendment to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter G, Section 21.176, of board rules concerning the Teach for Texas Loan Repayment Assistance Program. Dan, you're on again. This adds the provision that uh, loan repayments are, can be co-payable or they can be made directly to either the financial institution <coughs> to repay for the loan program itself. We did not receive any comments on this and it's also consistent with our other loan repayment programs. Any questions? Not. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <laughs> Item 8M8 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter RR. Section 21.2243 of Board Rules concerning the Texas Armed Services Scholarship Program. The previous rule was prescriptive on students that had recently graduated from high school. We found that some uh, nominees for this particular scholarship program were not necessarily directly from high school, so the addition of this language allows for transfer students to also be nominated for the scholarship and we did not receive any comments on this particular revision as well. Any questions? Not, is there a motion to approve item 8M8? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Agenda items 8 in 1 through 9 are proposed rule changes resulting from the 82nd Texas Legislative Session. Uh, item 8 in 1 was on the consent calendar. 8 in 2 is considering consideration of adopting the Commissioner's recommendation to the Board relating to new sections, Chapter 4, rules applying to all public institutions of higher education in Texas, Subchapter E, Sections 4, 101 through 104 of board rules concerning learning outcomes for undergraduate courses. McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, this rule is basically providing some clarification uh, required by the statute, uh, Senate Bill 1726 during the 82nd regular session um, that has to do with the measurable learning outcomes for undergraduate courses. Uh, and the posting of, the, of those on, on, online. Um, basically what we've done is we laid out the, use the same standard that was in for 2504, HP 2504 last session, and uh, added some minor uh, additions to it to allow us to incorporate, not add more rules to it, but still meet the intent of what 1726 uh, allowed. We did make a revision based upon comments that we received so that it was clear that what we wanted the institutions to maintain were the statements of measurable learning outcomes rather than the individual student learning outcomes themselves um, because that was one of the issues that came up during that time. Um, 
I think those are the key points that uh, needed to give you. Okay. Any questions? And we do recommend approval. And this was not voted on during the SPP meeting. If there are no questions, is there a motion to approve item 8N2? Is there a second? Second. So there's a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Items 8 in 3, 4, and 5 were on the consent calendar. Item 8 in 6 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee relating to Chapter 15, Subchapter A, Section 15.10 of Board Rules concerning provisions related to the Texas Research Incentive Program. Susan? Hello. Um, actually, what we did is a clarification. We have not received any comments, so we would like for the adoption. Okay. Members, any questions? Uh, well, it does say that we got uh, a comment or an edit, an edit to the proposed gift definition, removing the phrase for use in the furtherance of the institution, uh, and adding the phrase that provide a direct benefit to the donor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and um, on, uh, from we, Texas we did Tech. make that. Yeah, we made that, and we made that change. Okay. Yeah, so it says that, it, a, that staff concurred. So yeah, that's probably why I forgot. <laughs> yes. So we got one comment. We concurred, and we concurred. We made the change. And okay. Any other questions? If not, is there a motion to approve item eight in six? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 8N7 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 15 National Research Universities, Subchapter C, Sections 15.4243 and 44 of board rules concerning national research universities. McGregor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these changes were as a result of two issues. One was the uh, passage of HB 1000 in the 82nd regular legislative session, uh, which lays out some of the criteria, uh, some of the time frames, and includes the stipulation for the mandatory audit um, and certain other, other provisions that, that uh, we needed to have in place in terms of the distribution of the funds. And the distribution uh, is not included in this section. Uh, that, that was handled in another area uh, with the comptroller. But in terms of what this uh, section applies to, the, the key point in here is we had to go back in and revise how we were evaluating the institutions in terms of meeting national research, being on the path to national research university status because of some data issues that we could not get uh, comparable data on GRE scores across institutions. We thought we had a resource that we could use to compare from one institution to another on GRE scores by discipline, in other words, by graduate degree program. And all we had were actually the applicants to those disciplines, so you wouldn't really have a good feel for what the actual individuals involved would have. So we're having to remove that, and we are actually then requiring that instead of uh, having the option of meeting that standard or doing the comprehensive review of five doctoral programs, which was something that's been one of the options all along, that now becomes a mandatory requirement. And so all the institutions, as they become eligible, will then have to have the review of five of their doctoral programs, and those doctoral programs will then be evaluated for whether or not they are comparable to similar programs at uh, national research universities and that they have the comparable level of research and faculty support and students and that type of thing. I think those are the major issues that needed to be addressed. Um, we did have one comment from, uh, from one institution uh, who was in, actually in support of the changes to the rules. And since that was kind of unusual for us to get a comment in support, we wanted to make sure we, we noted that. And, um, and, 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 and we did appreciate it. Who was the institution? The University of Texas San Antonio. Well, was that really subsequent noted. to the comment period? Was it subsequent to the comment period? Uh, I'm trying to think. You missed the opportunity to put it in writing. Well, 
we, we, we didn't we, we decided that we would not put it into the okay. into the rules as a as a true comment because it was not right to change. Okay. We, we we felt like it was better to you know just uh, take it humbly. Excellent. Um, all right. Are there any questions, members? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm um, I understand that there looks like there was a difficulty. I'm a little disappointed that we're removing the time to degree definition. Uh, what was the what was the problem with replicating the measure uh, as calculated by National Science Foundation? That, that appears. I'm sorry. To be. I'm trying to think through here where we were. Four three B F. F. Uh, 15.42 and, and 15.43 BF specifically. I may have to uh, ask if Kevin can come up and help us with that one. Oh, there it is. Okay. okay yeah. Uh, sure thing. The uh, data from the National Science Foundation on time to degree is the issue. Um, what we had heard uh, prior to revising the uh, rules was uh, that the institutions were concerned about the um, data that the Nas National Science Foundation collected and then used to calculate time to degree. It was based on student survey data and um, it also was based on the fact that a student may enter a master's program, finish that master's program, not enter a doctoral program for a very long time, and that whole period through completion would be used to determine the time to degree. Hmm. That's, that's, that's how the National Science Foundation does it? Correct. The time to degree. What about just doing it the way we do it since we calculate that here? The problem and is that we don't have access to data to comparable in our national research universities or AU institutions. So to, there's no benchmark. So there's no benchmark. Does that answer your question, Mr. Chairman? It does, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Any Kevin. other questions? Uh, okay. Is there a motion to approve item 8 in 7? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 8 in 8 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation of the board relating to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter A, New Section 21.11 of Board Rules Concerning General Provisions. Dan? SB 851 passed during the session, which establishes a priority deadline for state financial aid. Um, we worked with the Financial Aid Advisory Committee to come up with a date that was in the best interest of most students of the state. And as you would expect, picking a single date tended to be a little bit on the difficult side, but we landed on March 15th. Uh, during the comment period, we got a few comments back. Uh, UT Austin was glowing in their support of March 15th. And you can read through their comments if you'd like. Uh, UT Arlington had some more operational questions with regard to how we would treat transfer students with regard to available allocations, and that's more of an operational issue as opposed to a comment on the date itself. So we did not make any change on the date as a result of that comment. UT Pan American suggested a priority, a priority deadline later than March 15th, uh, primarily in and around the completion of tax forms that uh, makes it much easier for students to not be selected for verification because they can use actual tax data as opposed to using what they're going to fill out on their tax form. Because this is a priority deadline and not an eligibility deadline, we felt like the earlier the date, the better for students. Um, so we felt like March 15th was still the best date to pick from a state's perspective, although we are sensitive to the fact that some students may not have their tax forms completed on March 15th. So the, the, you know, we thank, thank them for their comment, but ultimately this is a priority, not an eligibility threshold. So we felt like March 15th was still the best date. This is, uh, applies only to general academic teaching institutions, so it doesn't apply to community colleges, which tends <coughs> to have a much later uh, financial aid packaging period. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, any questions? 
Comments? If not, is there a motion to approve item 8N8? Eight eight? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Item 8N9, consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter J, Sections 21.256, 257, and 260 of board rules concerning the Physician Education Loan P Repayment Program. Dan? We did present this in a, in a partial forum at the strategic planning meeting, and we did include the language suggested by Dr. Tesher on uh, adding and its successor after the Texas Youth Commission, because we know that the Texas Youth Commission is, I guess, being phased out. Is that a fair word? Uh, we didn't receive any other comments on this particular rule, and we did, uh, for what's in the uh, board agenda, that and its successor has been added in all the appropriate places. Questions? Not. Is there a motion to approve item 8 in 9? <laughs> Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Agenda items 8, 0, 1 through 3 are proposed rules adopted as emergency rules at the July 2011 board meeting. Uh, 8, 0, 1 was on the consent calendar. 8, 0, 2 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the committee relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 17, Resource Planning, Subchapter B, Board Approval, Section 17.15 of Board Rules, concerning expedited process for certain projects. Susan? I am, um, yes, we had two comments on this one. This uh, one was that they wanted us to define promptly as the statute has. And on average, right now, the staff is taking approximately three days to verify the cert kind of certify that they do meet all of the criteria. The problem with defining promptly, as was requested, is that we don't, when those projects come to us, they don't always have all the blanks filled in. So when do you start the date? Is it the date that they submit it or the date it's completed or make sure all of the questions are answered, that sort of thing. And so that's why we are saying we will do it as quickly as possible, but we do not want to have a defined date that we have to make that date in there. Find, a defined number of days for promptly, for what defines promptly. And so we did not incorporate that one. The other comment was um, the area about the audit. And um, there was some confusion. I think we have that worked out. Um, they were wondering what happened to those institutions that had not been audited yet. The staff understanding of how this works is that if you have not been audited yet, there are no audit findings. So you can't. <laughs> so we didn't really see that as much of an issue. So I think we have that one kind of clarified. Uh, the audit says, you know, you got the report at the December committee meeting. And um, so we do the audits on a schedule. On, and those are done, we do a once a year update of all of those. So I don't see that that would interfere with whether somebody meets the certification time or not. So scanning through the comment, but essentially mm -hmm. the concern was whether institutions who had yet to receive their audit would not be able to get pre-clearance, pre-certification of Correct. their projects. And so we responded that we would treat it as if as, there were no audit findings. And, correct. Until and they, we until we have proof that there's audit right. findings, there are no findings. Questions? Not. Is there a motion to approve item eight o two? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 803 is consideration of adopting the commissioner's recommendation to the board relating to proposed amendments to Chapter 21 Student Services, Subchapter T, Section 21.610 to 614 of board rules concerning the vaccination against bacterial meningitis for entering students 
at public or private or independent institutions of higher education. McGregor. Thank you very much. This uh, rule was actually passed at our last meeting, and we have since worked with the institutions, uh, with the community colleges and universities on building up a list of exceptions. Um, as the statute shows us that tells told us that we needed to work with the institutions on developing our rules and so after the emergency rules were approved we have come back and, and developed some additional exceptions that we would like to add these are based on I believe 222 comments that were received um, with regard to these rules um, the largest concern was with regard to continuing education um, that continuing education students who were taking anywhere from a, a one-hour cooking class um, up to uh, a 360 contact hour co uh, certification course weren't really in the same category as, as uh, students who were on campus day in, day out, uh, taking academic courses or workforce training, and so should be exempted. Um, there was also concern raised about dual credit students that were only taking courses on their high school campus. Um, at this point in time, the, uh, I believe that the state is going, will be requiring 11 and 12 year olds to be vaccinated for bacterial meningitis. And then so moving forward, this will become less and less of an issue in terms of the dual credit students. But right now, if we don't exempt the dual credit students, then they will have to get the vaccination, if, even if they're just taking the course on their high school campus. So we wanted to exempt dual credit students taking courses on their high school campus. If it's a dual credit course that's taken as a part of an early college high school that is on a community college or university campus, then they would still be required to meet the same standard as student, other students taking courses on those uh, higher education campuses. And the final exemption that we have proposed based upon comments that we received um, is with regard to those uh, incarcerated in a Texas prison. Um, the prison system has uh, different programs for either training or uh, academic work for their uh, inmates. Um, if, the, if we did not provide this exception, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice had uh, notified us that they did not provide vaccination uh, for bacterial meningitis to the inmates. Um, and so the, if the inmates, the inmates would not be able to then take the college courses. And so we simply exempted them for that reason. So those are the primary exceptions. The other exceptions are laid out in statute, 30 years or older, uh, online or distance education. And so the, the three new ones are those. So we would um, exempt continuing education for students that are taking less than 360 contact hours uh, or continuing education, continuing corporate education. And th that's where the vast predominance of the, the comments came in from was with regard to continuing education. And we do recommend approval, and this was not considered at the a SPP meeting. I'm sorry. Tell me what a contact hour is. Meaning uh, specifically, contact hour is you and I sitting face to face for <laughs> one hour. So typically, a uh, a semester credit hour is going to translate between 15 and 16 contact hours. Okay. So a three semester class would be around 48 contact hours. Members, are there any questions? Did I add that right? Close enough. Pardon? Sorry, mumbling. <clears throat> if there's no questions, is there a motion to approve item 803? <coughs> Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 8P is consideration of appeals from institutions of higher education relating to staff decisions on low producing programs. Board members, you have an updated list with the staff recommendations in front of you. It is the goldenrod cover. 
Dennis, that's kind of the yellow looking one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you look at the list with stack, staff recommendations, it's separated into four sections. The first section is the four appeals that have been withdrawn, two from Saul Ross, one from Texas A&M International University, and one from uh, UT El Paso. There is no vote needed on that particular section. We're talking about the second page here. Everybody got it? The second section is staff recommendations to appro uh, for approval for the two-year temporary exemptions and consolidation request uh, for the programs listed. There's uh, 14 requests total. Are there any questions or discussion about those 14 items in section two? If there are no further discussion, is no further discussion, may I have a motion to approve those items, those 14 items? It is 14, right? Uh, listed in section two. So move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Third section is recommendations made upon further evaluation of the appeals process. <clears throat> the first is consolidation of the Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering Physics and Bachelor of Science in Physics programs at UT Brownsville. McGregor. Thank you, sir. Um, UT Brownsville requested um, that they be able to merge their BS in Engineering Physics and the BS in Physics into one BS in Engineering Physics program, which is an ABET accredited program at the institution. They're going to be working with their accreditors to ensure that there are no problems with uh, doing so in terms of the engineering physics, but because even as combined the two programs are low producing, um, they went from being seven graduates in five years in, in physics and 16 graduates in engineering physics, so combined they're at 23, but they are on an upswing and they are increasing their enrollments and we believe that they will be able to make it. So what we would do is we would first have you approve the consolidation of the programs since this is one of the items on for your consideration. And secondly, we would uh, then vote to approve a temporary exemption along with the others that you see listed here. Any questions? If there are none, is there a motion to approve? So move. Approve the consolidation. Approve the consolidation, that is correct, of uh, the engineering physics and physics program at UT Brownsville. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, the next is two year, <coughs> our two year exemptions for the University of Texas. Um, and this is to approve the temporary exemption. Okay, yeah. I thought, thought I was seeing double there for a minute. <laughs> the University of Texas at Brown, Brownsville's uh, Bachelor of Science program in engineering physics, Texas A&M International University's Bachelor of Science program in chemistry, and the University of Texas at El Paso's PhD program in history of borderlands history, and the Master of Arts in in the teaching of English. Is there, I'm sorry, McGregor, go ahead. Um, and these are simply two year exemptions that were decided after the original set was put together. And so we wanted to give you the opportunity to consider them independently. But um, we do recommend the, the temporary exemptions for these four, five programs, sorry, four programs, and would recommend approval. Any questions? If not, is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, now we're going to move to the fourth section, and this is how we will proceed with the staff recommendation for denials found in the fourth section uh, of the supp supplemental material. 
Each institution's president or provost will have a maximum of two minutes per program to make an appeal. Uh, I will invite each president or provost to the table. Staff will have a maximum of one minute to, to present any relevant information if needed. After the president, provost, and staff present, board members may ask questions. Then the board will vote on each individual program. Does anyone have any questions procedurally? Okay. Um, would you move over one slot? Okay. The first presenter will be Angelo State, but I'd also like to have uh, the president or provost from Lamar University, uh, Prairie View, A&M, and Saul Ross go ahead and join us up here in that order. Go right ahead, sir, if you would introduce yourself. Yes, sir. I'm the provost at Angelo State University. My name is Brian May. Brian, your two minutes just started. Okay. Never, we would like to request that you grant a temporary two-year exemption for the BA, BM, and music at Angelo State University. Our, mo our music program is strong. Accredited by the National Association of Schools of Music, we have a 100% pass rate at teacher certification examination, and it works closely with closing the gaps through Hispanic enrollment and unique partnerships with multicultural affairs. Moreover, while we didn't take the necessary steps in the past that we should have, and we apologize for that, we have made great strides recently. We will be in full compliance in terms of total graduate production within two years with a five-year running total of 30 graduates by the academic year 2013. More evidence of a growing program street, we've had a 25% increase in majors from the fall of 2010 until fall 2011, a 57% increase in majors over the past six years. Also, also, our enrollment to our gateway course of music theory has more than doubled in the past three years. Therefore, the projected graduates is not overly optimistic. The recruitment and retention initiatives put in place for the past few years have shown results. It would be untimely to eliminate the program just as these efforts are returning the program to viability. New initiatives would be including, but not, a, not limiting to, eliminating the BA and retaining the BM, which will further reduce small classes in music. The need for the program is apparent. Angelo State it serves a large geographical area in West Texas with a diverse population. There are a lot of West Texas schools and towns that need band directors, choir directors, and music teachers, and ASU provides that. The program is strong ten, and growing. Excuse me, you have 10 seconds. This program is strong and growing. We, separate, we do seek a temporary exemption and we can assure the board if it does not work, we will close it ourselves. McGregor. Thank you, sir. Um, I would just point out that there were multiple small classes. Uh, in other words, classes that were fewer than 10 students that were needed to support the program because they had so few majors. Um, there is also, as they noted in, in their documentation, a lack of financial support for student recruitment, um, which is one of the reasons why they are not, have not to this point been able to uh, address the, the increase in students that they need in order to comply with low producing. And there was also some discussion, and actually I'm just going to stop there. Thank you. Okay. Members, questions? Okay. Um. I'll ask one question. <clears throat> Since now we only have 21 appeals to hear. Uh, <laughs> Brian. You, you were very specific about saying you'd have 30 graduates by 2013, but yes, sir. Uh, if the you know, if I know that if our staff and the commissioner, who personally reviewed each one of these appeals, if they felt the evidence was there, they would have recommended an exemption. What you know, what what's going to change that that you're going to get your output up that much in terms of the number of annual graduates? The retention rates as they approach the sophomore and junior level, which which is where these gra potential graduates reside is very high. It, where, you, where your retention rates are low is at, from the freshman to sophomore levels. And we feel that we're, we're very conservative, in fact, and we think that these, these students will be there. This, this year alone, 
we had 35 freshmen in, that came into this program. It's the highest we've ever had. And, and I, while I admitted earlier, too, we should have started earlier. But we did start, and we put money into it, a lot of scholarship money, working with this program. And we, we feel very confident that that's what it'll be. I have a brief comment. You know, this, this is what I don't like to see happen. And, and uh, this board's heard me say over and over again is that, you know, we, we like to see the institutions take care of their own business and be proactive instead of reactive after we have to step in and say, these are the rules, these are the regulations. And unfortunately, y'all have failed to regulate yourselves, police yourselves, and therefore, we're having to now impose uh, the, 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 the regulations and the rules, which everybody clearly understood before we, we got it to this point. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this point, but it's going to be hard. Um, you know, I know we've got to look at these individually, case by case, but it's kind of hard to uh, approve one and, then, and deny others when everybody's operating on the same set of rules. Uh, it's much better to be, uh, to keep your own backyard clean, do it yourselves, and then to wait to the state or an agency such as ours to have to step in and say, you know, enough's enough and we no longer can afford these low producing programs. And I, I understand you're making some progress up. The problem is, is it may be too little too late. Well, Mr. Golden, I would say that we, uh, us as long as a lot of institutions did close a lot of our programs. There was some that we thought were worth that that did have the potential to get to go up. We closed several programs at Angelo State. The other, the last the other concern I have, and I don't mean to interrupt, is that you said you're you're educating a lot of band directors. Well, how can you be doing educating a lot of band directors when you 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 don't have a lot of band students? You see my point? I mean, I, I don't I don't understand how you can be educating a lot of and meeting the needs of that area in terms of, uh, of music education when you just don't have a lot of students in your program to begin with. So I, I think that's a kind of a hard stretch for me to make and see in my mind. Thank you, Dennis. Did you have a question? I think the commissioner, commissioner was going to respond oh, to Brian's. I wanted to clarify an issue. There, there are some programs that um, were relatively tough calls because uh, there was a pattern of improvement and uh, there, were, there were clear indications that things were, were, uh, were getting better and that there was a possibility that uh, uh, the programs could make their, their targets. Uh, this was one of those programs. We have some other programs that you'll see that were really not doing well at all and, and frankly it's, it's hard to make a case for those programs to be uh, provided an exemption, but for just for the information of the board, this was a program that was marginally below sta standards. Is that fair to say? It is. They they had 19 graduates over the five years, so they were right about four graduates a year instead of five, and they have put a lot of effort and, and resources into trying to improve the program. And they, by their estimates, they believe that they'll be up to 12 graduates a year uh, in in 2013. Um, and so, you know, that may be a little optimistic from my perspective, but uh, the provost, Dr. May, feels like that it's justifiable and that they can, they're willing to be held to that standard if we have to take another look at it. And um, so, so in two years, if this shows back up again and you haven't hit the high water mark, we're not going to have any problem in, in shutting the program down. That's exactly right. And I don't think you'll see us. We'll, we'll shut it down ourselves. Okay. Could I ask too? Is is the is the recommendation of the staff is that this program be shut down? I mean, have y'all scrutinized it? Have y'all y'all come to the board now with the recommendation that it be closed? We looked at the program and based upon what we we found from the standards, we felt like there was uh, there was a case to be made on both sides, and we felt like it was most appropriate for the institution to come to the board and present their case so that you could hear it straight from them rather than only having us helping you make that decision. But as a marginal program, Raymond, what are your thoughts? I, we, have a, we have a commitment from the provost that he's going to get this program uh, up uh, above the threshold and I'm willing to uh, agree we should let him accept the challenge. Okay. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, are we taking this item one at a time? Right here. Angelo State University. This is the BA, BM, and music. Then I will make a motion that we grant them an approval for two year temporary and, and I'll second it. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, oh, sorry. Questions and discussion. Uh, I did hear one thing I wanted to clarify that I don't know whether this would change the annual uh, degree production numbers, but I heard you say something about combining the BA into the BM. Would that would that have changed the numbers we analyzed, or did we look we looked at it as one program? Looked at as one program. But would it does that change the number of sections, or how does that affect the actual teaching of the? Well, it would it would uh, reduce the number of small classes and make us more efficient. Would reduce the number of small classes. Okay, yes, sir. thank you. Thank you. Yes, Janelle. You you talked about choir leaders and band directors. Do these students automatically have a teaching certificate when they graduate? If they, if in the BM, yes, ma'am, they sure do. Further questions? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of granting a two-year exemption uh, to Angelo State University, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. You have your extension. Uh, next on the list is Lamar University, uh, BA and BS in dance. Please introduce yourself. I'm Jimmy Simmons, president of Lamar Jimmy. University. Go ahead. Uh, I will briefly discuss four different issues. One, uh, the dance is very much part of our mission and our core values. It's a dynamic and growing program. It has tremendous academic significance, and there's basically no cost savings by eliminating this program. If, I don't want to read you my mission and our core values, but if you look at creative activity and all the things involved, it's absolutely part of our mission. In the fall of 2009, we established a Department of Theater and Dance with board approval, basically to help us grow and, and, and support this program. We, hired, we had a national search. We hired a chair. In 07, we had seven majors. In FY11, we had 44 majors. We decreased the number of hours from 140 to 120. Uh, I believe if given time, we'll double or triple the number of majors in this program. We've taken care of the small classes. This fall, we only had we had no small classes in this area we, that we had before. If you look at the academic significance, uh, creativity, innovation, or essential characteristics that we're looking for in our businesses today, and I could go on and on with the ability to focus, persistence, tolerance, cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, all of these things are taught in dance. So it's extremely academically significant. The cost, there are three faculty in this program. By eliminating it, we will save nothing because these three faculty will teach our core curricula. They'll teach kinesiology courses, theater, and music courses that are required for their degrees. Uh, all of the required facilities are in place. We have specialized dance studios that we built to accommodate this program. I respectfully request that you uh, uh, uphold our, our appeal and give us permission to go two years. And I, like the person before me, if we haven't done what I said we'll do in two years, I promise you, you will never see me again requesting anything from this board in, in the way of a denial. McGregor. Thank you, sir. One of the challenges that I think this program faces is the fact that over the last three years, they had only nine graduates. In the last five years, they had 18. So there's been a, a significant decline in the number of graduates over the last three years. Now, as Dr. Simmons said, that there is an, a significant increase in the number of uh, students enrolled in the program, but I, I think the, the decline in majors will make it difficult for them to be able to achieve the number of graduates of 25 over the next two years because they would need to get 16 graduates in that time. I think we have 15 or 16 right now in this pipeline that are ready to graduate within a year, so I, I, I'm, I think we can make it. Is there a, uh, this question hadn't occurred as we were approaching this, to me, in this appeal before, but um, do we have the option of uh, uh, shortening the leash and, and granting one-year exemptions? You are the board. I, I, you mean rather three years or you said one year? No, one year. I have a question. Uh, I well, uh, hold on. I don't think, did we get a response? Okay. We can yes. do a one-year response? A one-year exemption. Bill's checking, so I'm going <clears> to. 
Jim, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't understand. You know, I assume that you, all of our institutions have a chief academic officer, and I don't understand why we're not monitoring these low-producing programs and letting us get to the point where our agency has to do the unpleasant task of f confronting you, the institutions and then shutting them down. Shutting them down because that's not something we really enjoy doing or really want to do. And it's really not, I don't think, our job. I think, again, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but the institutions need to be policing themselves and not letting the situation get to the point where this agency has to begin to make y'all come all the way up here and sit and, and, and go through this whole, whole procedure when, when really the, the fault lies with the individual institutions and not monitoring uh, those load-producing programs and then uh, and either doing what's necessary to get them in, in compliance or shutting them down. And we're, we're, we're everything to get this program in compliance. No, you, you haven't, or you wouldn't be here right now. You wouldn't. Dr. Simmons, could you turn your microphone on? You, you, sir, I, I respectfully say no, you haven't, because you would. It's you. You wouldn't be here right now. This well, is this you, board gave us approval in 2009 to start a new department. In 2009, this is two years later. We have more than quadrupled the number of majors in this program. This program will be successful. It's a new program. We have monitored it all along. That's why we started the new, the new, the new, the new department. Did you understand the rules and regulations as to what, gov what constitutes a low-producing program? Well, the rules and regulations are relatively new uh, based on the time that, that we our, hired this okay. new department chair and began it's, this it's, program. It's our fault. I understand. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to follow up with what you just said. You said it's a new program, and it, this this degree was part of a new program. I understand had, that you've expanded significantly and, and poured uh, apparently a lot of money into the program. Um, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, you've redone the program. But you, you, the, the the and there's been a significant increase in um, in those major in that in this particular major. Absolutely, okay. we hired a department chair specifically to increase the numbers in this program in 2009. When we formed a part, this was a department within the co the Department of Music, Theater, and Dance, and we separated it because music was growing so large and really focused on growing this program. And they've done a tremendous job over the last two or three years in growing this program, and it will continue because of the regional interest in this program. Okay, so so this program, because it was separated and it was a new program, and now you're saying you're ramping ramping it up after two years. Well, is yeah. that it has a, it's not a new program though. No, we've had this degree, the but it's never been, been in a separate department with a with a chair that is actually an expert in the field. Okay. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. I'm like Mr. Golden. I'm having a hard time reconciling the fact that you're saying the program is growing, but your graduation rate is going down in, from that department. Uh, well, I, I don't know that. I don't understand that either. I, I would imagine there's going to be dips and in, 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 in falls and in, in rises in it. Well, but, but when you look at the number of majors that are entering the program, it's obvious that there's going to be uh, an increase in the number of graduates over a period of time. Is that reflected in the information that you have, McGregor? Uh, that there, are, it went from 33 in 09 to 44 uh, majors declared in 10, and the, in terms of the graduation numbers, it was four and six, four graduates in 2006, five and seven, six in eight, two in nine, and one in 10. So okay. I mean, I, I, that's so there's obviously significant a lot of kids fall in the off. pipeline right now that will graduate. Well, I think that would, if I'm if I'm understanding these numbers correctly, you're saying that they've had the high enrollment in the first few years, but they're just not producing it on the graduate end of it. They're not coming through with the degrees. Is that correct? I think that there has been an increase in enroll, enrollments on the front end, and we have not necessarily seen it coming out in graduates. Yes. These are freshmen and sophomores that ultimately will graduate. Right. But I think that the hard part to come across, I think, is, as we're sitting here talking about that, is that that enrollment has stayed high, but the end product has been low producing. 
And so how is that correlation between retaining those students to make sure they finish the degrees, the, the issue that we're faced with here? But, but again, it takes them four to six years to graduate. Yes, sir. So you're looking at, if you go back to six and seven and eight, the big enrollments have come in eight, nine, and 10, which would actually be 11, 12, 13, and 14 when these kids are going to graduate. And there's still kids pouring into this program. It's going to be a very, very large, significant part of our university ultimately and if and if i may i, I misspoke in, in the original response the, there was 44 graduates in 10 now in two, in 2011 they're down to 33 so it ha there has been a significant decline in the number of majors and that you all are expecting three grads in fy12 and seven in fy13 which would leave you after a two-year exemption at only 19 graduates which would not be would not meet the standard and that, I'm basing that on what you all had estimated for graduates and our provost is here are those are those figures accurate uh, I think they are Raymond you had yeah, a comment I will say that in 2006, <coughs> excuse me sir if you could come up Excuse me. My name is Steve Dobbin. I'm Provost at Lamar. I will say this. In 2006, when we, uh, it, when this window started, we had seven majors. So uh, although you have blips from year to year, the fact that we were from seven to 33 is a large increase. In addition to hiring the new chair, we reduced the number of hours to degree, as Dr. Simmons said, from 140 to 120 which is going to help students graduate faster, clearly. Uh, we made the switch in chair because of actions of the previous leadership of the director of the program. Uh, and the new chair was brought in from the University of Missouri specifically to change the degree program to get kids graduated faster. And of course, the 25 graduates a year when we hired her was not the standard. This is relatively new. We just knew we needed to grow the program. We brought, it, brought in the chair, built new facilities, uh, lowered the number of hours to degree, uh, and believed that the program was heading in the right direction. But the numbers that McGregor just uh, stated are correct. Uh, there was a dip this year. That happens every year. I mean, some, it's not, it, it doesn't always grow continuously, but it has grown from 7 in 2006 to 33 if you uh, take in consideration the dip. Was, was, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Raymond. My, my question is, is very simply, uh, <clears throat> your, your enrollments are sufficient to sustain the program, but you're not graduating students. So my question is, uh, wh what are you doing to retain students? You mentioned reducing the number of hour hours required for the degree, but apparently that's insufficient. What else are you doing to uh, actually graduate students? That's where the problem is. Yeah, good question. We have just created a brand new division of strategic enrollment management with a new vice president. Uh, the faculty came to us and said, we need to do, now this is not just dance, this is university wide, but uh, this is essentially what you're asking, and said, we believe that the faculty, this is the president of faculty senate, came to us and said, we believe that part of the issue in our graduation retention rate is that our faculty are not actively involved. I want to chair a committee that uh, is a faculty that is geared toward changing uh, the culture in the university in terms of the way the faculty interact with our students. Uh, uh, significant activity, uh, action in my view. Uh, concomitantly, we established, Dr. Simmons established the new Division of Strategic Enrollment Management where we are grouping all the uh, entities that impact uh, students from the time they but from before they get to our campus, that is, that includes recruitment too, through orientation, through graduation. So we have taken, in the last six to nine months, uh, significant action to turn that around. And Commissioner Golden, if I'm a little passionate, it's because I'm a former fine arts dean. So this is, you. the dance again is very, very, very important <laughs> to me. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I oh. think if I understood it, Raymond, you would, you would be supportive of a one-year extension instead of a two? They're not going to make it. They won't no, make it one year. They won't make it one year. They need two. I thought I did. I not hear you say that you had 15 or 16 
uh, students who are on track to graduate well, if, next year? If you'll give us two, we'll do everything within our power to make to make. I know, but done. under your estimates alone, you've got three and seven, which would not get but, us over the hump. But there are so many double majors also in this program. And we will, if we don't make it, we won't make it. But give us the opportunity to go out and recruit and see what we can do and meet this number. We, <coughs> but a we've made the investment. We now. have the in people in place. In two years, it's not going to be recruiting. It's going to be the That's retention right. and the graduation. It's be, yeah, but we could also have we could also have some transfers in. Um, let me let me also just add one comment before we go, because we've got this is number two of twenty one. There is a strong likelihood that we will uh, increase the thresholds on our rules for low producing again, not tomorrow or next month, but uh, we're going to look at that at our December committee meetings as to how we might phase that in. Even with our new rules, Texas is substantially below peer states who require uh, averaging eight or ten graduates per year per program. Yeah, I'm very well aware of that. But again, we have made the investment. We have the people in place. We believe this will continually grow and prosper if we're given the chance. And, and we, if you put new standards in, again, we'll be happy to meet those also. I think this program will. You know, I have to comment at this point. You know, I, everything in, in instinctively inside of me says, let's, you know, let's give them a chance. You know, we, not, none of us want to see here, sit here, and not partnership with you guys and and see you be successful. But it just, we don't like to get to this point. We really like not to have to sit down and and close programs down. And I know I've said that probably ten times already. Um, you know, it just it's we want to see it, but we want to see it work. We want to see the, 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 the kids in your area to have this opportunity. We want to see Lamar University excel. And, and nobody, you know, this, this is not just an easy thing for me to do. And we want. Uh, is, that, is that a motion? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to move that we give them a chance. I'm going to step out on a limb here. And I'm just going to say, and y'all can vote all against me. And I've. But I'm going, to motion, I'm going to make a motion that we give them an opportunity to do what they say they're going to do. Is there a second? That was for a two-year? Two-year. Two years. Okay. <clears throat> Members, no second? Sorry, the motion fails. Um, so I guess we need a motion for denial. <laughs> Is there a motion for denial? I'll so move. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hands. <laughs> All those opposed, same sign. Dr. Simmons, I'm very sorry, but uh, your request has been denied. Thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, I would like to have uh, Thank you. Our Carleton State and Texas A&M uh, University Commerce go ahead and come on up. Uh, next on the list is Prairie View A&M. Um, it's a uh, Bachelor of Science in uh, Physics and a Master of Science in Chemistry. You can, if you'd introduce yourself, please, uh, you can break it up. You can have four minutes for both or... Uh, I guess we need to do them individually, though, don't we? Yes, sir. Okay. So, if you'd introduce yourself, and then your two minutes will start. I'm Joanna Thomas-Smith. I'm the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Prairie View A&M University. Uh, this has been a Willie Nelson experience for me. Uh, you said hold them, you know when to fold them, and when to walk away. Well, we walked away from a good number of our programs because we realized that there was no chance that they were going to really become more viable. But uh, when it came to these science programs, we uh, looked at the situation very closely and we realized that uh, both physics and chemistry uh, have a centrality to our mission. We're land grant. Uh, we have a long history of producing folks in engineering, the sciences, nursing, and those areas. Um, the commissioner can tell you, uh, and, 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 and Dr. Stevenson, that uh, in uh, 2000, we pushed the refresh button at Purview A&M. Uh, we had lots of things to do 
uh, as mandated by the Texas Coordinating Board and the federal government in terms of our, our, our um, Texas Priority Plan. Uh, it's taken a while to get through all those things. Uh, one of the things that we've done as we went into that plan was to um, uh, we eliminated our honors program. It just so happens that students who come in physics, to major in physics, tend to be students who the better students who have come from top high schools who want to see some serious scholarship money and some mentoring by faculty. We are just now at the place that we have in place, and some of the faculty members are here with me, uh, the department head is here with me, of chemistry, who's now also heading up physics because to save some dollars, we realized we could pull physics and chemistry together. But um, the um, uh, transfer of scholarships, uh, scholarships for the, for the honors, freshman honor students, uh, we really believe are gonna make a difference. I can tell you this, that none of our graduates from the past in physics or in chemistry are at home with their parents <laughs> because they didn't get a job. Uh, they're working part time. In seconds, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are asking that, uh, and our faculty members are teaching 2,538 semester credit hours in physics. They have over $2 million in um, research. And by George Q's, we, we do his survey in SSE. Purview ranks high among its peers, Carnegie and statewide, in the number of undergrads who are involved in faculty research. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. McGregor. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, we're focusing on the BS in physics. There were, uh, there was only two graduates in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to give a temporary exemption for a two-year period, they would have to graduate 23 majors um, in the next two years in order to get above the threshold for low producing, the current threshold. Um, and so I, I think that would be virtually impossible based upon the number of majors they have at the present time. Commissioner, anything to add? This is a very low producing program. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Members? make a motion if it's appropriate to deny uh, renewal of the program. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Dr. Smith, would you please go to the Master of Science in Chemistry? The Master of Science in Chemistry um, is a program that uh, is on the cusp. We almost made it. Uh, that's not good enough. But in actuality, it sits, again, it's one of those programs that has built faculty uh, during this period of the Texas Priority Plan, has a strong faculty with good research. In fact, uh, some of the faculty members have uh, grants from NSF, from the coordinating board, uh, from NIH, and other places. And uh, this, this program rests on a newly accredited undergraduate program in chemistry, which is accredited just this past year. And um, again, our faculty members are involved with uh, folks across campus in engineering, in agriculture, and other areas. So there's a, there's a real focus here on multidisciplinary uh, uh, training of our, of our, of our students. Um, this program, we are so uh, so concerned about and so interested in retaining because of what it means to the uh, to our to our mission and to our legacy. That uh, if we were able to, able to receive an exemption, uh, we would even be willing we'd be willing to put something on the table, and that is that if we would not receive any subvention for any of the uh, graduate level courses that were offered uh, during the period of exemption. Would you repeat that last statement? You'd be willing to forego. Subvention, formula dollars, for courses taught in this master's program during the period of exemption. Thank you. I know we're trying to keep everybody to two minutes, so I understand the tendency to want to talk as fast as possible. <laughs> McGregor? Uh, they reported six majors over the last five years, so there were nine majors, nine graduates below what would be necessary for them to achieve. In the, in the coming period, they would need to graduate a minimum of five uh, graduates a year. Let's see, yeah, minimum of five graduates per year in the next two years in order to meet the low producing threshold. Does the enrollment indicate that the students are even there? Not there, there would be much closer in this in this program than they were in physics, um, and I'm sorry, Kevin, you had it. Um, yeah, I don't know what the the current enrollments are. I'll have to pull that back up. This gentleman may have it. Come on up. Dr. Oki is head of chemistry, and as I said, we moved physics into that department. Uh, good afternoon. Um, 
In the last five years, uh, we've had about 12 graduates. No, it was on. And then for fiscal year uh, 2011, for uh, fall 2011, we're expecting to have four graduates. And then for fall 2012, we're expecting an additional five. Uh, you could correct the record because we send that to you. I don't think your microphone is on, sir. Oh, do you actually turn it off? Yeah. Oh, is it on? Yeah, we sent the correction to you in, in the appeal case. Mm -hmm. We didn't have six, we had 13 or 12. And then for fall 2011, we have four already scheduled. And then for fall 2012, we anticipate having five. So by next year, we should be in compliance with it and out of the low producing program. And, and the, the numbers that you're quoting are not consistent with what we have that you've reported through the, 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 the CBM reports. Mm -hmm. there yes, was there, there, was there was an error that was pointed out. It, okay. Yeah. So you, you, you have that information? The correct information. Yes. Um, in 2005, we started revamping the program in the master's program, and we brought in new faculty members. And if you look at the trend um, of increasing graduation from 2006, it's been upward, upward uh, increase. McGregor, do you have those corrected numbers? Uh, I have what they what is what they've reported there: that two and eight, three and nine, and five and ten, um, and then four in eleven. Eleven, yeah, and then five will be in twelve. Yes. Right. So which would which would put them over? And the threshold for the masters is three. Well, no, it wouldn't. Average. Fifteen. It'd be 15. Um, so if they only had four and ten, yeah, right. four and ten, five and eleven, right? Four. So that would be two be, over. No. Yep. You'd have to have fifth. You have to have fifteen. Yes, but we okay. will. Oh, and I'm sorry. Yeah, over five. My bad. Well, I'd, I'd like I think to. Think it'd be right on the borderline. Okay. Actually, there, there hasn't been a progression. What there's been is a variation. You do well one year and you do poorly the next year. Uh, this we, last year, the, the numbers have gone up. In the last two years, it's been going up, and we're going to continue the upward trend. One of the things. Well, oh, going sorry. from five to four is not an upward trend. And all right. Well, um, when I say four, those are the four that are already. Um, um, Computer the thesis and everything for fall of 2011. And that's the minimum. I put the minimum there. May I speak? May I speak? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> um, the other thing is, of course, the, you know, with, with, at the master's level in chemistry and the sciences, you know, you're, you, you've got to have money on the ground for the graduate assistantships. And that was one of the things in the past we didn't have. And we're in, we're in good shape because of the uh, work of the faculty in terms of getting the NSF and other research dollars. Any other comments? Commissioner, any comments? So you're saying this is um, a, a program that really is borderline? Well, it, it, it's, it's um, no, it's, it's a low producing program. It's not uh, as low producing as the physics program. It's it's low producing, and there is not a there, there is not a straight line trend in any direction. Um, I would I would support that the staff sounds like there's an up and down trend, but yes. it's, but it's right it's sort of right there on our. They don't go down. They they, 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 they go masters. down, but not as low as they were before. They they'll, they'll go up to four, and then they'll go down to three. But you haven't gone is it down chemistry? to chemistry. No, no, we've been going consistently up. Yeah, in 2008, we had two. 2009, we had three graduates. 2010, we have four. Okay. This is the MS. Mr. Chairman, I'd like, to, program, yes. I'd like to make a motion, if I may. I'd like to uh, move that we deny the renewal of the program. Is there a second? Uh, I've got a second. Um, all those in favor of denying the MS uh, in chemistry for Prairie View A&M University. All those in favor of the denial, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Aye. We're all three of you. 
<coughs> nays, ayes, you, you wanted to deny? I was deny. Okay. You, okay. All, all those in favor of, of uh, denying the extension, please raise your hands. Those opposed, and I get to vote. Uh, so I guess it's three, so I guess you've got your two-year extension. Well, we need another motion, though, don't we? No. No, we don't? Okay. Your program is extended. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll sign up for chemistry. Two years? <laughs> I'll sign up for chemistry. Two years. Two years. Do we need to be? Do we need to say that specifically? Well, actually, or no. I, you're, that's what we we, uh, we voted down the denial den denial three to two. So I I, I move that we grant a two-year exemption uh, for the MS in Chemistry degree at Prairie View A and M University. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed, same sign. <laughs> Prairie View A&M University's uh, Master of Science in Chemistry is um, awarded a two-year ex exemption. Uh, Sol Ross State University is the next uh, item on the agenda, uh, agenda, a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Don Coors, Provost Sol Ross State University. In 2008, uh, the decision was made to save a declining computer science program. We brought in a new faculty member uh, who raised the number of declared computer science majors from five in 2008 to 29 in 2011. Earlier this year, we sought a Department of Education Hispanic Serving Institution Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math grant to extensively redesign our computer science program in order to make the degree more attractive to increase enrollment, ultimately to uh, increase our graduation rates. We were notified late last month uh, that we had been awarded that grant. It will provide us with roughly $4.5 million over the next five years. This plan, uh, which the grant funds, has four major goals, to increase enrollment in Hispanic and low-income students in the Saul Ross Computer Science Program, to increase the number of students from two-year colleges transferring into the program, to increase pass rates in developmental mathematics for both computer science majors and non-majors, and to increase both the total number of graduates and Hispanic graduates. We're confident that with the extensive enhancements of our computer science program that are made possible by the Department of Education grant in tandem with the increases in student enrollment in our computer science program that we have already realized over the past two to three years, this will ensure we can move our program from low producing to robust and sustainable within the five-year grant period. Thank you. McGregor, 4.3 million. That's all I got. <laughs> Four point three million. They got, that, they, they, they got the NSF grant that it should revitalize the program and give them an opportunity to show what they can do with the program. I think at this point in time, we need to give them the extension and let them uh, invest the the resources. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those. I do have a question. Excuse me. Uh, retention. Now that you're up to tw from five to twenty nine majors. Give you an idea of the retention now. Yes, uh, I believe currently we have six or seven juniors from that original cohort uh, uh, when it increased in 2009, uh, and I think three or four seniors. What we're really uh, betting on, though, is is this redesign is going to be so extensive. It's going to add five tracks. Uh, it will it will be a complete overhaul of the program, and we're very confident that in that period uh, we're we're going to far exceed uh, the minimal numbers. Thank and, you. and Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I would recommend doing it in two-year increments. That if looking that way, we can have another look at the end of two years and, and see where we are going forward. So okay. for a two-year exemption, and, and Mr. Chairman, I think we don't need to necessarily vote against the denial. You all have a new vote coming up. So you can just move to. We have a motion a, already do an to do that. A two-year exemption. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we just need a motion for a two-year extension. Is there a motion? You, you got a motion in a second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. You have your extension. The only other thing that we really need to know is 
How's the antelope population in Jeff Davis and Presidio County doing? <laughs> We're working on that. Actually, we have research grants uh, about the pronghorn decline, right. and, and we are, uh, we're addressing that problem, sir. Very good. Thank you. you Thank we you. really need you to do well with this grant. Yes, yep. we understand it. We appreciate your understanding. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it does. Yeah, get that computer science deal to figure out how to make it rain in West Texas. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I think everybody has the list or can see it up here. So as the seats uh, empty at the table, if you're if you're next on the list, I'm just going to suggest that, that they just go ahead okay. and come on up and fill the available seats. I think we need Tarleton State and uh, Texas A&M University Commerce. <laughs> next, okay, I think uh, Tarleton State is up next. Uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dominic Ottavio, the president at Tarleton State University. Uh, we fully understand the purpose of uh, reducing and reviewing low producing programs and we support what the coordinating board is trying to do. Uh, in fact, we've demonstrated that by eliminating seven of our programs. However, we are here to request an exemption for the physics program specifically. You have some materials in your package from the American Physical Society, the Texan section of the American Physical Society, and our documents as well that I think spell out important reasons why this STEM field is something that uh, we would like to retain really as a system, and you'll hear from, other the, uh, from some of the other system members as well. Let me say a few points that may not be highlighted as much in those uh, letters and our appeal. One, this uh, elimination of this program will really not uh, uh, reduce uh, any costs uh, at Tarleton. And the reason for that is quite simply that we have to have these fa uh, physics faculty members to teach uh, lower division courses, and they have full 12-hour uh, per semester teaching loads, and any of the upper level courses that are taught are through a physics consortium, or they're unpaid uh, above load courses taught by those same physics faculty. They, they contribute a great deal to this because they believe mightily in the program. Second, uh, we will lose uh, substantial amounts of external funding. Uh, these faculty members have uh, had millions of dollars brought into Tarleton and uh, external grants. It's highly probable that we will lose a substantial amount of that funding simply because these are very, very talented faculty members teaching undergraduates and engaging them in research, and, and it, we are very concerned that we will lose that full-time physics faculty because they will not have the opportunity to teach majors. Third, there's a high probability that by reducing this program, we're also going to eliminate another STEM program, our engineering physics program, because the upper level courses that they teach are often the same, our students from both of those uh, programs. You have and, 10 seconds, sir. And then finally, the consortium is a novel idea that brings together multiple universities to try to address this critically important STEM field. McGregor. There were no graduates in 06, 07, 1 in 08, and 1 in 09, 3 in, in FY10. The consortium is a, is a group of, I think, five institutions that have come together to try and, through at a distance, share costs and reduce the, the cost of maintaining a physics program across those institutions. The challenge is that with the sequencing of courses, the institutions are not always taking advantage of when a consortium partner is offering the course and as such there's not really as much of a savings through that consortium as there might otherwise be and uh, as Dr. Dottavio said they do have a significant number of small class sizes and those small class sizes are not ones that are in the consortium so they're not ones that are being that have students who are registered at Tarleton and at Kingsville and at Commerce or other institutions, they're, they're ones where the students are only coming from, from Tarleton. Um, and again, a majority of the courses are not offered through the consortium, so there's not really any savings there. And I guess I would, I would have to ask how we were going to lose faculty uh, research dollars based upon the loss of the, the degree program if they're teaching in both physics and engineering physics. Presumably, they still have a major in which to teach. 
There, so. there is a separate there is a separate faculty in engineering physics as well, and these uh, so there is that separate faculty. There's this faculty in physics. They do combine resources in many ways. Our concern is that without that major and its specialties in in physics, some of those folks just may not stay with us, and that's a very real concern. On the but isn't that true anytime you, you you don't have a degree program and only have, offer the the service courses? Uh, that's uh, it's a very real possibility. There's no doubt about that. On the consortium, I think what you will find as you listen this afternoon is that there's a, a commitment on the part of a number of other universities to try to activate that consortium in a much more real way than it has been in the past. It has served some very useful purposes for us. It, it um, uh, is now being uh, extended. There are people that want to be part of it both for the major and for minors as well. And so the couple of universities that have been part of it, I think is just the beginning of a wonderful opportunity to make these programs much more effective, cost effective than they have in the past. And the one other point I would make about the numbers, there's no doubt the numbers are probably always going to be uh, small relative to other kinds of, of programs that we can look at. Unfortunately, uh, for this review, what happened is the numbers were measured at the very low point in, in the, in the uh, progression over the last couple of years. And what we're looking at, not large numbers, I will be the first to admit that, but we think larger numbers that uh, get us up to uh, maybe 30 people in the major, uh, not graduates per year, but about 30 in the major at the one university. I don't know what it would look like when we start to add those that are currently in the consortium, as well as other members that would like to join the consortium as well. May I ask a follow-up question just so I'm clear? What you just said was that the consortium had not been very effective in its current iteration, but that we should provide another opportunity to expand on that consortium because in the future it would be more so? I believe uh, it has not taken advantage of the power of the consortium as effectively as it could to coordinate courses across all the members. And because of that, uh, I think Tarleton has had possibly more graduates than some mm -hmm. simply because of how the courses have been taught. And what we need to do, and it's, it's difficult across universities, as you no doubt know, what we need to do is figure out a better mechanism for getting the consortium members to get sequencing and patterns working much more effectively. And how long has the consortium been in place? I don't know the answer to that. Eight to ten years, I think. Can, can I ask a question real quickly? D don't you have a person in your organization that's responsible for making sure that consortium is being run effectively and efficiently? Is there, is there an individual that you have that, that can be held accountable to make sure that, that this, this consortium over a period of eight to ten years has been, has been done, is, is doing what it's supposed to do? Uh, obviously it hasn't been done, doing what it's supposed to, to do. And, and, you know, what we're talking about is accountability. Who's accountable for, for that not being done properly? Yes, sir. And uh, what, what I'm telling you today is that we're willing to try to make that accountability work much more effectively. And I think as a, as a, uh, a, a system of universities try to uh, step this up so that it ind indeed meets the requirements that uh, you were talking about and meeting the accountability standards that you have in mind. We are prepared to do so. Sure. There's, there's another chair down here on the end, if you like. My name is, my name is Pat O'Brien, president of West Texas A&M University and a member of the consortium. And you're absolutely correct. The, the prior supervisors of the course, uh, of the consortium, were not doing their job, so we replaced the department head. So we put in a new individual that we believe will be much more effective in working with the other consortium members so as to make this a viable consortium. Was, was this prior to y'all being notified that your program was under review? We did it two years ago. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Rex Gandy, Provost, Texas A&M Kingsville. And I just reiterate that comment. Uh, I've been provost about two years, and right after I got there, I saw this this issue with the consortium, and we've been taking steps recently to improve that. 
and uh, we think it can be an expanded and, and viable consortium the, with a little more time. The consortium is an excellent mechanism to collaborate among institutions so you can meet this criteria that the coordinating board has. But when you don't have any accountability and someone falls asleep at the wheel, then it, it breaks down. Yes, sir. I, I just had a question, McGregor. We, earlier we had a uh, consolidation of an engineering physics uh, with a physics pro program at UT Brownsville. Yes, sir. Is, is there any possibility of looking at that with this major? We suggested that, and uh, I believe that, that Carlton indicated they were not interested in pursuing that at this time. Would you like to consider, reconsider that? Uh, if, if that's what uh, you suggest that we should do, we would certainly be willing to do that. We, uh, we believe that it could be a viable program. Our concern would be that with the other members of the consortium that we've talked about, uh, what we don't have then is that physics major, and it's the power of that consortium uh, across the universities that helps to make physics specifically one that we think uh, could be viable if we get the consortium running properly. But uh, if, if you believe that's what we need to do and then we drop the consortium, then uh, we would be willing to take a look at that. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I must say, though, on the consortium, I, I do want you to understand as well that Currently, it's uh, three specific members offering a uh, Bachelor of Science degree. There are three additional ones that would like to be part of it from a minor standpoint. And then there are some outs, and those are all Texas A&M University system members. And then there are some outside the system that are talking so right about now being the part consortium, of it. Uh, Dr. Tavio is, is Tarleton, West Texas A&M, and A&M Kingsville. Kingsville, yes, sir. And there's three other institutions who just have a, who have a minor in physics that participate. That's right. It's International, uh, Central Texas, and Corpus Christi. And also, all three part of the A&M system. Yes, and then I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Midwestern is talking about being a member and Commerce. Yeah, we've we've expressed an interest in becoming part of the consortium. So, so if if you had an uh, if you did consolidate the programs. Could there not be a physics track? Is that what I understand? In, instead of a separate and distinct physics, it could be a, a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics on a physics track. Would that not work with your system? Uh, may I invite the department chair up to answer that question? Sure. This is uh, Dr. Dan Marble. The issue would be a bit. The issue is ABET accreditation and that everybody has to follow the same thing in all the various campuses if you've got other people in that program. That's, that's the point. Now, you could dramatically change the existing engineering physics program, which is very electrical material science with upper level physics and make it more in line with Colorado School of Mines, which is basically much more physics with some applied elective classes but you would have to deal with the accreditation issues and you have the other issue that they're not on the same campus and they accredit to the campus and departments separately. So that means that the engineering programs, if they exist on that campus, would have to agree to it, their administration would have to change accordingly, and their physics program would have to change accordingly. But you're talking about from the consortium perspective, not from a from consortium, Tarleton's not from a Tarleton of physics and energy. Correct. And correct. Tarleton would have to to give up some things that uh, exist or have come online recently, including stuff that you funded, like the nuclear workforce grants that we have that are now starting to produce people in nuclear track, because that's not going to fit within the ABET. And the medical physics, would, which is turning out graduates now, would not fit within the ABET while you're meeting all the engineering classes required for the FE exam. And, so you, but A&M's teaching the majority of the nuclear physics, why? They're teaching all the nu that, but you're, that's the right. ones you're calling short, though. What? But they still, they register here, though, and they show up in those short sections that you're saying we're teaching. Uh, but those are, those are not part of the mandated curriculum of engineering physics. All right, so they take those because if you're an electrical engineer but you had some nuclear background, that would really help you when you go work at Comanche Peak just up the road. 
the physics people are taking it as a 26-hour part of nuclear power where they're taking all those courses out of A&M. So you couldn't fit 26 hours inside an engineering physics program that's A-bit accredited. There isn't that type of an electives. Right. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner? It seems to me if you look at the graduation numbers for the past four or five years, this program simply isn't viable on its own. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very troubled when, when I, I hear um, proposals for, uh, for uh, sustaining the program, and we hear very little about what the real issue is, and that's retention. I haven't heard a word about what you're going to do to help the students in the program graduate. We didn't have a, a serious problem retention. We had a serious problem in 2001, 2002, 3, and 4 of having very low number of freshmen come in, and which corresponds to very low graduates in 25, 26, 27. Now that we've started doing workforce camps in the summer that have been paid for, and we've done engineering camps and other things, our numbers have gone up. But they're going to take time. I mean, we've got classes now in e &M of 28 kids between the coalition, and our numbers for the coalition have gone up seven. The coalition over the time, the last 20 years, produced 99 graduates. Uh, coalition, is that the same as the That's, consortium? Yes. Okay. So 90, they produced 99 graduates compared to Texas Tech's 60. All right, so in the same you know, time period, in the same time period over the, the 20 years. Now, that's one less, but it turns out that the period that you measured was the absolute worst five periods during that time. We were at 11 after this last year, we're now at 17. We've graduated five locally, we'll graduate four or five, and Kingsville's graduate two or three. West Texas will come back with having people. They had a faculty leave and so forth. So we're going to go back up. I mean, we've been up as high as over 35. We went down, and we're back up. But it's not a retention issue. It's a four-year wait from the time you have something go down, like freshmen, to the time you have freshmen right now. So, I mean, we've got modern with 15, 16 kids in it, but they're not going to graduate for two more years. So you say you've been as high as 35. You're talking about total students. Total five-year graduation rate. Talking about five-year graduation rate for the consortium. Graduates over five years. Right. So the consortium's gone down to 11, which so is what consortium. was measured, then 17. Now it'll be 22. We expect yeah. it to be up around 30. So they do. Each school fluctuates. There's no doubt about that. But it's a lot of ours. It's, we're not getting a lot of community college kids. We're getting them either from kids who transfer or a freshman. The, the 35 years. is for the consortium? Yes. Okay. That's correct. 0113. If you guys do anything, maybe you Our data show that you graduated huh? zero, zero, one, one, three. And this last year we reported five. We graduated five kids this last year. Two to the University of North Texas, two to Texas A&M University's graduate program, and one to the University of Michigan's graduate program at Tarleton. Is University of North Texas part of this consortium? No, they're not. Okay. They're, they have oh, never. Right. They have never been. They have never done. Why, why are you mentioning that? You mean you mean they went to uh, graduate? I mean school. graduate school. I say five graduates. That's where they went to graduate school, all on fellowships. The rules don't allow. We got some powder burn going on here. So. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably could. I think the important point that uh, Dr. Marble was making is that uh, our trend lines have, in fact, changed uh, significantly over the last couple of years, and that's by design. And it's uh, because we have been working much more seriously, both on uh, who comes to Tarleton over the last three years and on success measures, how it is that we retain and graduate them. And that is indeed going to be something that I think we're going to see uh, the numbers uh, that you're talking about low producing. They're going to change significantly, not only for physics, but for other programs at Tarleton. I, I think Dr. Marble's doing a superb job of recruiting in the right kind of students, pro pro providing a quality education. And the consortium is a model, I think, can serve as a model for the state of Texas on how to do something like this with very important fields, STEM fields, and do it in a very cost-effective manner. Now, at the end of the day, I believe that we all want to graduate more STEM uh, majors. We want to do it as, as low a cost as we possibly can, and this can serve as a model for how to do that in what is normally a very high, um, expensive uh, uh, scientific program. Yeah, Dr. Marble. Mm -hmm. You said you're going to graduate five 
We graduate you know, five last year. And what about this year? Uh, we expect to graduate four. And what about the next two years? Expect position? to graduate seven the year after that. I have more medical physics You're talking than about I Tarleton, not the consortium. No, I'm talking about Tarleton. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Something that Tarleton also that, that doesn't show up there. In 2001, we had no science building, no accelerator, no 32-inch telescope, no electron microscope. All of that multi-million dollar of equipment was added between 2001 and 2005. I mean, part of that was my research coming from West Point, but it was also the NM system building the science, building the NM system, putting a microscope in. When you don't have any equipment and you're in a 60-year-old building, it is hard to convince really good students that they want to come. A lot easier with nice toys. And a lot more expensive when you only are bringing in that few number of students. Absolutely. Of course, like I said, we, we do 100% plus of our stuff low, and we don't teach low classes. They won't let me. Mr. Chairman, I understand that they have not met the graduation rate for the last five years, but it sounds like the projections called for going forward five plus a year. They would have to get 20 in the next two years to meet the low producing threshold. Counting the previous time. Yeah, five in the last three years plus two, five, 20 in the next two. I understand that. My, my point Sorry. here is going forward, they're going to be able to project five plus. Uh, I know that it does not meet our threshold. Uh, is there a way we could allow them with the fact that they have a consortium and there, there are some other universities? I don't know how, how to, I mean, this board can overrule the threshold. Am I correct? Okay. But also, um, it, it also puts us in a, a little bit of a difficult position because if, if the consortium is part of what's influencing our decision, then we almost need to take into account uh, the other two consortium members at the same time. And I don't mm -hmm. know what their production numbers have been, but. You know, if we make one exception, it's sort of what's good for the goose would be good for the gander. Um, I would submit that depending on their projections going forward. Uh, well, what's the, what's the pleasure? Is there a motion? I, I will make a motion that we give them a two-year extension. Is there a second? Hearing none, is there a motion to deny? Look, can, I'd like to hear the I'd like to hear the uh, numbers from the other, the graduation numbers and projections for the other two members of the consortium. Um, let's see, West Texas A and M, uh, one in six, one in seven, one in eight, zero in nine, zero in ten, um, and then Kingsville. Zero and six, one and seven, zero and eight, one and nine, one and ten. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move to now. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of so, one more aspect of discussion. Uh, would there be a potential uh, these individual programs? Don't, I mean, there's no question about what the what the five-year history looks like. Uh, would we have the ability to consider a consortium solution? I don't know whether that would be one degree offered at multiple university sites with a common faculty or what have you, but, uh, you know, would there be some opportunity to work with the consortium on a better solution than what we've, what we've seen? Uh, where I, the whole would be greater than the sum of the parts. So I think if I think if these existing programs are closed, the level of motivation to develop a consortium that may prove to be more effective would be pretty strong. Uh, if I may, I, I, I would be very, very concerned about the faculty resources that we would lose. And we have some excellent uh, people right now. I, I think, as you can see by the motivation of Dr. Marble here, and I, I would request that what you do is provide these individuals the opportunity to demonstrate their capability to do this rather than us having to deal with a, a completely new faculty possibly to make this work. I doubt, but if we were able to work with you all in the next six months 
during the, the current academic year on trying to figure out a way to make the consortium a more effective tool? Do you think you would lose faculty in the next six months? Well, uh, no, I don't. Then how about if, if we're willing to, I'll commit to working with any of the institutions that want to work on a, on a consortium, but I don't think that that's a sufficient enough reason to not, uh, to, to grant an exemption. And so we can work with them, and if we need to come back to the board and request a, a, an exemption or a, a new approval for a program outside of that, then perhaps that was what we could do. Okay, there is a motion and a second. All those in favor of the denial for the BS in physics at Tarleton State, please raise your hands. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, Texas A&M University Commerce, Master of Arts in Sociology. Yes, thank you. I'm Dan Jones, the president of Texas A&M University Commerce. By way of back... Excuse me, just yes. one second. Also, I think we already have Kingsville here. If we could have Texas Southern and Texas Tech University go ahead and come up. We'll all right. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Certainly. Uh, by way of background, we initially had four programs identified for elimination under the uh, low producing program criteria. Uh, we are in the, currently, we agreed completely with staff recommendation on one. We are phasing out that program. We've worked with staff to come up with a two-year exemption for another. And so I'm here to request appeal on the remaining two. But we do appreciate the support and co cooperation of staff throughout this process. The uh, master's degree in sociology, while the program fell below the threshold uh, during the uh, most recent five-year reporting period, the number of students currently enrolled in the program is such could, that... Sir, could you hold on just a second? Sure. Go get Dennis. Uh, apologize, we just we lost our quorum while we weren't looking. Okay. <laughs> Are we going to reset the two-minute play clock? Is that <laughs> no, no, your two minutes is running. Sorry. <laughs> we'll start over. Yeah, we'll reset. <laughs> we'll reset the shot clock. That's what I should have done on the last road when you tried to yeah, get kill my deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to employ going forward. <laughs> All right, sir, I apologize. Go ahead. Minus a quorum. Uh, we're I'm on sorry. the Masters in uh, Sociology sorry, sir. Uh, from A&M Commerce. Um, while the numbers did, not, did fall below the uh, threshold during the most recent five-year reporting period, we currently have a sufficient number of majors in the program where we anticipate exceeding the threshold during the next two five-year reporting periods. Specifically, we uh, expect to graduate four students in December, three in May, seven in December 2012. After that, the projections are a little uh, foggier, but uh, by December 2013, we expect to have 18 graduates. These are currently enrolled students making progress toward the degree. To affirm that, I had the uh, faculty put together a list of all of our uh, current enrolled majors in the program, number of hours completed, and progress toward degree. So, uh, we're pretty confident that these numbers are going to hold during the next two five-year reporting periods. Supporting this growth, we have basically reconceived the program uh, away from a program which is considered to be sort of a gateway to further academic study and graduate study 
and more toward one that is slanted toward career preparation for working in social and human service agencies. Uh, this is a significant and we believe growing demand, particularly in our region of rural northeast Texas, as well as in the Metroplex, which uh, we take in as part of our service area. Our faculty and academic leadership are reaching out more aggressively to social uh, and human service agencies. Uh, forming uh, stronger professional bonds uh, and getting their input to make sure that the students that we are graduating are meeting the employment needs of the marketplace. We have also increased our online offerings, uh, which is uh, one way of increasing enrollment. We have added a teaching certificate in sociology. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we are in the process of reconceiving the program with a career preparation model uh, as opposed to uh, an academic preparation model. McGre thank you. McGregor? Uh, thank you. As he said, over the past five years, they've had 10 graduates, and there was some concern about the fact that the students were going to criminal justice, and I think the reorganization of the department has uh, provided an, an, a, a good response to the fact that they were losing graduates to another program. Um, and I, you know, it, it's possible if they hit the numbers that they've indicated that they could meet the standard. Okay. So would this be classified as kind of one of those borderline? Could make it kind of uh, I, I, I'd like to refocus uh, on, uh, on jobs and marketability. We, we don't need more PhDs in sociology. Master, I agree entirely. Yeah. How, how long have these oh, changes, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, been in effect? Uh, a little over a year. Uh, we have new departmental leadership and basically a new orientation in the department. And it's, it's taking hold. It's taking root. I would I would move that uh, we grant a two-year exemption. Is there a second? No second. Um, that being the case, is there a motion to deny? No move. Is there a second? There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor of denying a two-year extension for the. Master of Arts in Sociology, please raise your hand. Was that all three of you? Or two? Yeah. Did three. you want? Yes, three. Okay. All those opposed? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you can go on to the Master of Arts in Spanish. Okay. Uh, our Spanish program has undergone a similar kind of reorientation, although I'm not sure that's the, the most compelling case at this point. But um, we have shifted away from Spanish language and literature and more toward uh, teacher training. Uh, we have put in a uh, pedagogy of Spanish as a second language track and a new professional certificate. And as a result of these changes, which have been in effect for about a year, our enrollment in the program has increased by about 75 percent. That's from 18 students to 28 students. Uh, we believe that demand for Spanish and bilingual teachers in our service area is strong and growing. This reflects, of course, uh, continuing demographic shifts both in our uh, part of the state and throughout the state and nation, for that matter. Our largest feeder county is Dallas County, even though we are located in rural northeast Texas. And uh, the population of Dallas County is more than 50 percent Hispanic. Hispanic enrollment in DISD is approaching 80 percent at the lower grade levels. Well, these are our future students, and these are also our future uh, bilingual teachers, uh, bilingual educators, and Spanish teachers. So we need to harvest them, give them the opportunity for um, advancing their career through this, through this program. We also have uh, implemented a plan to expand our Spanish program through our Collin College, MITSI. Uh, where we have a strong presence that will give us access to an additional large population base with the only graduate program in Spanish serving a county of about 700,000 residents with no other uh, university presence. Uh, we have a strategic goal of becoming a Hispanic serving institution within five years and uh, uh, maintaining and retaining this degree is vital in our attaining that effort. McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so over the past five years, they have eight grads. They had 10 majors in, not in 2009 and then nine in 2010. Um, I, I'm not, I, I guess I lost where the 28 uh, majors is in terms of what, uh, what was said. That, those are, there, yeah, those are ones since 2010. Those are, that's this year's, whatever uh, was re retained plus the additional new recruits. So there was, I, I had that there were 10 majors in 2009 and 9 in 2010, and you cited 28. We have 28 currently. Okay. That's the numbers that I have. Right. Okay. 
um, and that there were multiple small class sizes um, with regard to, to the courses in the major um, that were exclusive to the major. This fall, we have 28 students enrolled in four classes. And, and there, and, and you, yeah, you would not have there were there were only two yet. graduates in FY11. I think there were five in FY11. Correct. Uh, I don't have that in front okay. of me. I'm sorry. Um, but they're well under the threshold, so it's just a question of whether or not they can increase their graduation rate um, and match what they've done in their enrollments. One if additional. I, I'm sorry. If I heard you correctly, you're saying that there is a teaching certificate that's associated now with this degree that yes. was not there prior? Correct. Pedagogy of Spanish is a second language. Plus, that's, that's a track plus the teaching certificate, which provides uh, particularly community college instructors credentials to teach Spanish at the uh, college level. So in the next two years, you're projecting how many graduates? Um, that will be a ballpark figure, but I would think in the next two years, we would have about 10 graduates. And the threshold is three per year. So we expect to probably exceed yeah, but that, that. If you got all 10 of those, you would just make the low producing standard. Correct. And that, I mean, based upon the numbers where it goes from one graduate in six, two, one, two, two, and now we're gonna jump to 10, that, that's a pretty big jump to count on to meet the standard. Yeah, we understand that. We, we, we believe that this program, again, we, this is the only graduate Spanish program in our service area. And to lose it, uh, we just feel it will be a loss to the entire region. So we're willing to put the extra resources and the additional effort it will take to reach that threshold. And if you don't, two years from now, you won't be back? You won't, you won't see me two years from now. <laughs> I don't. I don't relish these anything these any more than Dr. Golden does. You're a senate representative, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, that's why I have a provost. Mister, <laughs> you have a comment? Well, I, I think the the prognosis is promising. I I, I agree with the connection to bilingual education, and uh, it is, it is a it is a marginal program. It's not it, it's not so far be, below the threshold that it's impossible to achieve. It will be difficult, but... Telling us, you're, telling it. you're telling this board that you're going to commit the resources to make this come in compliance? Yes, sir. Chairman, if it's appropriate, I'd make a motion that we, did not, we, we grant them a two-year two year extension. I'll second okay. that. Because a bunch of us are still going to be here two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm in my job, but not at this hope you're back two years too, from huh? now. <laughs> Explaining how well the program's yes, done. Sir. Okay, yep. there's a motion and a second uh, on the Texas A&M uh, Commerce Master of Arts in Spanish. All those in favor, pre please raise your hands. All those opposed, same sign. The master's in Spanish is, is approved a two-year extension, and I think we need to go back to the Master of Arts in Sociology. I was a little unclear. Um, McGregor, Three, does anybody close. have a, a problem with going back to that for just a minute? Uh, back to what? The, the Master of Arts in Sociology. Okay, can you go over those numbers again, please? I'm a little unclear. Uh, sure. I think I can. What numbers were they? Well, those numbers. You know, the, the one I'm talking about. <laughs> but the projections. The, the yes, the, 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 grad, the graduate numbers and the okay. historical data. And um, in sociology, there were a total, there were zero graduates in six, one in seven, three in eight, four in nine, and two in ten for a total of ten over the, the period. And then, let's see. And then what was the projected for 2011? Um, uh, we, that's my number, right? We project uh, four graduating this December and three in May 2012. So if they hit the four. Okay, so we, I heard you say seven earlier, and that was seven over the next two years combined. Well, we have seven. We, have, we expect to have seven graduate during the current academic year. 
And based on the degree, on the progress that currently enrolled students are making, we expect to have graduated a total of 18 by December 2013. And that's assuming no new students into the program, but we, of course, are aggressively recruiting and would expect that number to go up. So you expect 18 graduates with an MA in sociology over the next two academic years? Yes, sir, by December 2013. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, so don't mean to interrupt, but if we're going to open this can of worms and going back to this thing, uh, I think we had a projection of five a year for physics at Tarleton going forward. And we denied that. We denied sociology. Now we're going back to it. Uh, are we not going into the same thing? Well, that's a good point, Munir. We'd, we, would, we would need a, a motion to reconsider it. And <clears throat> I think what the Vice Chairman Hahn, what Chairman Hahn was looking for was a, a clarification of the numbers because I wasn't sure when that vote was taken whether everybody whether we all understood the numbers. I, I didn't. Uh, also, that. also I would say let's you know, and I think everybody knows this, but just so we're on the same page, the the target for the master's degrees is is yeah. three per year rather than five. five per year, and so um, the only reason. Uh, that we brought this one back up was, was simply to determine whether or not there was a misunderstanding about the projected numbers. Okay. If there was not, then, then we don't need to revisit I'm, it. I'm not clear as to the projected numbers. Could, so yeah, I'm, could, I'm still could trying someone to figure it out. Give me that again. Who's projected numbers? I mean, I, projected sociology. graduates? Correct. Yeah, we've got the his McGregor, give us the uh, historical numbers. And then, Doc, I can't read that. <laughs> well, if somebody will quit moving it, I can read it. Uh, <laughs> okay. 01342. So in the past five years, there have been 10 graduates. And then you're projecting? And then, yes, sir. At this point in the program, and this is based on currently enrolled students and where they are in their degree plan at this moment in time, uh, seven will graduate during the current academic year and ten will graduate during the 2012-2013 uh, academic year. And that's based on currently enrolled. That's not a projection based on anticipated recruitment. Those are students currently in the pipeline. Okay, Dennis, did that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Based on the clarification of that information, is there a motion to reconsider? So move. Is there a second? I'll second that because uh, it looks to me that uh, although the two in the last year is a little concerning, of the ten graduates of the last five years, nine of them have been the last three. If you're saying you're going to have 17, 7, and 10? Uh, yes, sir. Be 26. Yes. That would be 17 20... over between this year and next academic year, we have 17 projected to finish the program. And McGregor, would that that would that would be a 26 uh, yeah, over if, a five-year period? If he period. got 17 in the next two years, that would definitely solve the problem. And, and you won't be back asking for another extension if you blow it. No, sir. I, I mean, don't... 17. Let, let's 17 over two years as opposed to 10 in the last five. And if I might add, that's, a, that's the result of reconceiving the program with professional focus. I really have no interest in carrying on the program if it simply had a strictly academic focus, because I agree we don't need more academic sociologists. We need more practitioners. And that's the direction our program is slanted now. And Commissioner, did I understand you correctly? Uh, earlier, did you say you, you, you liked, as in thought well, of that change in program approach? No, I think the uh, sociology um, master's program has the same upside that uh, the Spanish one does. And you're counting on 100 percent graduation? Again, th this is based on the current degree audit of I students know. enrolled That's, but, in the program. And that, you're counting every single student and assuming they're going to graduate in that time frame? That's correct, because and they're all... Right. And, and the graduation rate in the program has been comparable to 100 percent in the past? I, I can't speak to the, what it was in the past. I'm saying with this new focus, we have students making good progress toward the degrees because they see a good job waiting for them at the end of the line. And, and here's my here's my uh, the one the last point I'll make uh, because I'm not, I, you know, I'm the one who 
encourage the, you know, the start of looking at our rules and upgrading these, uh, uh, increasing these thresholds, and I'm going to encourage increasing them again. But if in, in, an, in the desire to be somewhat consistent, even if they graduate, even if their currently enrolled students graduated a 50 percent rate, they would still pass the, the current minimum threshold for master's degrees. And also in the interest of consist consistency as best we can with the numbers that we're throwing around this afternoon, um, it sounded, the impression I got from you, McGregor, and, and really from the commissioner as well, was that you left me with the impression that the MA in sociology was closer to making it than the MA in Spanish, which we just approved exemption. Did I, did I miss I'm not sure which way I'm supposed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let me rephrase. I was left with that impression, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, so that's a, in, in terms of numbers, statement. It, we we're closer in sociology than we are in Spanish. Yeah. I think in terms of growth potential, we're probably closer in Spanish. Okay. Uh, there's, Mr. Chairman, you like for us to approve this? Is that what you're getting at? <clears throat> Well, I, I think given the, it strikes me that given the reasoning on those that we've approved versus those that we have not approved, uh, that the MA in sociology would be more consistent with approval. I, I understand that, and I understand the fact that for undergraduate, we have a five and three for the grad, uh, graduate program. But we're comparing science and math where we really need more students out there. That's a good With program. the social science courses and we're making <clears throat> pardon me, exceptions for these, and we're turning down where five or six institutions will be affected, their students won't be able to take physics class. And I think if we're going to be consistent, we've got to be consistent. Well, they will be able to take physics classes. They just won't be able to major in physics. Yeah, I understand. But, you know, I think we really need to work towards that consortium and make sure that they can do that physics major because that's what, that's what we need. We need more math and more physics. Okay. Could, could I? I understand, I understand where you're going, but we're we're on the. Uh, there is a motion on the table. Uh, let's see, have we voted on the reconsideration? Not yet. All right. There's a motion and second. Is there any other discussion? This is a vote to reconsider. To reconsider. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed, same sign. Okay. Motion carries. Now, is there a motion to approve the Master of Arts in Sociology for a two-year extension? So move. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Those against, same sign. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Texas A&M University, Kingsville. A Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science in Physics. And I believe that Rex Gandy, the provost, has indicated that with the discussion that was had with Tarleton uh, and uh, the discussion about looking into try ways to revitalize a consortium or re resurrect one in the next year, that he would like to withdraw the, ap the appeal for uh, Kingsville. Very good. Okay, uh, we have Texas Southern up next, followed by Texas Tech and the University of Texas at El Paso, if y'all would be kind enough to come on up. Uh, Texas Southern. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is John Rudley. I'm president of Texas Southern University, and with me today I have Dr. Sonia O'Hill, who's our provost. We would like to uh, discuss these uh, programs. I know I have two minutes in the opening. Uh, comment and uh, basically start with physics. Uh, I was wondering if uh, the national intent to uh, produce more students in America who are addressing physics in the STEM fields has been considered in our discussion today. You basically cut the program at Prairie View and you're recommending cutting Texas Southern and you basically have taken a whole approach of looking at a standard that basically reduces the opportunity for African Americans, in my particular case, to have exposure to what we call equal access to higher education. And physics being an area that if you cut us, a student who comes to Texas Southern will not be able to take physics as a major, as the commissioner has pointed out to us. So I thought that would be the first opening comment. I'm sure 
that the state of Texas understands what it's doing when it denies all of these programs, rather than taking the approach of asking us what does it take for us to build these programs. When you try to find a kid in the ghetto and try to expose him or her to these areas of study, nobody's ever talked to them about what physics is all about. But I bet if you expose them to some of the concepts of physics, they would be able to meet the challenge. I have a young man who I mentor from the projects who knew nothing about uh, math per se. And after four years of introducing him to different math concepts, the kid is a math whiz because we exposed him to what math is all about. So at Texas Southern, those are the kind of students we're dealing with, and we're giving them the opportunity to study in some areas that they've never been exposed to. So that's my opening comment with respect to physics. I would hope that the commission looks at the impact of cutting these programs throughout Texas and what impact they may have on the future in terms of strategic planning for the state of Texas and producing scientists that uh, are, are really the lifeblood of the economic uh, development of this state going forward. That's my opening comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, McGregor. Um, thank you, sir. The uh, TSU physics program had one graduate in the last five years um, and has two, had two grads in 2010, and they're looking at one in 2011. Um, for them to get to the low producing standard of 25 baccalaureate graduates in five years, um, would take a very significant act, and, and I think even Dr. Redley would agree that they don't have the, the majors in the pipeline to do so. Um, and, I, and I think it's worth noting again that of the six physics programs, that the undergraduate physics programs that we're looking at today, in total they graduated 14 students in the last five years. Um, that's out of 812 physics graduates in the state of Texas. So the six programs that we're discussing today represent 1.7 percent of the total graduates in physics in the state. Um, so from that perspective, I think that kind of provides a little more context than looking at it from a single institution by institution. The other uh, point I would make is that there uh, is access to physics in Houston at the University of Houston. Um, they have a fairly substantial physics program, physics department there um, that would be available for students and is not too far down the street. Okay, questions? Can, we, res can we respond before we have questions? Can we respond to that? Sure, go ahead. Dr. Yes. Uh, we currently have a total of 14 uh, majors in physics, uh, eight from fall of 09 and six from last fall, and we are projecting uh, that we'll graduate in 2012. We'll graduate four uh, students, and then in 2013, we'll graduate seven. So given that fact and the fact that we've established a new emphasis area or track in health physics, and that seems to be attracting a lot of uh, students because of immediate relevance to um, jo job opportunities. So looking at it from that standpoint, and we're beginning to put emphasis now on pairing our physics with our education area to looking towards producing teachers, that teachers of physics. So all of that put together with the number of uh, work study opportunities we're making available and and scholarships, I think, and we're changing our entire recruitment st strategy, forming pipelines with beginning from even middle school through high school to be able to encourage minorities, especially African Americans, to understand what the discipline is and to take interest. So I think the, f the future looks bright, and I think we should be given an opportunity you know, to continue to beef up what we've, we are starting now as a new administration. I do Thank not you, want Commissioner. to. I did not want to just, I just want to say one point and not make this as an excuse, but he and I are the new kids on the block. We've only been at TSU three years and we've been handed these courses, uh, low uh, development courses or low enrollment courses to deal with. And so we're making adjustments. Uh, we presented a plan of attack for each one of these and Dr. O'He has out, outlined some of that. But I've also been in conversation with HISD. You know, there are 202,000 students in HISD and we talked to the uh, superintendent. We're going to go into an agreement to uh, get scholarships to students in the ninth grade on who would be willing to take up the cause in terms of any of the science uh, areas of studies 
We'll provide, promise them $1,000 a year if they stay in the programs 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and that will be $4,000 from TSU to get them into our programs. So we're just starting to have a conversation about physics, and uh, we're kind of behind the curve in terms of trying to make it uh, happen for us. And the final point is I think we still have a stipulation of settlement with the state of Texas that assumes that the programs that we have, I think, Raymond, I'm not sure, are to continue in some form or another. So again, you know, we're the new kids on the block. We're, we're, we're putting our appeal to you to try to give us more opportunity to grow these programs. Raymond. Well, I, I'm not I'm not persuaded by the argument that um, that an institution uh, should uh, should be allowed to um, continue its programs uh, to serve a particular community when, in fact, the numbers show it hasn't served. The community in that particular field. Um, I mean, these, these numbers are—they're they're simply indefensible, John. I—I I, I don't, uh, and and I appreciate the argument, and I know that uh, I know that you've done you've done some extraordinary work in 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 uh, improving retention and focusing on academic success, but. Wow, I, 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 I just, I, it, it seems to me that uh, the, the institution would be better served to focus on what it does well. Well, I think that's kind of where we're at a loggerhead. Um, <clears throat> if the perception is Texas Southern should be uh, relegated based on somebody's interpretation of what it should be and restricting, restricting our programs, that's a mindset. Texas Southern has always been there with a wide variety of programs to serve the underserved population. And the special purpose that you're talking about are African Americans. And so we've had a long history of trying to deal in terms of uphill battle on trying to get a fair and level playing field. So if you say a kid from the CUNY Homes, who's a math kid that we work with, can go to the University of Houston, I beg to differ with you on that point. Regent Gold and I were both at the University of Houston, and we know the standards have been raised there for over a number of years. So my question is, what do we do as a backup strategy to provide opportunity to kids who don't have the same opportunities as others? And physics is a perfect example. It's not only physics, though. All the other three programs that we're going to be talking about today, English, chemistry, uh, math, are all di in dire need, dire straits. That Texas Southern ought to provide an opportunity for uh, students to have those uh, courses offered to them. Well, John, I, I would argue that if you're graduating one student per year in a given field, you really haven't offered much of an opportunity. The uh, in, in terms of if you if you consider that opportunity has two components: access and success. And, and graduating one student one year and zero the next and one next suggests to me that uh, that, that the institution uh, simply hasn't served its student body well in that area. And as I said, it's not it's it's not a question of depriving students access to programs. It's a question of measuring whether the institution has been successful in mounting the programs it has. Well, Mr. And I, Commissioner, I think the evidence yeah, is ample. It hasn't yeah. been. Mr. Commissioner, you're going to have the history then of recommending, as I said before, of uh, actually closing physics programs in the state of Texas for a number of institutions. And I think rather than close these programs, you ought to back up and look at a study and see what does it take to grow these programs. Second point is whoever said that standard is reasonable for these conditions now. You say we need to have 25 or 10 or 15. Who's ever looked, who's looked at that to said that's reasonable based on what's happening in the country? I mean, we're all, we all know that the foreign uh, students are coming over here and they're taking all these jobs based on the fact that we're not producing, whether it's one or 25, we're not doing what we're supposed to do as an as a edu higher education entity, industry. So why don't we back up and look at that rather than denying all these programs? That's my point today. We have looked at that, it just won. We mm -hmm. have looked at that. And we've also compared Texas' uh, threshold for low producing definitions with other states. And even, as I mentioned earlier, our new thresholds are still substantially below states like North Carolina and Georgia and other peer states. So it, to the extent that we have compared to the policies in other states and other systems of higher education, we have looked at that. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reasoning behind raising our standards because 
uh, the, the the relative cost of producing such low producing uh, graduates from such low producing programs is is uh, is just not sustainable. Now we have we have looked at initially 750 programs. Institutions voluntarily closed 100. 100 more were lifted above the new thresholds, and of the 550 remaining, uh, we initially granted about 40 percent of those programs exemptions. Of the programs that have appealed, over 40 percent of those, even before we got to, the, to hearing these appeals, were, were granted exemptions. So, you know, where we see a pathway to success, we're, we're leaning in to the wind and to the direction of uh, trying to provide a benefit of the doubt where there's some belief that, that these programs can come up to a reasonable threshold of production in terms of the annual number of graduates. Let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Rudley you a question. Um, uh, and I don't know that we, can, we, we can't speak for the other institutions, but we have talked a lot today about the physics programs. And there's no question that the, the correspondence that our board members and, and staff received uh, was, was overwhelmingly about physics programs. There's no denying what Texas needs to do in terms of STEM graduates. Would, would you be willing, uh, on behalf of Texas Southern, to participate uh, in the discussions about forming an effective consortium uh, for developing better, uh, more productive physics programs across institutions which have had these historically low uh, producing physics degrees? I would jump at the opportunity to do that, especially since we're just starting to look at uh, our failures at Texas Southern, which explains only one graduates. We brought in, and you've heard from other campuses, we, we try to retool, we brought in people, I've been there three years, so we got a new chair, a new, new dean, so we're just starting to ramp up, and I would love the opportunity to work and uh, to deal with a consortium uh, that would look at this uh, issue. I would love that opportunity. Uh, you know, I understand that, that, and of course we haven't had a motion or a vote yet, so I don't know the outcome, but um, it, you know, uh, I think what we need to do is, is literally start with a fresh sheet of paper and see if multi-institution cooperation can create something that is more effective where the whole is greater than the sum of these parts that haven't produced the results over the last five years. And, and going forward, even though I hear some improvement, I don't hear the, the, ra the, the ramping up of improvement that would be fast enough to meet our thresholds especially in an environment where, as I said earlier, we may be raising those thresholds again. But I think if, if we can be creative, McGregor, and I know you seem to, to take this as a personal mission, uh, you know, I would, I would like, and I'm including Prairie View in this as well, I would like to see all these institutions who have had these historically very low producing physics programs, see if we can come up with a creative new way to make this, uh, this education and this degree uh, accessible to, to those who might who wouldn't otherwise have it and who frankly haven't chosen to uh, to at least persist to the point of earning these degrees in the past. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I may add, I'd like to see that happen as quick as possible before they lose out. All right. Chairman. Any other? Go ahead. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the history of TSU, particularly over the last several years, uh, in my assessment, somewhere around three to four years ago, they were on life support. I think a lot of us know that the, uh, the governor was concerned about some of the problems that were in, in the institution. I think there were a number of the members of the Board of Regents who had, for whatever reason, resigned or chose no longer to serve. Uh, I think a lot of people in higher education in Texas had given it all up for dead. And, you know, I, when we look at our initiatives with regard to closing the gaps, we know that one of the areas that we're falling behind is in our African-American population, particularly with regard to our, the male African-Americans. And I think we owe it to those historically African-American institutions to try to give them every opportunity to help us meet those 
strategic goals in regard of bringing um, that group to the level that we've set set forth, uh, as well as our Hispanic population that has fallen behind. Um, I've watched very closely what's occurring over at TSU, and um, John Rudley had a, he just had one hell of a job to do over there. And um, and I, 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 it doesn't surprise me, John, that you hadn't gotten around to taking care of this one, because you've had a, you know, you've you've had one barn on fire, and you've had to go put that one out, and then you have to run over and put this one out, and you've run all over that campus just trying to do damage control now for the last three years. So, this is one situation where I, it doesn't surprise me that this one may have kind of fallen through the crack, and maybe you haven't quite gotten it, this solved them problem solved. But I, for one, irregardless of what the numbers say, think in this one circumstance that we, we need to give them a little more time or work with them through the consortium or whatever it takes to get this institution every opportunity it, it, it can, along with Prairie View A&M and what, whatever else, or whatever, whatever these other historically uh, African-American institutions uh, in our state because they're vitally important in helping us meet our goals and closing the gaps. And so I hope you all know that. You know, we, we, we have to have you. We, we need you. We've got to get you guys plugged in, and we've got to get our numbers in with regard to the African-American population up to where they belong, as well as our, our, our institutions that are, are predominantly um, Hispanic. And when I'm being University of Houston downtown, something around 60 to 70 percent of the total enrollment is Hispanic. Now, I applaud you in the, sense, in the fact that y'all have in, in, in raised your interest requirements. That's a major step forward. And I think that's going to pay off for you down the road. So having said that, um, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion, if it's appropriate, that we grant them a two-year extension. Is there a second? No section. Sec Second, the motion fails. Is there a motion to deny? Could I make a motion that in some way or another that we could come up with some solution similar to what Fred has articulated or the commissioner has asked that this consortium be put together? That's going to happen. Commissioner? Yeah, the coordinating board has been working more, more closely with TSU recently to establish academic support programs like AVID and, and, and some others. And uh, I, I think you know, John, that uh, it, uh, completely unrelated to, uh, to the, the issue that's before the board now, my office has been in contact with yours uh, to set up an appointment for me to go visit the institution precisely to talk about not, not, not about physics particularly, but that certainly could be part of the discussion, but how the coordinating board and TSU could work together to uh, build on this new foundation of ac academic excellence that you're trying to create at that institution. Um, I, I don't know if we've set that meeting up, uh, but uh, we, we, I, would be, I would be happy to include physics as a part of this conversation about how we can work together to uh, to graduate more students from TSU. Thank you. Okay, so does that answer your question? Uh, or, or that does answer my question, and if the chair will allow, I mean, Chair, uh, Chairman Heldenfels will allow, and if the commissioner will allow, I would like to be in the loop. Sure, I would like to Absolutely. be kept informed as to what progress has been made in that area if, if the chair, board chair feels like that's not inappropriate no. because of my special interest. And seeing uh, this institution, and seeing this institution uh, become what I, you know, the level of integrity uh, that that's now at this institution is is unsurpassed in anything I've I've seen in in the 30 years I've been involved in higher education, and and you know it, it just gotten one hell of a mess down there, and uh, for any for anybody to have taken on this awesome task of trying to raise. The, the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why you did it, John, 
but I would like to offer whatever insights that I could provide that, that would pr result in a positive outcome. So that's all I have to say. Seems Dr. Golden kind of likes you and holds you in high regard. Uh, absolutely. Right? Thank you, Dr. Okay. Golden. No Thank question. Um, I've, se I've seen this man under the gun. I know what he's made of. All right, we did have a motion to approve that died for lack of second. Is there a motion to deny the extension of the Bachelor of Science in Physics at Texas Southern University? I'll make that motion with the understanding that we will be doing what we all just talked about. Yep. Is there a second? second? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. All those opposed, same sign. I'm sorry, doctor. Let's go to the next one, Master of Arts in English. I'll let Dr. O'Hea lead a discussion on that. In our master's uh, degree in English has experienced uh, enrollment growth. Uh, that's talking about a pipeline uh, between fall of 2010 and this fall we've increased uh, majors in, for the master's program from 14 to 20. Um, one of the things we've done is that we've reduced the hours uh, based on the, the program revision uh, from 36 to 30 credit hours required for graduation. I think that has also going to help us uh, attract more students. Uh, we've instituted better advising. Um, we're increasing uh, graduate fellowships that we offer and the research attached to it. And we're very close uh, for that program, so we anticipate that uh, we'll be able to meet the minimum of three graduates required per year over the next uh, five years. So based on that, we're asking for an, a two-year exemption to be able to demonstrate that fact. We have students enrolled in the pipeline. McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There were uh, a total of eight graduates in the past five years. Uh, a significant number of the courses that are taught were low producing. Of the, there were actually only five uh, or four, excuse me, uh, courses within the degree program taught in the last two years, which would make it fairly difficult for it for a student to actually graduate from the program. At least according to the information we received from Texas Southern, there were uh, four actual courses and then a directed reading and research and a thesis course um, in the last two in the last two years so I think that makes it pretty hard for anybody to graduate in a, in a timely manner um, and based upon the number of, of graduates it's going to be very difficult for them to get up to the level where they can successfully meet the standards within the next two years uh, we just hired a, a new Dean that has taken this, she's also uh, an English uh, uh, major, uh, she has a PhD in English uh, from Brown University. She's aggressively, you know, retooling to make sure that we are, the faculty are on track and the program is on track and offering the classes that will require the current students enrolled to graduate on time. So as of this, as I, as I, now as I speak, this is, is different, I mean, over the last year from the numbers you you have. In general, we, we have 11 deans at Texas Southern and we replaced uh, nine. Okay. So we're still in the process of getting the new leadership in place to address the shortcomings that you see here. Uh, you mentioned the pipeline. How, how, many, how many students are on track to graduate over the next two years? Uh, we currently have 20 and the department chair has assured me that you know, moving forward that we'll have, we'll meet at least the minimum threshold of three per year for the next five years. And we're doing, we're not just depending on the minimum, we should be graduating more than three. And we'll do whatever we can with the new dean in place now to make sure, and I'll pay particular attention to these areas that we are appealing to make sure that these uh, numbers, you know, stay above the minimum. McGregor, in two years, that have had eight graduates in the last five years. Two years from now, looking back, how many would they have to to graduate in the next two years? Ten. Each year? Uh, five each year. Five each year. I mean, because in in so it's in nine, eight, nine, and ten. 
they've got a total of five graduates. The problem is they've got zero in 2010. So they had four and eight, one and nine, and zero and 10. So looking back three years and forward two, they'd have to pick up five graduates a year in the next two years. Do you think that's attainable? Yes, sir. Because, like I said, with the new dean in place, uh, we are paying very close attention and monitoring the, not just the recruitment, but also the retention and graduation of the majors in this, uh, in this program. It's just about paying attention at this point, and we, we're going to pay the attention necessary to get to the five. Is there a second? I'll second that. What was the motion, please? To approve two-year extension. Okay. Is there any other discussion? If not, all those in favor of a two-year extension for a Master of Arts in English at Texas Southern University, please raise your hands. Those opposed, same sign. You're batting 500. Thank you. That's better than 333. That's right. <laughs> all right, Master of Science in Chemistry. Okay. Uh, we also uh, begin to experience growth in, that, in, in this program, and I'll explain the spe uh, special circumstances that led to the ro enroll en enrollment before the last two years. This program, uh, the master's program, was paired essentially with a master's in environmental uh, technology program and housed in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, most of the students that were interested from the uh, chemistry undergraduate uh, majors that were interested in graduate program tended to see more uh, of the environmental toxicology program and less of chemistry. So most of them graduated, tended to uh, uh, lean towards the environmental toxicology program, which is robust. What we did in the last year was to move that pro uh, the environmental toxicology program out of chemistry and make it, you know, its own department. And um, with that, there has been a change uh, from fall of 09. We've increased uh, majors from um, six in fall of 09 to its current enrollment of 14 in, for the master's program in chemistry. Um, that, and we are offering more graduate fellowships, so we are not resting. We'll continue to press on with recruitment and with the new dean we have in place too, who is also paying very particular attention to this program, we hope to be able to grow the uh, master's degree program in chemistry to even be better than the environmental toxicology one we have. Long and short, we had a person before we got there who was steering those graduates away from chemistry to environmental toxicology, and we're going to correct that. So the, you can see the numbers will grow up uh, pretty quickly. McGregor? There were five graduates over the last five years and only two in the last three. So in the next two years, they would have to graduate 13 students in order to meet the minimum threshold. Um, in addition, they have small classes in pretty much every section that is taught in this program, which, you know, is a challenge in and of itself. So those would be the key points I'd make. Commissioner? The one bright spot is that the number of majors has been steadily increasing from six in 2009 to 10 in 2010 and 14 in 2011. So there is. So they've got stu they've got students in the pipeline, yeah. but you have to graduate them. Uh, you'd, you'd have to graduate nearly 100 percent of those students yeah. in the pipeline <clears throat> over the next two years. Well, and I, I just wanted to add that, you know, the robust nature of the environmental toxicology program, which has over 40 students enrolled for both the master's and PhD in environmental toxicology. So the point I'm making that they've been, there has been that lean towards environmental toxicology at the detriment of chemistry. But with the separation now, we will make sure that we, we pay very particular attention to chemistry. They're, they're going to be directed more towards the chemistry degree program. Yes. Okay. And that's in the process of being done now. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Do you get junior college transfers in a good group of junior college transfers, or most of your students are start as four-year? We only have 600 transfer students. We should have about 1,000 to 1,500. So we're yeah. working on that. But that's why we have that relationship with HCC. I don't know if the, the commissioner told you, we actually are, partnering with HCC and they're teaching some of our classes for development students. The faculty are coming over to TSU and teaching 150 students on our campus. 
So we're, we're working out an agreement where we can start that pipeline with HCC. You don't see any, any recruitment promises through that relationship that might give you juniors and seniors of chemistry coming in? That would be, uh, yes, we do all across the board, though. That relationship is designed to not only get at, uh, you know, chemistry, but also at the other areas we were talking about in math in particular. Hard to predict, though, what's coming. Yes, it is. But if we go out there and we have uh, the presidents identifying people who are those two-year late starters, we can get uh, our focus on them right away, offer them a transfer scholarship and have them at TSU where they should be. We know 600 is not even average. We should be about 1,500 transfer students. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, is there? I have one yes. question. Is, is this MS in chemistry, is it a, a one-year or two-year program, or how many credit hours? It's essentially a, a two-year program. Is it two-year? Okay. That's what I thought. I have another question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sonny, how many of these students are they're graduating or you anticipate graduating in chemistry will go into education? Is there a large percentage that are going there? We, we are, desperately we are not waiting to see that happen. We are actively getting the uh, College of Education involved in an emphasis on science education to produce teachers for the, uh, so for the high need, schools. We, so. And I may be off base here, but we need strong African-American role models in the classroom teaching kids these, these STEM courses. And so, I, I mean, are y'all making a conscious effort to, to, to get the education department and, and some of these students directed into to, to teacher education? Yes, and that's why I recent, we recently replaced our dean of education. We're about to hire a new one that will you know, take this issue very seriously going forward. Are but we, we are forming the, we're putting the infrastructure in place for that. Could you give me some vague estimate, may, even though it may not be accurate, about what the percentage of these students that graduate from your chemistry department will go into teacher education? I would say at least half. Most of them will, and we talked to uh, HISD. There is 602 uh, teacher shortage. 602 is what they're short. In science. chemistry? In science. Science. In science. So you can see everything that we produce that they're going to need, and that's, that's why we're kind of working more closely with them because they've got a crying need, 602 shortage as of right now. And they'll be going and they'll be leaving with credentialed teachers, certified teachers. Yes, they will. Leaving your institution. Is that right? Right. Okay. Raymond, would you have any problem with the two-year extension of this program, McGregor? No, is there, no. They, you fully understand. You've got a high bar. You've got to jump over. But yeah. uh, you've, you've you've got you've got the you've got the number of, of people in the program that if you convert into graduates, you can get over the threshold. I think the same standard standard applies. You know, if, if they don't make it in the two-year exemption period, then you guys take care of it and we don't? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to entertain a motion that we grant a two-year extension. You don't want to entertain it. You want to I'll, make I'll it? I'll entertain it if Thank you'll you. make you it. Entertain it. You entertain it. I'll make it. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve a two-year extension for a Master of Science in Chemistry for Texas Southern? Did you just ask for another motion or are you calling the motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> it's kind of late in the afternoon. All those opposed. All right, your batting average is going up. Master of Science in Thank Mathematics. Uh, for, for math, we once again saw ourselves in a, in a situation we shouldn't be in. And we've, one of the first things we did was to hire a new chair who was in place for about a year now. And within, this, within that period, she has retooled the uh, uh, curriculum to, and steered uh, uh, new uh, students towards the uh, non-thesis uh, uh, master's degree in mathematics. And we are offering more fellowships. And once again, we are bringing education in, because math teachers are one of the high, in terms of math teachers for the HISD, their shortfall is 678 math uh, teachers. So we're hoping that the partnership between the College of Education and the College, our College of Science and Technology and emphasis on the production of math teachers will, will create a pipeline 
with uh, HISD and the other uh, school districts to encourage more graduate uh, students to enroll in this uh, uh, program. So we are optimistic about this program and uh, once again, you know, issues that happened before our time, we, you know, we couldn't help. But at least going forward, we are optimistic we can, we can turn the tide for this program too. McGregor? Uh, there would need to be 12 graduates in the next two years to meet the, the low producing standard. Um, and with the, the inception of this program, you know, in terms of trying to get working with, with U of H, they, I don't know if there's enough time to do that. How many are in the pipeline? How many are currently enrolled? I mean, the, there were 11 majors in 2009, and there were seven in 2010. How many pipeline? Okay. As of fall of 09, we had 12 students enrolled and eight last fall. So for a total of 20. In the master's program. In the master's program, yes. Most masters finish, <laughs> so 8 and 20 is not bad population to look at in terms of them finishing. What, what, we've got 20 enrolled. Six and six, right? Are yes. We well, that's, that's, 14. we've got enough in the pipeline 20, to make it happen. You have 20 currently enrolled? You, yes. Heard that, 09 and 10. What? The, between o, uh, fall of 09 and fall of uh, 10, we have 20 uh, total. And that's not what your, what the application said i mean in in your in your original application it said that there were you had 11 majors in 2009 and 7 in 2010 total so it makes 18 not not, not 11 plus 7 but 7 total still enrolled in 2010 correct so it sounds so like I mean, I, disconnect i'm not sure I, i'll i'll verify those numbers because what i have here says 12 in 2009 and 8, which I assume is a new, eight new students in No, 10. I don't believe it's new students. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to go with 12 and 9 and 8 and 10, but they're not additive, I don't believe. And I, if, if I'm wrong, I, I, that's great. And but furthermore, I, how many, do you know how many this year, how many have enrolled fall? The number this, uh, this fall, 8. So, so we've got eight in the master's program? Yes, we have eight. And we need, how many do we need in the program? We need to graduate 12 in the next two years. Six a year. Six per year. No, no, three. Right. For the next two years. Three per year. Three per year for the next two years. Six. No. No. Six, six, per six per year, year for the year next two years. So six per year. Five-year target. We have, we have seven shot fall. Right. You have seven total students, and you need to graduate six this year and next year. Well, and there's a little confusion on the numbers, but yeah, I'm a confused here's the too. difference in how I've been trying to look at these. With, with the uh, MA in English and the MS in Chemistry, you had the raw material in the pipeline to get to where you needed to go over the next two years. I'm not hearing that you've got the, the numbers enrolled to achieve 12 MS graduates in mathematics over the next two years. We are saying six a year, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the big question. I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. <laughs> no, that's the big question mark. I think can we get six graduated in a year? We got how many in the pipeline? Eight. I don't, I, I, Eight. I don't, I don't total, think so. We'll be just short, probably. For example, we'll probably end up with can you, eight and eight and we'll be at 12 as a standard for two years so we'll be four short is there do you have the ability to recruit additional students into your program because it sounds like to me you're you're close am, am i am i misinterpreting Not in the that time frame if we if we within the two years we'll be able to if we can increase the pipeline we may be able to come back in two years time to show that we will but Graduating six in the next two years will be will be high. We would need an extra year yeah. to meet the standard. That's what the one more year. Since least. we only got there three years ago, you guys got to give me credit yeah. for a year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know I've said this before, but you know, I I 
I made a trip over to TSU a number of years ago, and it it literally looked like a. And John, I don't mean to to be criticizing your institution, but it it, it resembled what I perceived as a, a, a penitentiary. I mean, it just the, the grounds were there were there, just, there, there were just garbage cans. There wasn't any any signs that anybody had any pride in the institution. And then uh, I had an opportunity to come back a year ago, and it, it began to look like a university. That, that people begin to take pride in what they had there, and they were there. And it 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 just looks like to me you guys inherited a situation that was just almost. I I don't see how where you wanted the job. Because it was just almost, uh, I don't mean that ugly, but. Trying to talk him out of it. Dennis, well, stop I trying to run John off. And not very many. They need him. Dennis, we need John. <laughs> well, we need John, but let me tell you what, there's not too many people that I know of that would have t undertaken that challenge with all the legal and, and, and internal problems that they had with the Board, board of Regents and the mess it was in, with the governor having to intervene to try to just hold it all together. And John could have gone to any institution. Uh, he was he was interim president and chancellor of the University of Houston at the time, and to walk over into that minefield, uh, have an immense amount of respect for him. And I will stake my reputation for whatever it's worth that, given time, TSU will help us close the gaps. You will help us bring the, the African American population not entirely by yourself, but you will do your part to get us where we need to be. And we need a strong, historical African-American institutions in our state. We need you to stay strong because you're our best shot of getting that ethnic minority to where they need to be. They still play a vital role in higher education in the state, in my opinion. And Dennis, how does that relate to the Master of Science in I Mathematics? Just you know, well, let me, I'm, can I'm, I add I'm, a little I've bit got, here? I've gotten mixed emotions. Uh, let me add a little bit. We we were able. Some of the problems we solved, and this is an example where I'm kind of making a pleading here to see if we can do what we need to do with math. But we had two parking garages that were an apartment complex of 60 million dollars that was underwater, and we went out and found a federal program for black colleges. We were able to refinance that deal and took $64 million to the bond and we bond market and got a 2.56 interest rate. That's the same as a, a net present value of about $16 million over the life of the bonds. So those are kind of things that we've been doing to, uh, that's taken our attention away from some of these issues. But I will use the same vigor uh, w with uh, mathematics and chemistry as we did with some of the other external problems that we had. Okay. It goes back to what I said before, I, under the circumstances in which I've seen them find themselves, is that they've had one, they've got one barn and barn over here, and about the time they put it out, they've got to run over here to put this one out, and it goes on and on and on and on. Dennis. We're losing a quorum. No, he's not leaving. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we do need to move along. I'm ready. Okay. Is there a motion for extending a two-year exemption for the mathematics program at Texas Southern University. I so move. Is there a second? Being no second, is there a motion to deny the appeal for the Master of Science in Mathematics at Texas Southern University? So moved. Is there a second? Any further discussion? None. All those in favor of, ex of denying the Master of Science in Mathematics, please raise your hand. All those opposed to denying it, did you raise your hand? Okay, the program is denied. Still a pretty good batting average. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And members of the committee, I, this is a tough job. I know it's a tough job. I commend you, and I wouldn't want to have the job that you have. Thank you. I, I'm okay with the one I have. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time and patience. Thanks, Sonny. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Texas Tech University, a Bachelor of Arts in Classics, and uh, 
whatever an MLA is in landscape architecture. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm, I'm Bob Smith. I'm very fine. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, I serve as provost and senior vice president at Texas Tech University and just wanted to share for the record that since 2009, out of 330 programs at Texas Tech, we have eliminated 89, or 27 percent of our programs, based on the kinds of criteria that you're struggling with and, and dealing with uh, very effectively. Uh, this first uh, justification is, is to respectfully request <coughs> exemption of the BA in classics. Uh, we granted seven BAs uh, this, uh, this fall. Uh, over the past five years, we've actually granted 25 classics uh, BA degrees, but the, the trick here is that we have a number of those folks, 10 of the 25, are second majors. In other words, they're doing a full major in classics, a full major in another area. And typically we find that many of our pre-med students choose classics as a preferred area for a second major. In fact, of the, the last five years, over 50 percent of those graduating with a classics uh, BA degree, 50 uh, percent of them uh, did, were graduated with some distinction, several of magna cum laude and summa cum laude. Uh, we believe that this is a very important uh, degree for Texas Tech University. Uh, if for no other reason, we are one of only three institutions in the state of Texas that have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, and Phi Beta Kappa has an expectation that institutional chapters will have substantial access to study in the classics. It's a very high-level uh, program, and we would respectfully request an exemption with the caveat that maybe the, the coordinating board consider uh, this issue of uh, first and second degrees and whether that could be counted uh, towards the total. Uh, if we can't make uh, our quota in the next two years, uh, certainly we would move to close this program but we think it's a very high quality program. McGregor. And I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, there were, as he said, there were 12 graduates, the way I'm looking at it, and the institution was not reporting the second major. Because I guess there's no requirement that we do that or was not recommended that we do that. Okay. Um, but in, in 20, 2009, there were 20 majors in the program, and in 2010, uh, there were only 11. So, I mean, that they, they seems like a lot of variability in that program. Um, and all of the 4,000 level, in other words, the senior level course courses for the degree are small class sizes. So whether or not there are a whole bunch of other folks who are getting the major and, and they're just not declaring it. So in other words, there's a reason for there to be fewer graduates. There's still a whole bunch of small class sizes that would indicate that it's not a very heavily subscribed program. If I may just interject here that uh, we want to make sure that we're differentiating between a primary major and a second major. Well, but what I'm saying is it doesn't matter about how many majors you're, you're claiming. Mm -hmm. If you look at the small class sizes in all of the 4,000 level courses, are small, you, you're not, you don't have a very well subscribed program. Well, I, I, my, my numbers are that we have 26 in the program either right. as primary majors or secondary majors right. as of this fall, so that, that data was, would not be available to you. Sure. Okay, so, so I'm, a, I'm a little uh, un unclear. You, I mean, we have two sets of data here and, and the system doesn't require you to disclose to, to a input, double major? To input the second major, yes. Is that, and it, is that pretty normal or? It's up to the institution to, to declare any majors that graduate from them. What were the total numbers, Bob? I'm sorry. Well, the, the total for the, the last five years is 25. So we just, just made the, the requirement, if you count uh, first and second majors, the first majors or single majors uh, were 15, and the ones that had second majors uh, were 10, so there was exactly 25 in the last five years. In, your, in McGregor, your figures were 12 primary versus 15, and then we didn't count the secondary. Correct. In, in terms of their CBM report, they, they had 12 majors in the classics, not 15, but... Was there a written appeal? Mm-hmm. 
And and so now we have that's written in the in the appeal that you have about the second majors. It is. Okay. Question: If you have uh, if you don't have a major in the classics, you're still offering courses in the classics, right? Yes, we are. So and in fact, we have an MA in classics as well, and that's one other reason to try to keep this in place to feed students into our MA degree. And your MA degree is well above threshold? I don't know how well it is, quite frankly. Uh, maybe McGregor knows that. It's ironic that you would have a low... Well, we have some folks, because I think it's a very high quality program, we have some folks coming from other institutions uh, into our MA program. And perhaps from other undergraduate degrees? No. Well, they had uh, McGregor, uh, in terms of, of the, the rules for, for calculating low number of graduates. If they had claimed the 10 majors and those had shown up in the in the report, then it wouldn't have been on the low producing list. So we, we would count those who are getting Absolutely. a second major. Yes. Yeah. All right. We would, if they had reported them. Um, I would entertain a motion to extend a two-year extension for the BA in Classics. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, could we also include in that that the institution must provide the data, the, the correct data, on the reporting for their degree program. Do, do we need a data not part of the appeal? It was not submitted through the, the certification okay. system that we verify. Motion, perhaps, if I can make a suggestion. Who was making the motion? Nobody okay. has at this point. All right. <laughs> well, uh, suggestion would be that if we do move to do so, um, that it be uh, contingent upon verification of the data that's, that's just been presented. Just, just so we're, we got ourselves. No problem. Away. Mr. Commissioner? There's, a, <clears throat> there's, a, there's another issue that I, I hope the board will consider. Um, classics, by definition, is a low producing field. There, there are not a lot of students that are attracted to classics. It's enormously difficult. It requires a level of preparation and background that not many students get, but yet it's one of the foundations of Western culture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, we have three classics uh, baccalaureate programs in the state, uh, which means that uh, there, there, are three, there, there are three programs in, in this state that are teaching the origins of, of uh, Western culture which is to say democracy, which is to say <coughs> all we know about uh, rational thinking and logic and so forth. And, and I think we have to take that into account. Thank you, sir. Does that include private schools, too? There's actually four total programs, four. Um, including Texas Tech, right? Four public. Oh, okay. University of Dallas or University of Texas at Dallas? Okay. So that, that's, that's a small number. Well, if it, in our, is it clear in our rules that uh, <clears throat> that uh, second majors uh, are counted? I mean, because this sounds like a cautionary tale to other institutions to be sure you report, mm -hmm. you know, those that are getting second majors. Um, so I don't know whether we want or need to require it, but certainly, it's okay. certainly in this instance. We're, we're, we'll get it figured out one way or the other. I just wanted to make sure we were, we talked about that. Okay. Um, any further discussion? I move for a two-year. Uh, we haven't had a motion. No. Two-year. Two-year exemption. Okay, and is uh, and that's subject to verification of the data that you don't have at this point. It, we don't need You're to make okay? it that way. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, we'll move to the Masters of Landscape. Is that what that is? Yes, sir. And uh, Landscape Architecture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We respectfully request an exemption for the Master in Landscape Architecture of the MLA. Uh, this is a, a very unusual program in that it is part of uh, two programs that are fully accredited, in fact, just recently, for a full six years by the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Landscape Architecture Accreditation Board. Uh, the combination programs, the Landscape Architecture BA and MLA, 
occur in only 17 institutions in the entire United States. This MLA program, while it's been somewhat low producing, something in the order, I believe, of 12 in the last uh, five years, is nevertheless a, an extremely high quality program, one that's greatly valued by practitioners in the field. In fact, in a totally unsolicited letter from Earl Broussard, who is president of uh, TBG Partners in Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and Fort Worth, uh, he wrote to us and he said, Quote, we have hired hundreds of landscape architects from all over the world and from all the major universities. Our experience with Texas Tech graduates has always been that they are of the highest caliber and they have surpassed several programs that are not being reviewed by cost-cutting measures in Texas. End quote. So we think that the, the elimination of the program would be unfortunate and also because of the, the concentration. In our landscape architecture program, which is really unique in Texas and uniquely serves West Texas, 131,000 square miles west of I-35, as you know, is very arid and particularly in drought conditions. That is a very strong concentration in this program. In fact, we're one of the few programs, in, I believe, in the entire country that have that concentration. We currently have 12 students enrolled in the program, five are in the process of doing their thesis. So we will be very close, I think, to the 15 uh, if, if the data holds up. McGregor. Um, and in looking at it, it looks to me as though there were 12 graduates in the last five years, and in the three preceding years, there's only five graduates. So over the next two years, you'll have to graduate five a year to meet the threshold. Uh, if, if we graduated 12 in the, well, in, in the, the last, last five, oh, okay. and in the last three, you've only graduated five. I see what you're so saying. in the next okay. two years, okay. you'll have to graduate t a total of 10 okay. or five a year. So how many are in the pipeline? We currently have 12 students in the program, and five are preparing their theses, as to my knowledge right now. I might also add, if you permit me, uh, we recently had a retirement of the chair of this program, and because they did get such a very high review from their accrediting board, we will be hiring uh, a very fine a new chair of that department, and we think perhaps there will be an infusion of greater rigor in terms of recruitment of students into the program. Do you anticipate that you'll hit the target of five, uh, of, of ten graduates in the next two years? I, I honestly, sir, cannot, cannot promise that. but. But, I, but do you we, anticipate we, we that? We would like to have that opportunity. And with 12, <laughs> with 12 in, the, in the program, there's a, there's a chance that it could happen. Maybe it's a 50% plus a chance of doing that. Mr. Chairman, may yes. I ask a question? Certainly. Yeah. Who else is offering MLA in state of Texas? Uh, I honestly don't know, sir. Fact, do you Kevin got it. I think it, it is clearly the only program in west of I-35. I think there may be one or two others in, in the state. But aren't you developing one with El Paso Community College? No, no, that's, that's, that's just architecture. That's a baccalaureate oh, architecture. in architecture, okay. and that's in place, and we just received a $5 million grant to support that program through the U.S. Okay. Department of Education. I believe Arlington and Austin, go ahead. Yes, I think you're correct, actually. And A&M. And M, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So is that the only other three institutions that spoke to you? I think that's, uh, that's in some of the notes here. I'm sorry that I passed over that. Okay. See. Dennis? The only thing that you're telling me that, that, that might <clears throat> get you to where you need to be is you're hiring a new Dean or department? A new director. The, director, the, okay. the, uh, the program is, a, is essentially a school of uh, landscape architecture within the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. But, but, but the best estimate is that this is a, you, you could marginally meet the uh, standards in which we've been set if everything goes well. Yes, and, and we think one of the reasons for making this case is that it's such a high quality program and, and it serves so uniquely uh, this area of, uh, of dry land uh, landscape architecture. But, and you've been, you've said there's no real guarantee that, that you can 
meet those numbers. Well, we're going to make very, uh, Mr. Golden, we're going to make, Dr. Golden, we're going to make a very strong effort to make that happen. The, what we have uh, said in similar circumstances uh, for prior, prior uh, presentations of the appeals is uh, uh, essentially just to be, to try to be consistent, if you, you, you've got the raw materials in the pipeline, but you're going to have to have a, you know, 80 percent plus graduation rate. And what we've asked others is if you don't make it, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, uh, then, it, then it needs to be closed. You, you won't see me back here. We've closed on my watch 89 programs. Uh, you can stand on our We record. appreciate that you understand, yeah. you know, where yes, we're sir. headed with no, this. No, we understand, sir. Um, those those programs were closed without any direction from the coordinating board. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. your institution is looking uh, diligently at those low producing programs and. Yes, yes, yes sir. We are. We went from three thirty to two forty one in three years. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we give them an extension for two years. I will second that. Is there any further discussion? If none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you very much, sir. Next, next program is uh, University of Texas at El Paso. It's a Master of uh, Arts in Art, Art Education. Yes. Thank and you, Mr. How are you? I'm Before fine, you start, you. I would uh, the representatives from UT Health Science Center and West Texas A&M, if they'd like to just come, come ahead and come forward. I'm sorry. Oh, I think no Pat's problem. been here for about a half an hour. <laughs> Thank I you, think, Mr. That, I think that's underselling it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you've been here for at least half a day. My name is Pat Witherspoon, and I'm Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at UT El Paso. The President Provost had long standing out of state commitments and couldn't be here and received approval for me to come and speak on behalf of UTEP. Uh, we did attempt to consolidate the Studio Art Master's Program and the Master of Arts in Art Education, and that uh, request was denied. So we are hoping to keep the Master of Arts in Art Education because it is a program that serves place-bound teachers in the independent, the multiple independent school districts within our region. Uh, UTEP is the sole provider of graduate programming in art uh, education in our region. Uh, there are currently 10 master's students enrolled in this program and four students are within two semesters of graduation. The average enrollment for the graduate art education block has been 10 students per semester since 2005. Uh, those courses uh, are listed as small class, to, uh, uh, were reported as small classes, but they are taught in seminar uh, style so that a faculty member will teach the class to, to a seminar, but then will meet again individually every week with the individuals. So they're not taught as small classes, and I know that was an initial concern of uh, the staff. Um, the current um, students that we have in the program teach at the middle school level and at the high school level, and two of our recent graduates teach at El Paso Community College. Five master's students have graduated within the last academic year, uh, and nine graduated within the last three years, which is three per year, which, is, which does meet the minimum of the coordinating board with respect to master's graduates. Uh, during this period of time, a new program head uh, has been working for on recruitment and retention, and we have a new department chair who's also been given responsibility for the number of graduates in this program. Nine of the ten students in the program are Hispanic, and we think that speaks to the Closing the Gaps initiative. Uh, five students were accepted into the program this spring, the largest number who sought admission uh, in several semesters. I also ask for a revenue versus cost analysis to be done of this program. Uh, by our institute, our Center for Institutional Evaluation, Research, and Planning, which found that looking at the unit of uh, cost per semester credit hour, the net revenue for semesters fall 2007 through spring 2011 is consistently over $10,000. So it's actually a revenue generator, not a revenue loser. McGregor. Thank you, sir. Um, in terms of art education, there were seven graduates in the last five years. Um, virtually every course is small class size, and, and I know that they're in Appendix C of the appeal. Uh, there was an effort to try and explain that, and maybe you'd better help walk us through it, because a seminar course that's only got fewer than five students is still a small class. 
Yes, but none of the seminar classes are that small. I actually have another handout. Uh, is this going to, now is this in, to contravene what's in the Appendix 3? Not to contravene it, it's just that to show how the courses are taught. The, uh, during the fall and spring semesters uh, of, these, of these art education courses, they're offered as a block, which means they occur at the same time and in the same place. So as a seminar, the instructor meets with the individuals. Each of them might be in a different course, but they're meeting as a group. Each of them has different, brings to that class a different responsibility, a different paper, a different assignment. Um, then, that it, then that faculty member meets with individuals on a, meets with these students on an individual basis. So for instance, uh, since fall of 2005, the uh, courses in these seminars, the numbers in the seminars have ranged from 8 to 15. Yeah, but I'm, I guess I'm looking at, at the way that's laid out, and if I'm looking at just the names of the faculty members, I mean, there's a graduate seminar that James Quinnen taught in fall of 2008. There was just one student in it. Am I misreading that? I don't know which seminar, if I knew which seminar. 5395. That wouldn't be in the art education block. That would be a, uh, possibly an independent study for him. I understand that, but when you're dealing with a, a program that has a very limited number of students, you're going to typically see a lot of independent studies and, and uh, problems courses because regular classes can't make. Well, and also we're talking about art education, and of course that, that type of instruction is different. But the courses I'm talking about are specifically the art education blocks. That's what was attempted in Appendix 3. That, Dave McIntyre teaches all of those students. And as I said, I have a, a handout here for okay. for board or for and, and or the staff. Okay. Uh, well, then and, I, and I have an ex. Uh, I can give you the names of the courses there. Art 5301, 5303. Art education. Uh, excuse no, me. That, art that, education. I don't think the board okay. has has access to it, so you don't need to do that. Okay. But they are called. They're in a stacked or seminar format. Do you have other questions or responses, McGregor? Well, and you said you, there were 12 students in the pipeline? I, uh, there are 10 there now. And 10 in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And in the last three years, there were only four graduates. No, we graduated five last year during the This year, in 11. 2010, 11. Okay, so in, in the last four years, then, they're at nine graduates. Okay. And you said that at and best, you would be graduating four? Four in the next two semesters. Right. So and in, a new cohort that is coming. So. We also have, uh, in that regard, maybe a small program, but we have a stable pool. Again, we're talking about teachers who are in either the middle schools or the, or the high schools. We have 59 UTEP grads with art education undergraduate degrees. Uh, five of them have master's degrees, and they're all part of the pool for this. In our nine school districts, we have over 150 individuals with baccalaureate degrees in art education. Uh, they're also potential individuals in this pool. Uh, in our undergrad art program, 22% of our undergrad majors are in art education. So as I said, since 2005, we've been able to have uh, a stable number of individuals in this program. Commissioner? I don't have anything to add. It's, 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 it's been a low-producing program. I uh, understand the, the reasons for support, but it, the numbers don't add up. Are the graduates of this program, are they staying primarily in that area in, in the school system? Yes. As art teachers? Most of them are, are staying as teachers. And, and what is the demand? For, for teachers, well, right. is there a surplus, a shortage? A no. I think it would be stable at, at, at this. I wouldn't say that there, it has increased right now, but it's it's a stable demand. Uh, the, our individuals, we we did send to the board a listing of our graduates, uh, with 59 individuals in three different school districts, and they all have jobs. And as I said, the ones in the program now are at the elementary, uh, excuse me, the middle school or the high school level. One reason that they want to have access to this is their own career development. Obviously, it's good for them to have a master's degree in terms of their own progression in, in the field and in the school district. Any other questions? McGregor, you said that the number of graduates was three in the, or four in the last year, seven in the last five. Five in so, the last year, actually. So you no, know many not the way we're counting it. 
in terms of 06 to 10, oh, yeah. the, those are the numbers we're dealing with in terms of how we're an analyzing for this so period. Seven in the five years ending 2010. Right. And then it jumped up to five graduates in two. And then it would be nine in the seven in the five years between seven and eleven. So it's gone from seven up to nine, but over over five years. So it's still less than two per year. Correct. I thought I heard nine and three at the at first. But. I did say that in the last three years they've been nine graduates, which is three a year. <laughs> right, but if you okay. I move to deny. Second. There's been a motion to deny, and it's been second. Is there any other further discussion? None. All those in favor of denying the Master of Arts in Art, Art Education at the University of Texas at El Paso, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, next is the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, a Master of Science in Clinical Laboratory Sciences Technology. Toxicology. And toxicology. What did I say? <laughs> Technology. Well, we may have we may have do some shuffling here, and, and I, I think Dr. Chang had some. Okay. Okay. You want me to talk about the consolidation first? That'd okay. be great. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of programs that are listed on the list as uh, being appealed by our institution. However, at this time, I would like to inform the board that essentially during the program review process, we feel it's to everyone's uh, best interest if we consolidate some of the program. So especially in dental area, we have a dental diagnostic sciences master degree and we have a endodontics master degree. Those two programs will be consolidated into one. In addition, there are two other master degree programs. One is in postodontics and then in um, periodontics. They are all going to be combined into one master degree in dental clinical sciences degree. All four? All four. Okay. Yes. The reason we did the consolidation is uh, throughout the budget process, we look at the structure and we look at the way we um, produce graduate. Uh, we put program together and we need to find the most effective way to deal with uh, some of the program administration. And when we look at the program themselves or the master's degree in dental school, we found out that all the courses, are core courses are identical. So there is no reason for us to administer the program as four separate ones. They really should be combined into one. It's just like we did with the dental department. We used to have 10 dental departments. We collapsed them into five. So this is just part of that uh, process. You're withdrawing your appeal then for those two courses? So we're not really filing appeal for those okay. courses, yes. Do we need to act to with the, the board's permission? I think what we, I'd like to do is like we did with the UT Brownsville Engineering Physics and Physics, and if you could name the the uh, programs that you're that you're proposing for consolidation again. Mm -hmm. It's a master uh, of science degree in dental diagnostic sciences and master degree uh, master degree of sciences in endodontics. We would like to uh, propose to consolidate, consolidate those two programs. Now, you mentioned four programs that you wanted to consolidate into one, correct? That is correct. What are the other programs? The other two programs are a master's degree um, in sciences in postodontics Ortho and master's degree of sciences in periodontics. Okay. Orthodontics and, and periodontics? Correct. And okay. then we have already sent the paperwork through to UT system. So it's just okay. making its way over. Right. And I, but I want to be able to give the board the opportunity to approve that consolidation since these two courses, these two programs are slated for uh, elimination, basically. Yes. And so if we go ahead and approve that now. I'll move. Um, prospectively, is that all right with you all? I'll second that motion. Okay. All right, there's a motion and a second uh, to approve the consolidation of the MS in dental diagnostic sciences and the MS in endodontics 
with the orthodontics and periodontics program, both master's programs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just, sorry. I'm sorry. We, we may have to hold up. Just one quick question. Mm -hmm. Is it subject to approval by the University of Texas system? And if it is, should the motion be subject to, to their receipt of that approval? That's probably a good choice. Actually, yes. it's not on the agenda, so I don't know that we can. No, the well, approval of these courses is not on our agenda. Actually, that merger wouldn't actually come to the okay. board. Okay. It would be handled in my office. And so that merger isn't as important to go all the way through the board. Um, okay. But it, I think if we make a contingent upon the board's approval, the, the UT system board, that'll be fine. Is that fine with you? you I'll withdraw my motion. Just oh, to okay. clarify that, we okay. already had that discussion uh, at the UT system level. We have received verbal approval. Okay. Just so. Okay. I think your motion's fine. Will that resolve our concerns here at the coordinating board with low performing? With both of those, yes, it will. It would, it would take care of our concerns. Yes. Okay. I, I thought it would. Both would. of the programs that were on this list are part of the it's rather challenging because they're, they're residency programs, and so they're tied to a residency program. And if you don't, if, if the person who's in the residency program chooses not to pursue the master's program, there's really no one else to take the program. That is and correct. And so it's, it's yes. a very limited pool of people who would even be eligible because their selection process is, fa is founded on the residency process not on a typical uh, academic admissions process. Now, did I say that correctly? Absolutely. The reason that we have this master degree program is to enhance teaching and research in this residence, hoping in the future they will take a uh, career in academic medicine in our dental school. Because uh, if you look at the entire nation, we only have 60 dental schools. And of the 60 dental schools, the graduates are limited. And in the future, if we don't look to see what we can do to, to cultivate future admission, then one day we're going to find us we're short of dental faculty. And that's why we established those master degree. So, McGregor, do we need to approve the consolidation? We need to approve it. We, we, we can go ahead and approve the consolidation because otherwise it's going to be eliminated. Those two programs would be eliminated. If they don't, because of the appeal, endodontics and di dental diagnostic sciences would be eliminated today unless you all take action to prevent it. So we so, going ahead so and we approving need a the motion whole consolidation. Of consolidation. Well, I don't know. Is that or a two year extension? However you want to do it. Well, I, I like the consolidation idea very much. This is exactly the kind of thinking we're encouraging institutions to engage in to take four unnecessarily separate majors and consolidate them and administrate I'll them more the efficiently. I'll leave the, mo the original motion Your motion was fine, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Didn't and seconded. She no. unwithdrew. I've already seconded that. Okay. okay. All those in favor of the consolidation of the two programs, the uh, dental diagnostics and endodontics at uh, UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, now we're back to the MS in Clinical Laboratory Sciences Toxicology. I, okay. This particular program actually initially was set up in 1995 to be a low producing program. It sounds rather strange, but this is a very specialized field. This particular degree specializes in post-mortem technology. In other words, the graduate of this program actually go into a medical examiner's office and they use very sophisticated instrument to determine, uh, to quantify and identify the drug, uh, the chemical, the alcohol, and poison um, use, using those instruments. And this way they can help the medical examiner to determine the cause of death. Oftentimes, the report generated by these technicians will be used in court, um, and then they have a legal consequences. Um, this is the only program in the state of Texas. And like I said, we build this program, understand that we are meeting <coughs> one special need in workforce. And most of the graduate, 
uh, from our program essentially work for um, drug enforcement agency or medical examiner's office. And what makes it very difficult for us to have a large program, uh, it, one of them is this. In this particular program, we include a three-month practicum. It's a full-time practicum. And they have to work in a toxicology lab within the medical examiner's office. There are not that many medical examiner offices that has such a te uh, toxicology lab. Even the one in Austin, Travis County, doesn't have one. And then, uh, so most of, and then on top of that, most of our students are going to school part-time while holding down a full-time job. So, uh, and then we live in a military town in San Antonio. Many of our students, they are actually military personnel. And they will be called out to uh, be deployed at the moment's of notice. For example, <laughs> this year, we have a couple of students, essentially, they are taking leave of absence. And so naturally, they probably will not be able to graduate, complete the program, until they come back into the States. So, and, and so what we have done is looking at what else we can do to increase the number of students into this program. One is we have signed an articulation um, agreement with the Samari University in San Antonio. And then the other one is we want to expand the opportunity for practicum of our students to other counties. So we have signed affiliation agreement with Harris County Medical Examiner's Office. And hopefully they will be able to take some of our students and then we can get the student into the pipeline and graduate and at the same time have the necessary practical experience. McGregor? Well, a a as she said, it it's a small program. There are only eight grads in the last five years. Most of the classes are small class sizes, and so that makes it difficult. And one of the other issues um, in terms of the working was that there's no financial aid to students. And so that will also continue to inhibit uh, expansion of the program or getting more full-time students into the, into the program. What is the job market really for these students if there are not that many labs that actually um, are capable of doing the testing that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, um, because the number we have graduated are so, uh, so few, uh, they actually, all of them have jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them either work in the state, in a medical examiner's office, not necessarily in Bell County, in San Antonio area. They may go to others such as Harris County. And they, uh, they can, with their um, expertise, they can also work for drug enforcement agencies. How many other programs in the nation are there like this? Um, Dr. Linda Smith is the chair of the department. Mm -hmm. Will you turn your mic on, please? Okay, there are very few in the country. University of Florida probably has the most famous one, and they also go through the PhD level. But in this general area, there are, as she said, none in the state. There are none in the surrounding states. And um, a number of them, again, that do exist are specifically at the PhD level. And probably none of them produce a lot of students, right? No, none do. Right. Um, all of our graduates um, have jobs. And um, in fact, to be honest, we've lost several out of the program because they have been employed prior to even graduating. They've been snatched up once they've finished their coursework and offered an awful lot of money. <laughs> and so that, you know, that has been a problem on occasion. But every one of them are employed um, as supervisors, as she said, within DEA. And some are in um, d specific drug testing laboratories. Questions, comments, Commissioner? Well, it's a curious argument that the program was intended to be low producing. <laughs> it's, Just kind of get that uh, out on, get that out on the table up front. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, we have to come clean. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the the question for the board is ultimately whether 
uh, a boutique program like this is is worth the expense and, and the the uh, the resources at this at a time when our resources are very constrained. Obviously, the fact that there are so few programs suggests that there isn't a, a great demand for them. I, I suspect that that the need is being met primarily by people who get degrees in related fields or by people who go out and get a PhD, in which case your students presumably wouldn't be as competitive. Um, if I can address two of your points. One is the faculty here, the faculty member that's primarily responsible for teaching um, is not responsible for the master's program solely. He has other teaching responsibilities in the undergraduate program. Many of the forensic experts, for example, in town voluntarily come in and give lectures. In addition, you have to remember these students are doing research. They have to have dead bodies to do it on and specific types of drugs. And so we've been able to utilize the resources of the medical examiner's office. So it's been quite a good, if you will, a symbiotic relationship. And um, obviously, we're not going to flood the market with graduates. That's not the purpose. However, if you think about everything that's gone on with specimens and drug identification, at the master's level, these people can be boarded as well as at the Ph.D. level. So several of our graduates have met the requirements to be boarded, and they are employed. And um, again, not every medical examiner's office does this. Some have to send it out to another medical examiner's office. So we do have inquiries, and our grads, as I said, do get picked up right away. So in terms of resources, it's basically no cost to the institution. And we feel like we have a very good working relationship with the current medical examiners, and we share resources and expertise. Our, our students, as part of their graduate projects, solve problems for the medical examiners. For example, looking at post-mortem production of this uh, substance that is a date rape drug, to try to tell them, was this prior to death or was it after? So they've served quite a purpose for these people as part of their masters. Excuse me, if, if there's such a high demand for your graduates and they get hired away before they even get their degree or whatever, why aren't there more people signing up for the class or for the program? The, the well, one is they have to have very specific requirements in terms of quite a bit of chemistry background. They also have to have some pathophysiology, and not every biology graduate, not even every chemistry graduate has that. So that we, ver we look very um, strictly at what they have to come into the program. And we don't accept everybody. That two to three month practicum in the medical ex examiner's office sort of limits us to one student in the spring, one student in the summer, and one student in the fall. And we'd be doing those other students a disservice if we took them in and then couldn't put them in a practicum. Chairman, a better question. How many of your graduates get jobs in the state of Texas, and how many goes out of state? Right now, with the exception of the two individuals who are with DEA, everybody is in the state of Texas in some capability, and the two DEA agents actually started here and have since been transferred into supervisory positions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, question. If, is there, if, of course, we assume, assuming that there is a, a demand for these graduates, is there any uh, way that you could increase the number? If, the, if every one of these students are getting out and getting jobs and, and of course, getting huge sums of money, uh, I mean, why don't we, why don't we beef this up? Why don't, we, why don't we become the famous place to educate these people? Well, as um, Dr. Chang indicated, we have uh, St. Mary's in the past two years has started a baccalaureate degree in forensic science with three tracks. One of them happens to be forensic chemistry. So those students are coming into an early admission master's program. So we will start them in their senior year taking courses with us. So we are increasing it that way. But um, the second thing becomes the limiting factor for the practicum, which is why we have worked with Houston, now that their medical examiner's office is back on track, to get an affiliation agreement. Again, that requires the student to simply move out of town for three months. So that can be a financial burden. So there are several things that we have currently in 
in the works. You know, the biggest issue becomes money. Many of them save up their vacation in order to go and take this three-month practicum. So they have to know ahead of time. If they're in town, they can change their work hours. If they're out of town, they pretty much give up their work. So that is somewhat of a limiting factor. But again, as we acquire sites, then we can sort of tell the students ahead of time. As of now, it's been best to keep them at the Bear County. So I think you probably have answered this question, but I gather there's no revenue that comes with the partnership with Harris County Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, you mean we don't pay them, correct, and they don't so why pay why don't us. they pay you? <laughs> well, <laughs> because you really can't pay a student that's in practicum. No, um, but they could, they could uh, supplement the program, and uh, I don't know whether... Well, uh, one of the things, in terms of the research, I mean, the students use the instrumentation there so that we don't have to have it. They're able to use the specimens, the freezers. I mean, some of that is a, sort of a quid pro quo kind of arrangement. Now, um, we have never had to approach one of the medical examiner's offices for revenue. Um, again, we get their expertise, too, in terms of lecturing. So we have, at least up until this point, um, followed that particular model. Yeah, some of the experts working in medical examiner's office actually are volunteer teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good relationship. Are there other questions? If not, I will entertain a motion. Based on the unique, based on the uniqueness of this program and the fact that we don't have any other in the state, I'm going to move that we grant them an extension. Two year, two year. but at the end of two years, McGregor, we excuse me, Dennis, but I, is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Okay. I mean, what are we going to look at in, six, in two years? How well the St. Mary's partnership has increased enrollments or, and what the Harris County yeah. uh, agreement has meant to them in terms of increasing opportunities for, yeah. for St. Mary's students. students will probably be starting fall of 12, all right? So they'll be coming in. Again, they're not going to be ready. They're only in their junior year sure. coming up. So, um, but we also currently have 10 students. So we'll have a, a number of them right now ready for the graduation over the next three years. You approached Tarrant County? We have not approached Tarrant County yet. We did have um, a support letter from someone here in Dallas and, uh, mm -hmm. or from someone in Dallas and so we're going to be following that up to see what we can work out. Um, understand that the paperwork takes a long time. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, this is uh, this is the only program in the state? Mm -hmm. In forensic and analytical toxicology. Okay, because I heard earlier that uh, one of the other schools that appeared today had something in toxicology. Uh, environmental toxicology, yes, um, that's, that's yeah, Southern. nothing like, they okay. do not work on dead people. <laughs> dead plants, maybe? I don't know. What, sound, what I would encourage... Are is, there other programs that do? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, I know I Texas know. State had some, has gone to done some work on a on a body farm now I don't know what the cadaver oh, purpose the there farm, is but uh, that's where they bury them and see how long it takes to decompose um, that's more the collection oh, yeah. side of forensic science where they go out and actually have to do the sampling and select the appropriate um, specimens to be brought in for analysis okay but there's not a toxicology no no well, I, uh, I would. Any surrounding state. I think I think I would look really hard for revenue sources as well as increasing the pipeline. And start talking to the medical examiner's offices about if you really are the only specialty of the state like this. I think you you ought to be able to attract revenue. And so if the board does vote to grant exemption, yeah, that's something I would like to maybe look at. Even you know, it may be a two-year exemption, but I think. I'd like to hear six-month reports on what are we doing to generate revenue, um, short of starting CSI San Antonio. And, uh, <laughs> That'd be cool on the river. Get your own, uh, get your own TV station, <laughs> TV show. Okay, there is a motion and a second on the floors uh, to approve a two-year extension. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. 
All those opposed, same sign. Program is extended for two years. Um, Thank you. Okay, I believe you have one more. It's a PhD in radiological sciences, radiation biology. That's right. Um, this particular program should be a focus within the PhD in radiological sciences instead of giving its own PhD. So we have already taken the step to consolidate it into the PhD in radiological sciences. It has received the campus approval, UD system approval. We have sent the formal paperwork to the coordinating board. So I'm sure that is in transit. That's why uh, it does not reflect that um, the program inventory. This particular program, the reason it was uh, low producing is throughout the year, we look at how science evolved. In years past, when you have one focus, when you are major in particular biology, you major in biology. But science nowadays is multidisciplinary, is interdisciplinary. So for a while, we took the approach, we need to review our program content to make sure it goes with the most advanced step in addressing science topics. And then we purposely reduce the number of students into the program until we get our act together. So last year, after all these discussions, we decided that we need to relook at the entire uh, focus of radiological sciences. So we can, uh, we can look at neuroscience, image science, clinical investigation, cell molecular biology, and radiation physics. So all of these are going to be combined together into one PhD in radiological sciences. So this program will essentially go away. Okay. So the way I'm, uh, well, if I may for a moment, I thought they were already combined. Uh, no. There was the, way the, the way the SIP code is and everything else, I mean, if you look even at, look at how they're, how it's, is up there, it's radiological sciences, radiation biology. Right, uh, they, however, we have a degree in PhD in radiological sciences. It's the same SIP code though, it's it would have been counted together, correct. they would have been counted they together. Counted together? That's the way I'm understanding it from staff, yeah. Okay. So I mean, they're already combined and there's only four graduates. And like I said, that's what we did in the past several years, we actually purposely didn't admit that many students because we were in the process of revamp the entire program. Right, but that's that's been that way for a while. I mean, in terms of having it combined. Yeah, we didn't have that many graduate. That is correct. So okay, then I guess, Mr. Chairman, then my point would uh, my uh, my comments would be that there were only four graduates. It was created because of a perceived need, um, and that that was the way that that uh, it was presented in the application. And from my perspective, it hasn't shown that there's an actual need. There's been four graduate in, in the last five years? Yes, sir. And what we, uh, right now, we have about, about 13 students in the, uh, in the program. And we actually have... Uh, and they've got to get to 15 graduates. That's right. Um, we propose that we project that we're going to have 13 students in the pipeline, and next year we're going to have uh, 15, and the year after 17. So every year we purposely increase the number, and hopefully we will get up there. That, that's a long way to go. It's a long way. It is. So we the four that. graduates the last five years, how many in the last three years, McGregor? Uh, zero. Oh, no, look, looked at the wrong one. Uh, two. Two in the last three years. <laughs> yes, sir. So they, they would have to get 13 in the next two. They'd have to graduate everybody they already got in the program. Pretty much. Isn't the PhD yes. threshold two per year? Oh, PhD program. Sorry. This is a PhD. Eight. They would need eight more. Get eight in the next two years, and they have 13 in the pipeline. I apologize, I wasn't used to dealing with the PhD program. That's okay. Okay. 
We're pretty confident that we should be able to reach that right. threshold. The pipeline keeps increasing in years to Based on what we have considered with some others, I think we're developing a methodology as we go along for the next round, <laughs> the next time we go through this process. <laughs> this is kind of like making sausage, it's the first time we've, we've done this. And apparently they've got three, gra they had three graduates this year, is that right? In FY11, there were three graduates? Yes. Okay. We're really trying. So there's five, the other time. They, they've got five out of ten. <laughs> with one year to go. So they'd have to graduate five next year to meet the standard. This this next academic year? Correct. Mm -hmm. Are y'all going to do that? How many have you got in there now? Program right now we have 13. Uh, and a lot of them are already in the last year. I make a motion that we allow them extension. Two-year extension? Second. Is that a second? Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> we'll flip the order next time, Pat. Thank yeah, you very I'm much. Gonna make that to reverse comment. those letters. <laughs> uh, West Texas A&M University Bachelor of Science in Physics. Well, good, afternoon. good afternoon. My name is Pat O'Brien, president at West Texas A&M University. And as you might imagine, given the actions that have been taken previously this afternoon, what I'm going to say is a little bit different from what I intended to say. But I will tell you that it was never my intent to come before you and to tell you that over the next two years, we would be able to meet the threshold as a standalone Bachelor's of Science and Physics program. I can't even attest that if we had a four-year extension, that as a standalone program, we could meet that standard. However, it was always my intent to argue in terms of the consortium. I believe that the consortium is a good model for regional institutions to produce individuals in STEM fields, especially a field such as physics. Believing that, over the past several years, we put a lot of additional resources into our physics program so that we could help shore up this consortium model. We have a new department head. We changed the curriculum. We allocated scholarships towards the uh, students who want to pursue a physics degree. We've created outreach programs into the high schools so that we can recruit more students. And we've been successful. We doubled the number of majors just over the past year. But still, with the pipeline that we would have, we're, we as a standalone, we wouldn't meet that threshold. Now, here's what I would ask. There seems to be some sympathy in favor of a consortium model. What I would ask is give us a chance to shore up that consortium model. What I would ask is that for all of these physics programs that we've considered today that want to be a part of the consortium, hold off on action today. Don't, don't terminate those programs. Hold off, hold our feet to the fire, say come back in six months with a proposal. If you don't like the proposal, then terminate the programs. The reason why I ask for this is that if we terminate those programs today, it will be in our local papers. It will be in the Amarillo Globe News tomorrow that the physics program at West Texas A&M University has been terminated. That will make it much more difficult for us to be able to recruit the students to make the consortium viable. Perception, reputation will be impacted. And those high school counselors who pick up that paper tomorrow and read that the program has been terminated will be very reluctant to advise those individuals to go into the physics program at West Texas as part of the consortium. So what I would ask is hold off on the terminations. 
give us a chance to put together a true consortium with a true structure, with a process to ensure that we can recruit and graduate students, and with the leadership that is necessary for that consortium to be a viable consortium. Thank you. McGregor? Um, I would say that with three graduates, I'm not sure what the reputation of the program is. Exactly. Um, it, and so from, from my perspective, if there's that's only three graduates, five years. that's over five years. Okay. Um, with regard to the other programs, the other uh, degree programs that were in the consortium, I think we can get together with all of the institutions and sit down and we will have to bring back to you as the board an approval for a new consortium or whatever we're going to put together um, because of the, the restriction in the current rule that says they can't create a new program within 10 years That's correct. in a similar program. And we will bring that back to you all for two purposes. One, so that we know where everybody is and what everybody's responsibility is when they sign on to this consortium and can, in fact, hold them accountable for that, which we have not done or been able to do with the current engineering consortium or uh, physics consortium. And two, it will give us the opportunity to show to you what we're going to do with all the institutions to help them move forward from this rather bleak start that the original consortium had. Commissioner, anything you want to add? How long has the consortium been in place now? It's my understanding the consortium's been in place for about eight years, but I'm not real sure it was structured correctly. Uh, you've got to have leadership in any organization, and if it's simply a leaderless federation, you're going to get the result that we got. Right. Well, but what, what, what's, where is the compelling evidence that, that um, things are going to be done so differently that they're going to yield a result? Because it seems to me the evidence is clear that the consortium has been a failure, and eight years later, we're just barely beginning to 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 try to to fix it. That, that, well, that's very troubling to me. I, th I think it, I, very, I can't speak for the other institutions. I can speak for my own institution. Uh, we've been engaged in a bit of triage in moving the institution from where it was to where we want to be. And I started with the top. I, I'm a firm believer in Jim Collins, get the right people on the bus and put them in the right seat. So of my vice presidents, three I appointed. Of my deans, all six are new deans. Of my department heads, 10 of the 19 are new department heads. So we've been working our way to get the right leadership in at the institution. And I think that's going to be key for the consortium. Uh, we, we can put anything down on paper that we want, but unless we have the organizational structure correct, and unless we have the right leadership in that consortium, it is not going to work. I, I've got a comment. You know, it, it, why did it take and I guess I've already hit on this. I mean, what, what, why did it take us to initiate all this? You know, I mean, what, what, how long would this would have continued year after year with, with programs that are low producing, uh, ineffective, inefficient, little or no accountability? Should the coordinating board or whoever else have stepped in and said, we're going we're gonna to hold some people accountable. We're going to do things more efficiently and effectively. And, 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 and you know, at, at what point would educators who, who we entrust to, to do this and, and should be held accountable to do it, at what point would, would they have woke up and said, well, I guess we better do something about all this? I mean, we we well, started that's, on. That's right. why the legislature starts mm -hmm. breathing down our neck. That's the reason we're breathing down y'all's neck to a certain extent, maybe not to the extent that we will in six months from now if this didn't all come together. But, you know, I keep harping on this thing that, you know, administrators and teachers and faculty, you know, they, they, they want this concept of shared governance, but where I'm all for it, but you got to step up the plate and start governing. You, you understand what I'm saying? I'm in year five 
five and a half. Army? I'm in year five and a half at West Texas. I, w I haven't been there as long as the consortium's been there. We started this process with regard to the sciences about three years ago, two years into my tenure. Uh, we recognized that we had a problem, and, and we started trying to shore it up at that time. We had to recruit a new department head. I had a faculty member who had been there for a long time who was dying of cancer. He wasn't out recruiting students. Now we have a new faculty in physics, two very, very energetic individuals who will go out and recruit students. In addition to that, we're changing the culture of the institution. Uh, we're moving to a Lean Six Sigma organization. These things take time. So, yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, we have to be held accountable. But quite frankly, from the day I walked in, to be able to go from where we were in terms of graduating physics graduates to where we are right now, given that it takes four years to go through the, um, uh, the cycle with the students, <laughs> we still wouldn't be there. <coughs> it just, I, I agree with you. Will you agree? Hold me accountable. Yeah. Will you agree with me, though, if not now, that at some point in the future, excuses are not going to be acceptable? I totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we've all, including my good friend John Rudley, who I made a valid effort to take up for today, you know, he had excuses. So, but at some point, you know, where there has to be, we have to take ownership in, in where we're at, and Thanks. someone has to accept some responsibility for why things are not being done better than what they are, and we can do better. Thank you, Dennis. It. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. How long do you think it will take us to put this consortium in place? I don't know. I don't know. Would you estimate something, Commissioner? I guess my point, my question is, I don't know if we can, but we're going to do everything possible to try and get get it put together. I mean, I think we've heard from three institutions, all of whom had the same thing to say about the the engineering, the, the, about the physics and sorting. It didn't work. Well, it, if we've known about this, and the institutions have known about this for a while, and, and we haven't been able to fix it, we're going to do everything we can to try and figure out a way to make it work. But we got half a dozen of these institutions now, maybe more, that either have been denied, some have appealed, yeah, some haven't. No, no. I'm going to I'm going to get all of them and get it started with the discussion immediately. Super, but I I would like to have some kind of a timetable. How you think it's going to take? Three months, six months, a year, five years, something. Uh, I'll either tell you we can do it in six months or it'll fail. So okay. we'll we'll months. shoot for the March strategic planning committee meeting. Okay, is that fair? Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's going, five months, mm -hmm. but who's going to take the lead on this? Is the coordinating board responsible and entrested to take the now, lead on the this? university course? presidents have to take the lead on this. It can't. It's got to come from the campuses. That's, that's what I think it needs to become. It needs to come from. But we will facilitate that because what we're trying to invent here, Pat, and why I don't feel we can we can make one exception when we've denied extensions to the other individual programs is because. None of these individual programs have been able to make a compelling, convincing case that on standing alone, they can over, overcome, they can exceed these low producing thresholds. What we're, we're hoping we can do is come up with a new animal, a consortium that essentially uh, invents a single new program distributed and offered across multiple institutions. Exactly. And, and thereby, you know, uh, gain some efficiency and hopefully even be more uh, compelling in recruiting and retaining uh, students. We're, we're going to have to figure out how to do that. And, and this is the reason why I asked for putting this decision into abeyance uh, for six months. We've got to figure out what the accreditation uh, implications are of having the, the uh, faculty dispersed across multiple un uh, universities if we go with a single degree program housed at a single institution because now it's their accreditation is predicated upon the performance not only of their people but also the physics faculty I have the physics faculty that Kingsville would have and so forth we, we, we need to figure out what that model needs to be and I'm not sure exactly what that model needs to be at this point to make it effective but I think it's well worth our effort especially if we want 
to maintain the competitiveness of this state in this nation in terms of sciences. We, we got to figure well, this out. We, we, uh, these are six institutions, six or seven, that graduated only fi 14 physics majors combined over the last five years out of over 800. And I, they're not contributing to the competitiveness. That's the reason that we're here. We're talking about a very minuscule number of graduates. Your output isn't yeah. worth what we're, what we're dealing with at this point. Maybe, maybe not. And uh, actually, I, I do want to say that you're concerned about your reputation regionally. We're concerned about our reputation mm -hmm. also, and our charges here as a board are to actually be good stewards of the tax dollars of the people of this state and and to to ask you to really cons be uh, cooperative with what we're going to try and go forward with is 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 just a possible solution but in reality um, you're you're not producing enough if I were a parent of a kid who actually did wanted to go into physics I wouldn't send him to your school knowing your outcomes so um, I mean, so I, I don't know, I agree with, with what uh, Raymond said, is that um, you, you don't have a very good reputation at this point. In terms of numbers, I would agree with you. In terms of the fact that the head of the explosive division at Pantex is a WT graduate, I would disagree with you. In terms of- When did of he graduate? Pardon? When did he graduate? Was he graduated he, a number of years ago. Was he one of these three students? No, oh. no. He graduated a number of years ago. And I talked with our faculty and, and asked the question, why don't we have more majors? And, and to be real honest, they were not recruiting majors. They simply were not. Well, then why wouldn't someone make them recruit? Somebody's got to be accountable for telling them to get off their tails and go to work and do their job. That's what's changed. Well, they just about fooled around and waited too long. Yeah, McGregor, so if, if I understand it, it, all of these programs, um, if, if we deny an extension, then assuming that a consortium is put together, the board can, what is there, is a 10-year rule? Yeah. And right. we can make exception to that 10-year rule? Absolutely. The There's yep. a compelling okay. and state need. And and obviously, in a field like this, there would be if a very solid program is put together that's likely to yield better results. But it's it's pretty clear. I, I think this consortium is a is a is a massive failure. So the, frankly. the current model is isn't Doesn't working, work. and so I think we all have mm -hmm. agreed. What we need to do is spend the next six months working together to help create a brand new model, something yep. that's different, that will be successful, will hold promise. I'm and into that now. We have a motion. Yeah. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? If none, all those in favor of the denial of a two-year extension, please raise your hand. All those opposed, same sign. Just tell them back in Amarillo that you're working on a brand new plan. Will do. All right. For the whole greater than the sum of the park. Mr. That's Chairman, right. if I may have a point of personal privilege for a moment. I'd like to thank my staff um, for all of the work that went into this. Uh, there were hundreds of individual hours. This 800-page textbook that you guys got shipped to you via thumb drive is only the documents for the programs that were appealed. So there's a, another uh, about 450 pro document programs that had documents of similar size that you didn't see, and my staff really did a phenomenal job with this effort, and I, I just want you all to know that. And, and, and we, uh, I'm sorry. And, and I, and I'm sure the rest of the board is along, and we commend you, it's your leadership, and commissioner's leadership, and don't take this lightly. We understand how hard you have to work and how diligent you have to be there. But I believe in check and balance, and I think sure. with, this institution deserves oh, yeah. to have that you know, opportunity. But I think yeah. the system worked, collective wisdom prevailed, and That's right. we move on to the next one. No, and thank you all thanks, very much. Thanks to the board for being so thoughtful yeah. and considering these difficult issues. And what was the total number of courses closed? What was the total number of courses? Programs. And just as a reminder, these courses are actually being phased out. Right. right. So cur current students will have the right. time to complete their degrees. Sixty-one, sixty-one 
closures of programs that requested a temporary exemption. And then in addition to another 145 that closed their programs voluntarily. Yeah. So just over 200 programs that were closed um, one way or another out of the 549. And then, Is and that right? Mr. Chairman, that concludes the business of the Committee on Strategic Planning and Policy. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Hahn. Uh, the last item before adjournment is matters relating to the Committee on Agency Operations. Chairman Durga Agarwal is not with us today. Um, uh, and the only item for consideration besides the Committee Chair's overview was on the consent calendar. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Arturo, unless you have anything to add. Uh, I do not. I will, the chair will accept a motion for adjournment. I move. So move. Is there a second? All in favor, stand up and leave the table. Yes.